A young woman on her way home is walking down a city street, and just like most nights, the downtown empties out after the working day ends, leaving the streets empty of both cars and pedestrians. She hates when she has to close the shop and walk to her bus stop alone, and she is excited that in just another week, she will be starting a new job that's just around the corner from where she lives. She just has to get through these last few nights of being the last one at the store and having to walk home alone. Her more immediate concern now, though, is that her music has stopped. The young woman takes her phone out to check it. Dead. She must have forgotten to plug in the charger. She hates when she does that. Now she'd have to spend the bus ride staring out the window at nothing. What was that? The woman looks up from her phone. Did she see someone? She turns around and sees something on the other side of the street. It's dark, and all she can make out is a big, shadowy figure. She doesn't stare for long, though, and starts to walk again, picking up her pace slightly. She can hear the sound of footsteps and glances over her shoulder. The person across the street is moving too, and they seem to be matching her pace, avoiding any streetlights to remain in darkness. She starts to move a little quicker, and so do they. The young woman grips the pepper spray in her pocket. She doesn't know what this person is doing or what they want, but she's going to be ready for them. She keeps walking and glances over her shoulder again. They're crossing the street towards her now. She ducks into an alley, and as soon as she's around the corner and out of sight, she starts to run. She sprints through the alley as fast as she can. She looks behind her, frightened of what she might see, but no one is there. Maybe she was wrong and they weren't following her, but she's not about to stop running and find out. She emerges from the alley still running as hard as she can. She reaches her bus stop and finally stops to catch her breath. She checks her watch. The bus should be pulling up right now, but it's nowhere to be seen. She looks around, and what she does see is a shadowy figure coming out of the alley, and it's coming straight towards her. She backs up into the bus stop and takes the pepper spray out of her pocket, her finger ready on the trigger. The shadowy figure keeps moving towards her when suddenly the dark street is lit up. The woman looks behind her to see her savior. It's the bus. She turns back to see the shadowy figure retreating to the alley as if the light is pushing it away. The woman breathes a sigh of relief and finally lets some of the tension in her body release as the bus comes to a stop in front of her. The door swings open and the woman steps inside. I've never been so happy to get on the bus, she says to the driver as she scans her transit card. The driver doesn't respond though. In fact, he doesn't react to her at all. He just keeps staring straight ahead. The woman doesn't push it though. She's just happy to be on the bus, even if it is completely empty. She heads to the back of the bus and takes a seat. As the bus pulls away, she can almost swear she could see the shadowy figure standing in the alley, watching her. The bus rumbles along the empty city streets as the woman looks out the window and takes deep breaths, trying to calm herself after her harrowing ordeal. After a while, she notices that the bus doesn't seem to be stopping as much as it normally does, or at all for that matter. Did they change the route? Or did she get on the wrong bus? They are approaching her stop though, so it doesn't matter, and she reaches up to pull the cord. A bell chimes and the stop requested light illuminates in the front of the bus, but the driver doesn't show any sign of stopping or even slowing down. She pulls the cord again, but still no reaction. As she sees her building go by, she calls out, hey, this is my stop, but the driver doesn't acknowledge her at all. She stands up and walks to the front. Didn't you hear me? This is my stop. Still no reaction from the driver. Hey, I said, she reaches out and grabs his shoulder, spinning him towards her only to find herself staring into the eyes of a fresh corpse. The woman screams and jumps back as the driver slumps forward towards her. She's terrified by the dead body, as well as the fact that the bus will crash, but when she looks at the steering wheel, she sees that it is continuing to move on its own. The woman is in a full-blown panic now. She screams and pounds on the door, but it won't open. The engine roars as the bus starts to pick up speed. She doesn't know what to do and runs to the back where she tries the rear door, but it doesn't budge either. The bus speeds up even more, whipping around corners and tossing her from side to side. She's thrown to the ground and hits her head. Her eyelids feel like they weigh a hundred pounds, and she struggles to keep them open. She manages to stay awake, though, and as she looks up in a daze, staring at the ceiling of the bus, she can see a green gas emanating from the vents. It's the last thing she sees before her eyes close for good. The bus finally comes to a stop in a deserted area of the city. The vehicle raises slightly as, one after another, each wheel appears to unfold, revealing them to be long, black, spindly legs. 
The bus stands up on these insectoid appendages as its roof splits into two massive wings. The bus then leaps up into the sky, spreading its wings, and flies off into the night. How could this young woman have known that after escaping danger, that her rescuer would be something worse? Much worse. Unfortunately for her, she had just willingly stepped onto an instance of SCP-2086, a deadly and terrifying anomaly that hides in plain sight as it stalks and hunts its human prey. SCP-2086 is the designation the SCP Foundation has given to a species that appears to belong to the arthropod phylum, a group that also includes arachnids and crustaceans. These strange creatures differ from most of their lobster and spider brethren in that they make use of an advanced form of camouflage to move among modern society unseen. Adult SCP-2086 instances all resemble some sort of public transportation vehicle, with the exact make, model, year, and branding varying from instance to instance. SCP-2086 instances move about the streets of our cities foraging for food, and at first glance, they are virtually indistinguishable from the standard transit vehicles they are mimicking. Close examination of them, though, will reveal that the steel, wood, plastic, and glass they are composed of aren't those materials at all, but a form of specialized chitin, which is the substance that makes up the hard exoskeleton of many insects and other arthropods. And that's not the only aspect of SCP-2086 that isn't actually what it appears to be. The wheels on the bus may go round and round, but they also are capable of unraveling into long, thin legs that create a very imposing image when SCP-2086 is standing up at its full height. The roof, too, is able to unfurl into a set of giant insectoid wings, and after leaping into the air with its powerful legs, the wings will spread and the bus can take flight, which appears to be its preferred method of travel when it is not in its camouflaged hunting mode. Its headlights, too, are an entirely biological mechanism, consisting of two large bioluminescent optical organs similar to those possessed by SCP-015-IT and SCP-745. Dissections of SCP-2086 specimens have shown them to have an entire system of organs, including a heart, brain, and stomach, which are found beneath the flooring in the creature's interior chamber. SCP-2086 appendages are not just used for locomotion, though and they have been observed as being able to use them for fine object manipulation. This fact was learned when they were observed building crude shelters from scrap materials at their nesting grounds. More on these nests and the terrifying events that take place there later. When SCP-2086 is not at its nest, it engages in its foraging behavior. Typically, an SCP-2086 instance will fly to the start of a route and begin driving along city streets, picking up human passengers who willingly enter the creature's inner chamber thinking that it is a standard bus. Along with its exoskeleton closely resembling a real vehicle, SCP-2086 has one more particularly gruesome trick to fool would-be passengers into becoming its prey. A bus that drives itself would lead many to think twice about stepping on board, so SCP-2086 makes use of a decoy driver, which is actually a human corpse encased and preserved in a shellac-like substance. Smaller, fibrous appendages protrude from the front seat and into the corpse, which hold it in place and are even capable of manipulating the corpse, giving it the appearance of movement as it drives the bus. Once SCP-2086 has gathered up what it considers to be enough victims, a number that appears to vary from instance to instance, it will release a noxious gas from its interior vents. The gas produces an effect in humans similar to chloroform, and everyone on board will be rendered unconscious. The creature, now filled with its prey, does not feed on the humans trapped inside it though. Instead, it will take them to its nesting grounds, which is where the real horror begins. These nesting grounds are most often localized in scrap and junkyards that have fallen into disuse or are completely abandoned, and it is in these nests that the juvenile instances of SCP-2086 are found. While a full-grown instance can weigh as much as 17,000 kilograms, which is the approximate curb weight of a normal bus, extensive field research and observation into SCP-2086 has led to the identification of the smaller, juvenile instances, which are much smaller than their adult counterparts, weighing under 200 kilograms. But they don't stay this size for long. When an adult SCP-2086 arrives back at the nest with its interior chamber filled with human prey, it will open its doors and allow the juvenile members to enter inside of it so they can feed and grow. Once inside, a juvenile will remove a passenger from the bus and take them outside. 
The effects of the chloroform gas will often begin to wear off at this time, but by this point, it is already too late. The juvenile instance will then proceed to force the human into a hole located under their hood. This leads to a sort of digestive tract that connects to its inner chamber where the driver's seat is located. Small, hair-like appendages will then emerge from the seat and protrude into the prey's body, which hold them in place in the driver's seat and trap them there, while at the same time acting as feeding tubes, draining the blood from the now-doomed passenger. Once the person has been completely drained of blood, the feeding tubes will begin secreting a saline solution as the internal compartment fills with a shellac-like substance, and the effects of both combine to effectively embalm and preserve the corpse, which will serve as its own decoy driver once it enters adulthood. And this process happens quite quickly. A newborn SCP-2086 will reach adulthood in just one week, provided that it has had access to nutrients at which point it will begin searching for new sources of prey for its own offspring, of which it will likely have plenty. 2086 instances become capable of reproduction at 8 days, and females are able to produce up to 20 offspring, but their lives are quite short, with their entire life cycle usually lasting just 12 to 15 days. Prior to feeding and beginning the process of becoming a full-size adult, juveniles will also leave the nest and will covertly move about the city, removing bus stop signposts and relocating them, often creating a route that leads back to its own nest. These are the routes that adult instances will then typically follow as they hunt for more prey to bring back to their colony. SCP-2086 instances have been found in metropolitan areas around the world, and news reports are closely monitored by the Foundation for missing persons that had recently used public transport, with Foundation field agents being dispatched to potential high-threat areas to investigate further. Any nests that are discovered have their locations condemned, if they weren't already, and demolished using chemical explosives. Previously, an effort was made to capture and contain live instances of SCP-2086, and currently the Foundation has five such specimens in its custody, which are stored in a converted airplane hangar. Due to their short lifespans and high rate of reproduction, the amount of live specimens contained at any given time can vary widely, and will often depend on the number of available D-Class personnel who can serve as drivers. Terminated specimens are either destroyed or sent to a specialized cold storage container at a secure site for further biological research. SCP-2086 continues to be one of the most dangerous anomalies for common, everyday users of public transportation, and the SCP Foundation has classified it as Keter. While identified colonies are able to be destroyed with minimal effort once discovered, there is no telling how many nesting grounds still remain in the wild. So the next time you're about to board a bus, pay extra careful attention to it. Or you may find that your bus is rerouting you somewhere you never wanted to go. A worker presses down on the plunger, and moments later, a huge explosion rocks the quarry. When the dust clears, the three quarry workers look on at the pile of rocks that they'll now spend the next days and weeks hauling out. But then, they spot something strange. There in the newly exposed rock face is an opening. The three men stand at the mouth of the previously hidden cave. They poke their heads inside but it's too dark to see much of anything, except for the fact that the tunnel in the rock stretches on for at least a few meters before it turns and prevents them from seeing any further. One of the quarry workers slaps his co-worker on the back and dares him to go inside and check it out. No way, he tells him as he pulls his hand back from feeling inside the cave wall, his palm now coated in a sickly slime. It's gross in there. The other two laugh at him. If they think they're so brave, why don't the two of them go check it out? The two men stop laughing and look at each other. Who could have ever foreseen the tables turning on them like this? But they're not going to back down. One of the two takes out a flashlight, and they step into the cave while the third waits outside. He watches as the two of them head deeper into the cave, disappearing behind the bend. Inside the cave, the floor is just like the walls, coated with some kind of substance making it wet, but also a little sticky. They half expected the cave to end right around the bend, but now they can see that it continues on. Not only is there another turn several meters ahead of them, but as they head deeper in, they find that there are branching paths too. This might just be the start of a vast cave system. There's no telling how far or how deep it might go. They better head back to the entrance before they get lost. The two turn around to start heading back towards the entrance. But wait, what was that? When they spin around, it sounded like there was a noise behind them. But there's nothing there, just the empty passageway. They must be hearing things. They really should get out of here quickly, though. Come on, let's go. As they turn to leave, though, something happens. With a sickening squishing sound, 
the walls of the tunnel constrict, closing up between them. He runs towards the now-closed passage and starts slapping at the moist, soft wall, but there's no response. But then he does hear something. Was that a scream? He's realized something else, too. Even though his friend had the flashlight, he can still see. While faint, the walls themselves seem to be producing a small amount of light. He yells out that he's going to get help and that his friend should hold tight and not move. He'll get him out of there. He has no idea if he can hear him, though. He starts to slowly make his way back the way he thinks they came, but the cave feels different. He's taking turns that he doesn't remember making on their short trip. He should be at the entrance already, and there seem to be more branching paths than there were before. It's hard to tell in the low light, though. Maybe he's just confused. He's hearing noises, too. Wet, writhing sounds. He's got to get out of here. The quarry worker reaches a fork in the tunnel and has no idea which is the right way to go. He doesn't remember this at all. He calls down the tunnel, but there's no answer to his cries. He hears more of those wet, slapping sounds behind him, though. He's got to keep moving. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. The left tunnel it is. He goes down his chosen path, rounds a corner, and sees another fork. What is going on here? He's got to pick, though. Eeny, meeny, miny. He screams as something leaps out of the tunnel at him. Outside the cave, the quarry worker is growing nervous. He's gotten a flashlight of his own and shines it down the tunnel, but he can't see any more than they could before. He calls out, asking if they're all right, but he's met only with silence. He turns around behind him at the empty quarry. They're the only ones working on the site that day, and if they don't get back to work soon, there's going to be some angry questions about why they spent the day horsing around inside of a cave. As much as he hates the idea, he's got to go in there and get them out. He enters the cave and goes around the first bend, he too notices how oddly sticky and slimy every surface is, but he has to press on. Maybe they were hurt and needed his help. He rounds another bend and spots something, a pair of legs sticking out from around the next turn. His friend must really have been hurt. He runs towards his injured co-worker and kneels down next to him. It looks like he's passed out on the ground and he tries to shake him awake. Are you okay? What happened? His friend moans a bit, but doesn't even open his eyes. He moans again, and this time blood starts pouring out of his mouth. The quarry worker steps back, scared at the sight of his friend's state. That's when he notices something. His friend's stomach. It's moving. He leans in close. He can see bumps swelling and moving around his abdomen. Is that? The SCP Foundation soon learned of the troubling reports and moved quickly to purchase the quarry and the surrounding lands. Those who had seen or heard rumors about the missing workers were amnestitized, and all further access to the area around the quarry was strictly controlled. The cave itself that had been unearthed was designated SCP-2385, but the Foundation needed to learn just what they were dealing with, so after a research outpost was constructed over the entrance, the investigation into what was happening inside this strange anomalous cavern system could finally begin. The first to enter the cave is D-11424, a Class D personnel, who is equipped with a shoulder-mounted camera, a Ruger LC-9 pistol, a machete, and one week's worth of rations, since it was unknown just how vast this cave system may be. D-11424 proceeds into the cave and immediately reports back the same conditions that the workers had experienced, that the surfaces of the cave were soft, wet, and a little sticky, and also that they seemed to have an almost imperceptible glow. D-11424 moves deeper into the cave, but sees no sign of the missing workers, despite one of their bodies having been reported as being lost relatively close to the entrance. He's ordered to continue deeper into the cave, and radios back that the walls weren't stable. He would pass by openings in the walls that would seal off once he was passed. On more than one occasion, he saw new passages open up as well, and these didn't appear to be caused by collapses or other geological activity. The walls seemed like they were alive. But the walls were the only sign of life he could find. There was still no evidence of the missing workers or whatever might have gotten them. But then, after D-11424 rounds a corner, he sees that something is up ahead of him. It's not one of the workers. It's a creature, and one that looks like nothing he has ever seen before. The thing crawling on the floor of the cave looks like a giant worm, several feet in length, but with a grotesque, skinless human head. D-11424, frightened at the sight of this grotesque creature, turns to run, but it's too late. 
The worm has spotted him and charges at him immediately, slithering across the wet cave floor at an incredible speed. D-11424 slips and falls to the ground, his shoulder-mounted camera knocked off his body and left facing a wall, leaving the researchers monitoring the feed with nothing except the sound of his screams. Once contact was lost with the Class D personnel, the Foundation decided that due to the presence of hostile creatures within the cave system, that the next exploratory expedition would be undertaken without humans. The mission was authorized, and two months later, a remote-controlled drone designated A-47 was sent into the cave. Just like D-11424 and the quarry workers before saw, its camera captures passageways opening and closing in the living rock walls. As it progresses deeper, it eventually spots the same worm-like creatures with horrible human faces that look like they've had their skin removed, which have now been designated by the Foundation as SCP-2385-1 entities. And A-47 soon discovers a surprising fact about these bizarre organisms. They appear that they are being birthed right from the walls of the cave itself. As A-47 enters one of those largest rooms yet seen in the cave, its camera captures over a dozen 2385-1s growing out of the walls and ceiling in various stages of maturity. Some of them snap at A-47 as it passes by, trying to attack the drone, but luckily they're unable to reach. There's larger examples of the worms in the room too, and these ones also differ in appearance slightly, with a fibrous growth over their eyes. The researchers assume that these entities are different enough from the smaller versions that they warrant their own classification, and are designated as SCP-2385-2 entities. Luckily for A-47, these larger specimens, which can be as large as 4 meters in length, seem much more docile than their smaller counterparts and ignore A-47 as it passes by. A-47 then learns another shocking piece of information about these disturbing worm-like creatures. They're cannibalistic. Its camera relays footage back to the research team of a 2385-1 entity feeding on another, smaller one. It appears that they eat their prey whole after unhinging their grotesque jaws. The one feeding tries to lash out at A-47 with its tail, but can't reach him with half of another instance in its mouth, and the drone continues deeper into the cave. Just when A-47 enters the next chamber, a 2385-1 instance growing out of the ceiling drops down right in front of it leaving no way for the drone to get around it in the narrow section of cave. A-47 quickly turns around to seek out another path, but its camera captures the passage closing in front of it. A-47 is trapped. The 2385-1 entity charges towards the remote-controlled drone and attacks, biting and slapping it with its powerful tail. It then attempts to consume it, but is unable to ingest the bulky drone and, instead, leaves the heavily damaged robot for dead, slithering away deeper into the cave. The battered drone lies immobile on the cave floor for several hours, its camera broadcasting until the last of its battery is finally about to run out. Just before it stops sending signals back to the research outpost, though, it captures something. The wall next to A-47 opens up, and two of the larger SCP-2385-2 entities emerge from the new passageway. One of them approaches A-47, as the other probes at the wall next to it with its head. It seems as though the larger of the entities are actually able to form new pathways in the cave, or at least open up doorways between existing ones. With the last of its battery power, A-47 sends back a truly remarkable sight. Out of the hole opened by the 2385-2 entity appears D-11424. He's dirty, disheveled, sporting a month's worth of beard growth, and brandishing a machete. The wall opens up from the Dash-2 entity prodding at it, and the odd group exits through it. It's the last thing A-47 transmits back to the Foundation. Two months later, after several more failed manned missions, there was finally a success. An SCP-2385-2 instance that had wandered close to the entrance was retrieved from the cave system and brought back to a Foundation research site where a camera was surgically implanted in its head. The entity, which was designated as Subject Alpha, or SA, was then amnestitized and released back into the 2385 caves, allowing researchers to monitor how it behaved as it traveled through its home environment. The researchers watched as SA made its way through the cave system and stopped in another of the rooms filled with young versions of 2385-1. The larger entity approached several and appeared to nuzzle its face against theirs before moving on, which looked to have a calming effect on the extremely aggressive smaller versions. As it continues through the tunnels, SA sees a group of 2385-1 instances feeding on a deceased 
It appears that when 2385-1s are unable to swallow their prey whole, they burrow into the body and consume them from the inside out. Luckily, they are too distracted by their meal to pay any attention to SA, and it is able to pass by. SA then runs into two other 2385-2 entities, and the three begin traveling through the caves together. They are soon attacked by a smaller Dash-1, but the group is able to pin the biting and thrashing entity to the ground with their powerful tails, allowing SA to nuzzle it. Just like with the ones being birthed from the wall, this seems to calm the creature, but there is another effect as well. As the 2385-1 entity becomes more docile, the same fibrous growths that can be seen on the larger 2385-2 entities start to grow over its eyes. Is this how 2385-2s are created? The group of Dash 2s continues their journey through the tunnels, often stopping to prod at the walls to open new pathways. It appears that they are searching for something, looking around each new room they enter before moving on. Eventually, they run into something, but it doesn't appear to be what they wanted to find. They enter a new section of cave, and blocking the path in front of them is the largest SCP-2385-1 entity yet recorded. It's as big as the Dash 2s at over 7 meters in length and weighing an estimated 400 kilograms. It appears to be extremely hostile, but the Dash 2s seem to instinctively know that the only way forward is to go past this massive Dash 1. The trio nuzzles their heads together as if they are saying one final goodbye before one of the Dash 2s charges straight ahead. The Dash 1 attacks and quickly incapacitates it with its powerful tail and snapping jaws. It begins feeding on the Dash 2, giving SA and its one remaining companion the time they need to get past. As the now duo moves past, the other is attacked from a side tunnel by a group of regular-sized but ferocious Dash 1s. SA can't do anything to help. It seems to pick up the pace and continues on, but as it rounds a corner, it comes face to face with another large Dash 1 instance. It turns down a side tunnel to avoid it, but finds itself in a dead end. It prods at the wall as the Dash 1 rushes towards it, but no new passageways open. It turns around, seemingly resigned to its fate as the Dash 1 begins attacking. But just then, something else appears in the tunnel coming towards them. It's D-11424, charging forward with his machete raised in the air, his hair and beard both long and wild. He begins fighting the large Dash 1 entity, hacking at it with his machete until it finally dies. With the vicious entity now dead, he kneels down next to S.A. and begins stroking its head in a calming manner. Hey there, little guy. You all right? He asks as he pets the 2385-2. Yeah, you're fine. Get up. I know where it is. Come with me. S.A. struggles from its injuries, but is able to follow D-11424 as he leads it through the tunnels, with D-11424 stopping at one point to carve a piece off of the fleshy walls and consume it. The tunnels eventually open up into a large room that looks similar to the rest of the cave system, except there is a huge glowing orb at its center. It's a beautiful sphere of warm light that appears to be at least 10 meters in diameter. Here we are, the D-Class tells S.A. and motions towards the orb. It's all right. S.A. nuzzles against D-11424, perhaps one final thank you for saving its life, then instinctually seems to know what to do. The camera feed shows that it began crawling towards the sphere, and after a brief pause, started pushing itself inside. The camera recorded the brilliant light of the orb engulfing S.A. and its implanted camera before the feed finally cut out. The SCP Foundation would later discover that on that very same day, in the city of Elgin, Illinois, a local woman was admitted to the hospital after complaining of abdominal pains. Doctors performed emergency surgery and found something they did not expect a micro-camera had somehow become embedded inside of her body, which upon later investigations would be found to bear the same serial number as the one that had been implanted in S.A. Following this strange event, SCP-2385, which had previously been classified as Euclid, was upgraded to Keter. An observation site has been built at the quarry and no further human expeditions are allowed inside. In a bit of good news, sometime later, D-11424 finally emerged from the cave system he was taken back into SCP Foundation custody and continues engaging in exploratory missions on behalf of the Foundation to this day. Watch this, the teenage boy says before jumping his skateboard up onto the stair railing. His friends watch in amazement as he deftly guides his board down the long rail. They hoot and holler in support until suddenly the boy seems to lose his balance. He falls from the rail and tumbles down the stairs of the large parking garage where they had been practicing their skateboarding tricks. The boy hits the ground at the end of the stairs, and all of his friends go quiet. The boy is stunned, but eventually he opens his eyes and stands up. 
but none of his friends can do anything except stare. Oh no, oh no, oh no, the boy says as he looks down at his arm, which is now bent at a 90 degree angle in a spot where no joint should exist. The children watching all begin to scream, and one, unsure of what else to do, turns and runs. What do I do? What do I do? The boy with the broken arm says to no one and everyone. Luckily, one of the group quickly collects herself and steps forward to take control of the situation. Come on, she says, we're getting you to the hospital. The girl puts her arm around him on his non-damaged side and helps him to the street, where they have a stroke of good luck. Parked just a block away is an ambulance. Hey, the girl cries out, waving towards the ambulance. The paramedics inside must have seen her, because the ambulance's lights immediately come on and it drives the short distance to them. The ambulance stops, and two paramedics quickly exit the vehicle. The paramedics don't even need to ask what happened. They can obviously see from the unnatural angle of the boy's arm that he needs immediate medical attention, and they quickly place him into the back of the ambulance. The girl begins to pull herself into the back as well, but is quite forcefully shoved back into the street. Patience only, is the sole response from the paramedic who pushed her before he slams the door shut. The girl gets a brief look at her friend's frightened face through the back window as the ambulance speeds away. Several days later, the children are sitting outside of the same parking structure, but none of them are in any mood to skate. All they can think about is their missing friend. Neither the boy's parents nor the police have any idea what happened to him or where he went. There's no records at any of the local hospitals of him ever being brought there, nor does there seem to be any evidence of this particular ambulance having existed at all. No one even seems to believe the children that he got into an ambulance. The whole story just seems too far-fetched and outlandish but the children know what they saw. As they discuss the events for the hundredth or perhaps thousandth time, one of the smallest of the group suddenly stands up and points. There it is! The rest of the group looks in the direction he's motioning and sees the same thing. It's the ambulance. None of them know what to do as the vehicle flies past them, this time with no lights on, and comes to a stop a block away from where they first spotted it. They watch as the two paramedics exit the vehicle and go around to the back. It's hard to see from this distance, but it looks as though they took something out of the rear of the ambulance, something that requires both of them to lift, before dropping it on the sidewalk behind some trash cans. The children watch as the paramedics get back into the ambulance and drive away, disappearing just as quickly as they appeared. After a moment of shock, they all in unison begin running to the place where the ambulance stopped. They come to a skidding halt just in front of the trash cans. None of them can do anything except stare until they all break out into screams, one of the children turning and immediately running away. And they have good reason to scream, because in front of them is their friend. His arm is no longer broken, appearing to have been somehow repaired in just a matter of days, but it is also no longer attached to his shoulder. The boy opens his eyes as his friends scream, and looks down to see that his arms and legs have been reattached at a new angle, jutting out from his back, leaving him standing on all fours, his face staring up at the sky like some kind of twisted animal. What happened to this young man was tragic, but he wasn't the first victim of this strange malicious anomaly, and unfortunately, neither would he be the last, because this was SCP-4419, also known as the Butcher's Chariot. SCP-4419 appears to be a seemingly normal vehicle which resembles a standard ambulance, though the exact make and model varies between manifestations. This anomalous ambulance will appear spontaneously in locations where a medical emergency of some kind is about to take place. Just how SCP-4419 is able to predict where and when these events will take place is unknown, nor is it understood how it always takes the form of an ambulance that resembles one appropriate to the local area. Once the medical event has occurred, whether that be a minor injury like a sprain or something more serious, such as a gunshot wound, SCP-4419 will quickly approach the injured individual. Two individuals which have a humanoid appearance and are dressed in paramedic uniforms that are, just like the ambulance, always appropriate to the location, will exit the ambulance. They will then secure the victim, using a stretcher if need be, and place them in the back of the ambulance. While the individuals who emerge from SCP-4419 will, for the most part, act as though they are normal medical professionals, they will strongly resist any attempt to either impede them in their quest to secure the injured person, as well as prevent anyone else except for their target from getting into the back of the SCP-4419 ambulance, up to and including the use of extreme physical force. As soon as the paramedic appearing individuals have managed to secure the victim in the back of the ambulance, it will then quickly leave the area at a high rate of speed, 
and research has shown that as soon as it is out of observation, SCP-4419 will demanifest along with whoever is inside. But this isn't the end of what this anomaly has in store for its victim. Between two and seven days later, the SCP-4419 ambulance will suddenly reappear at the same area where it picked up its victim. The same individuals will exit the ambulance and leave the victim somewhere nearby before getting back in the vehicle and leaving the scene once again. The victim who is left behind will always have suffered what can only be described as invasive bodily modifications. Their injuries are so extreme that in most cases they should have resulted in the death of the victim, and yet they will always somehow still be alive. While the exact form of modification will vary from victim to victim, there does appear to be some correlation between the original medical emergency and the resulting procedure. And the SCP Foundation has documented a number of encounters with SCP-4419 stretching all the way back to the early 1980s. Some notable examples include one from 1983, in which a pedestrian who was crossing the street was struck by an automobile, resulting in them breaking their leg. SCP-4419 was on site and quickly helped the man into the back of the ambulance. When he was returned several days later, all of his limbs had been reattached in such a way that they were protruding from the front of his torso. In another event which occurred in 1994, a man suffered a broken jaw in a fight outside of a bar. To no surprise, SCP-4419 was on hand and took the man away for treatment. When he was next seen, his jaw had been permanently forced open and a glass window had been installed in the back of his throat which permitted direct viewing of his heart which had also been moved to the back of the throat. Unfortunately, there was no way to reverse this procedure and the man had to be euthanized. In 2003, a husband and wife were in a car accident where they each sustained multiple broken bones. When SCP-4419 dropped them back off, the two had been fused together at the back and any bones that were broken in the crash had been removed completely. When an elderly gentleman had a heart attack in 2006, he was picked up by SCP-4419 and returned with 11 new, non-functioning hearts grafted inside of his body. Attempts were made to remove these additional hearts through surgery, but unfortunately, the man did not survive the procedure. In 2008, a structure fire resulted in 19 people suffering extreme burns. Seven more injuries came when a crowd attempted to stop the SCP-4419 paramedics from placing all of the victims in the back of the ambulance, but they were unsuccessful in preventing them from leaving the scene with them. When the group of victims was finally returned, it was as a single organism, a large solitary mass which twitches and shivers when physical contact is applied. No method for euthanizing this organism has been able to be found, and currently they are stored inside of a tank at Site-31. In perhaps the strangest sighting of SCP-4419, a US private was wounded while on patrol in Afghanistan, and a military medical evacuation vehicle arrived to evacuate him. Suspicious about the vehicle's sudden appearance and the forceful conduct of the medical staff, the private's fellow soldiers ended up opening fire on the vehicle. They reported seeing a viscous black fluid leaking from the vehicle's surface, but they were unable to stop it from taking the injured private. In a deviation from its normal behavior, the victim was not returned to the same place and instead appeared in the barracks the next day. The victim had been broken down into a thin paste and was spread across the walls. Agents were dispatched to secure what was left of the man, and they reported finding a still intact eyeball that dilated when they approached. The collected viscera has been labeled as remains and placed in storage, but it is currently unknown whether or not the victim has truly expired. Due to the danger SCP-4419 presents to anyone who suffers an injury, as well as its ability to appear virtually anywhere on the planet, it has been classified as Keter. Containment efforts at this point are largely focused on maintaining information control and post-manifestation cleanup, as opposed to any attempts at physical confinement. Anyone who witnesses an SCP-4419 manifestation is to be administered amnestics, and victims are to be treated in order to restore them to their original physical state as much as possible, or euthanized when no viable medical treatments are available, with a cover story constructed in order to explain their death. SCP-4419 is one of the most cruel and sadistic anomalies in the SCP Foundation's database, ranking right up there with SCP-106, The Old Man. Hopefully one day we will find a means to contain this brutal so-called medical vehicle, but until then, be careful if you suffer an injury and an ambulance is suddenly on hand, you might come back changed in ways you never thought possible. A doctor frantically writes in his journal, It's almost impossible to believe everything that's transpired has taken place in such a short amount of time. It all began three days ago. It was just another day down in the mines. 
A worker was drilling into a seam of coal when suddenly there was an issue with the rig. From what I've gathered, it sounds like the drill bit exploded due to some kind of mechanical defect, sending shards of metal flying throughout the tunnel. The worker was lucky that none of the large pieces struck him, as they surely would have been fatal. He had, though, still been grazed by a piece of shrapnel from the ruined drill bit, and it had left a deep cut across his upper arm. Other miners who were working nearby heard the commotion and quickly came to his aid. They applied a tourniquet to stem the flow of blood and helped him to the mineshaft elevator for the long ride to the surface. Once they reached the safety of daylight, they brought the injured man to the on-site medical clinic where I was on duty at the time. I cleaned the wound since there was a substantial amount of coal dust that had gotten inside before suturing and bandaging it. The miner was sent to his bunkhouse to recover, and I thought that would be the end of it. Of course, it was only the beginning. Roughly 24 hours later, the same miner presented himself to me once again. I asked about his injury, and he explained that while his arm was fine, he now felt like he might be coming down with an illness. His symptoms included a runny nose, a cough, and body aches, so my assumption was that he'd simply had some bad luck and caught a cold that just so happened to coincide with being injured on the job. I sent him to his bunk once again, telling him that he wouldn't be able to work and should instead use the day to rest and recover. The next day, I was once again in the clinic when my phone rang. It wasn't the sick miner, but instead his supervisor. The miner hadn't shown up for his shift that morning, and he asked for me to go check on him since he knew he hadn't been feeling well. I agreed that it was strange that neither of us had heard anything else from the miner and went to see him straight away. I entered the bunkhouse where many of the workers stay while on site at this remote mine. It was empty, except for the injured miner who was still in his bed. As I approached, I could immediately tell something was very wrong. The man was curled up in the fetal position, and was sweating profusely while also shivering. A quick touch of his forehead revealed that the man had a high fever, too. He was practically incoherent, seemingly delirious from his high temperature. The miner was moved to the empty bed inside the clinic so I could better observe and tend to him, but very carefully since I assumed now that he was actually suffering from influenza and didn't want to risk an outbreak at the mine. I was getting ready to administer fluids to the miner, who was still mumbling incomprehensibly, when I noticed something on his face. It appeared that he was crying, but the tears that ran down his cheeks weren't made of water. They were blood. I hadn't seen anything like it before. There was no reason why influenza should be causing this man to cry tears of blood. I could see the veins in his forehead starting to pulse, as if his blood pressure had suddenly skyrocketed. And just as I was leaning in to get a closer look, something horrible happened. The miner suddenly opened his mouth and expelled an enormous stream of blood. The blast of blood struck me in the face and knocked me backwards in fright as the man continued expelling more and more blood from his mouth, which soon covered the walls of the clinic. With seemingly all the blood having been discharged from his body, the man then went limp. I attempted to resuscitate him, but strangely, there was no need. The man was comatose, but he was alive. There I was, standing in the middle of the clinic over the man, both he, myself, as well as the room completely covered in blood. It was one of the worst things I'd ever experienced as a doctor, and yet, somehow, it was about to get even worse. I was still in shock from what had just happened when I heard the door to the clinic open behind me. I turned around to see a group of half a dozen more miners from the site, each one coughing, sweating, and shivering. One held a cloth to his ear that was stained red, while another attempted to stop his nose from bleeding. Whatever had infected the first patient wasn't a one-off medical event. This had the makings of an epidemic. I knew that I was in way over my head. I was just a general practitioner, not an infectious disease specialist, and I called the Center for Disease Control to get their guidance. I was told to quarantine the sick man as best I could, and that a rapid response team would be sent who were better equipped to deal with potential outbreaks. While I waited for the CDC to arrive, I began moving the afflicted men to a bunkhouse that had been designated for quarantining. Several more also began expelling huge amounts of blood, though unlike the first patient, none of the others survived the traumatic event. As I was putting the final infected man into a bed, I noticed something, though. There was a huge amount of heat radiating off of his lower body, and when I pulled down the blankets, I discovered something that even with all of the strange happenings, I still couldn't believe. There were huge lumps growing on his legs, each of which looked to be filled with some kind of fluid or gas. 
and they were extremely hot to the touch, as if the chemicals inside the lumps were creating a source of heat. As I was investigating the bizarre growths, I suddenly looked up to see that the man was no longer in a state of delirium. Instead, a crazed look had come over his eyes, and he suddenly leapt out of bed, flailing and clawing at me as if he wanted to kill me. I don't know how, but I was able to fight off the man and run out of the bunkhouse. He gave chase, though, and with no other option, I ran into a nearby storage shed. The man was beating and scratching at the door, but I was able to barricade it by dragging a heavy shelf in front of it. After several minutes of trying to break inside, he finally gave up and left. And here I remain. I'm too afraid to go back out. It seems that if the disease won't kill me, then whatever it is turning people into will. All I can do is wait for the CDC team to get here and hopefully know how to deal with whatever the situation has become. The doctor closes his small notebook and notices a drop of something fall onto the cover. He reaches up and wipes his hand across his mouth. It comes back, covered in blood. The doctor didn't know what the disease was that had so rapidly spread through the workers at the mine, nor did the CDC response team when they arrived. No, it wasn't until the SCP Foundation caught word of the mysterious outbreak that someone would finally determine what was happening with what would soon be called SCP-016, which is also known as the Sentient Microorganism. SCP-016 is a blood-borne pathogen that was first discovered after a worker at a remote mine was injured while drilling into a coal seam deep beneath the earth. It is theorized that coal dust entered the wound, dust which perhaps carried dormant spores of what would become SCP-016. Over the next several days, all of the remaining employees at the mine were infected, as was the CDC crisis team that was sent to the mine to investigate the outbreak of what was potentially an undiscovered pathogen. Following the CDC's inability to deal with the disease, the SCP Foundation took over the site and quickly terminated all affected personnel in order to prevent further spread. The first infected person, Patient Zero, was taken into Foundation custody for further investigation, and the mine shaft itself was collapsed by an explosive device in order to seal it off. After studying Patient Zero, the Foundation learned a great deal about just what they were dealing with. What they found was that SCP-016 has an incubation period that can vary wildly from just 24 hours to as long as two years, with the length appearing to be dependent on the number of other potential human hosts in the immediate area. Once symptoms begin to present in an individual, they will at first look to be quite similar to the common cold. They can include coughing, a runny nose, itchy eyes, and body aches. Roughly 48 hours after the first symptoms, the infected person will experience a form of hemorrhagic fever similar to the Ebola virus, which causes a small amount of bleeding in the lungs. This leads to the infected blood becoming aspirated, most likely in order to better spread through the air. The third stage of the disease leads to the host crashing and bleeding out as they start to bleed profusely from multiple body orifices, including the nose, tear ducts, mouth, and even through the pores of their skin. Their blood pressure will also skyrocket during this final stage, and in some cases, have vomited blood as far as five meters. Oddly enough, although most die from the traumatic event, this almost complete exsanguination will not always result in death. Sometimes, following the removal of almost all blood from the body, the patient will somehow survive, and the pathogen inside their body will return to its dormant phase once again, before eventually repeating the process. But SCP-016 is more than just a rapid and often deadly bloodborne disease, as you will soon see. As SCP researchers studied the disease, what they discovered was that it had a very strange property that sets it apart from other hemorrhagic fevers like Ebola and the Marburg virus. What they found was that when someone infected with SCP-016 is placed into a high-stress situation, such as one where their life is being threatened, SCP-016 will transition from rapidly reproducing inside of its host's body to instead begin rewriting their host's actual DNA. This genetic manipulation, combined with the stimulation of rapid cell division, leads to the host undergoing major physiological changes and in extremely small amounts of time. In just 24 hours, the host can begin showing physical changes to their body and a complete bodily reconstruction can occur in less than two weeks. Most of the hosts who begin to undergo physical changes will not survive the process, due to how heavily the transformation stresses the body, but those that do will be changed in more than just physical ways. They'll exhibit hyper-aggressive behaviors not dissimilar to those infected by rabies. 
and it's theorized that the pathogen may cause this behavior in order to better spread the virus. When the Foundation realized that SCP-016 was capable of these transformative effects, they immediately undertook a number of experiments on D-Class personnel in order to better understand their full extent. In the first test, a D-Class was infected with SCP-016, and as soon as they began showing symptoms, their cell was slowly flooded with water in order to stimulate the life-threatening situation needed to trigger the transformation process. Over the next 24 hours, researchers watched as the subject appeared to develop gills which would allow it to survive in the now water-filled cell. The transformations didn't stop there, though, and over the next two weeks, the subject also had their limbs change into fins, their eyesight deteriorated, and their sense of hearing increased as they developed an echolocation ability very similar to the one employed by whales and dolphins. The experiment was concluded by removing all of the water from the cell leading to the death of the subject from asphyxiation as they could no longer breathe in the open air. A similar experiment was performed on another D-Class, but this time, instead of taking on aquatic animal properties, the D-Class experienced rapid muscle growth and their knuckles grew bone-like protrusions. It attempted to use both of these to break through the door of their flooding cell, but they were unable to breach the reinforced steel and soon died from drowning. The Foundation now knew that the virus could react in different ways to the same situation. The same experiment was run a third time, but in this instance, the infected D-Class exhibited an entirely different means of trying to escape. The subject had a massive growth appear on its chest, which seemed to be fed from two different tubes of flesh, also emanating from the subject's body. Fearing what it planned to do, the Foundation ended the experiment early and terminated the subject. An autopsy revealed that the growth was actually a hollow chamber that was being fed by the tubes with oxygen and acetylene gas, which when combined in sufficient amounts would cause a massive combustion event. In other words, SCP-016 was turning the subject into a living bomb. Moving on from flooded cell tests, the researchers next left the D-Class inside of a room with no stressing elements and instead told them to focus on growing a pair of wings. Without any reason to begin the transformation process, SCP-016 went through its normal stages, and the subject died from blood loss without any other changes occurring. In the final test, a D-Class was placed inside of an acrylic box that was suspended over a mine shaft, with a timer attached indicating the time when the bottom of the box would open and drop the D-Class into the thousand-foot deep shaft. This D-Class was also told to focus on growing wings that would allow them to survive the plunge. The subject began to transform over the next 24 hours, but rather than grow wings, they instead developed a tentacle-like appendage on their arm that was capable of producing silk similar to a spider's spinneret. They used the silk-producing organ to secure themselves to the box, showing that subjects did not appear to be able to control the way in which SCP-016 would alter their bodies. This experiment concluded when the timer reached zero and the bomb attached to it detonated, as had been the plan all along. Following this last test, SCP-016 samples were placed into containment, and access to the sample for experimental purposes is only allowed with prior authorization from Level 4 or O5 personnel, with full documentation of the proposed experiment required beforehand. Failure to follow any of these procedures will lead to the offending personnel being reassigned to D-Class duty or terminated. SCP-016 has been classified as Keter, and the only existing sample is kept in a petri dish which is under extreme lockdown inside of a 5 by 5 by 5 meter room, where the temperature is kept below 0 degrees Celsius at all times. Should an outbreak of SCP-016 occur, all infected personnel are to be immediately terminated on site, and if the infection cannot be contained within 48 hours, then the on-site nuclear device is to be detonated, prior to any additional personnel being evacuated. While the containment procedures may sound callous, unfortunately when it comes to anomalous pathogens as dangerous as SCP-016, no chances can be taken. The early morning sun rises, casting its radiance over the field. The shepherd stands guard, watching his sheep graze. It's a beautiful morning, the sheep are quiet, and his loyal dog is at his side. But the shepherd is perturbed. He is certain that there are sheep missing. He wanders through the field, counting the sheep off one by one, but no matter how many times he counts, he simply cannot make the numbers gel. There are definitely five sheep missing. How is this even possible? His family has been in the sheep herding business for generations. They survive on the money that they make from shearing, selling, and spinning the wool from these sheep. They can't afford to simply lose sheep. That's money directly from the family wallet, food directly off the family table. 
But even worse, it's a matter of pride. He likes to think of himself as a good shepherd who cares about his flock. Losing a single sheep is a failure of his responsibility to his charges, and he can't stand it. He knows that if he returns to the farm without those five missing sheep, he's going to be in big trouble. He's already thinking about the lecture he's going to get from his father, and that's if he's lucky. One missing sheep might be forgiven, but five? He'll be lucky if his family doesn't throw him out of the house for his failure. It's imperative that he find them and bring them back. He pats the head of his trusty sheepdog. Every shepherd, of course, has a sheepdog to help them keep their flock safe. His dog has been with him for many years, and she has never failed in the past. She keeps watch over the flock as if they were her own puppies, so the shepherd thinks it very strange that his dog didn't bark to sound the alarm when the missing sheep started to wander off. Could something more sinister be at play here? Maybe someone stole his sheep. If a thief came during the night to sneak away with the lost sheep, that might explain why they were able to get away without his dog knowing. They might have been clever enough to cause some kind of distraction to keep her busy. The shepherd notices that the fence at the edge of the field is broken. This must be how the missing sheep got away. He examines the splintered wood. It's not a natural break because the wood is sturdy and far from rotten. Someone or something must have broken the fence sometime last night. He clutches at his shepherd's crook, his brow set in determination. This isn't good. It's looking more and more likely that thieves are behind this disappearance. He needs to track them down, but you will have to be careful. Sheep thieves are usually desperate men, and they might resort to violence to protect their ill-gotten gains. A glint of sunlight flashes against something shiny caught on the fence, catching the shepherd's eye. He scoops it up and examines it closely. It looks like a scrap of fabric. Could it be that the thief snagged his clothes against the fence as he made his escape? The fabric is thin and brittle, and doesn't look like any sort of material that the shepherd has ever seen before. It more resembles a scrap of snakeskin than a scrap of shirt, but it's his only lead, so it'll have to do. He holds the scrap to his dog's nose and allows her to sniff it. She snuffles at it and then immediately raises her ears, alert. He commands her to follow the scent, and she obeys. She puts her nose to the ground and starts to track. He follows her. The dog leads him out of the field and across the way. He is surprised to see that she is leading him toward a nearby forest. He gulps in sudden fear. He's never been into these woods and, in fact, his family has often warned him to stay away. Everyone in his village loves to repeat rumors that this forest is haunted, filled with every sorts of scary monsters and demons. Why would the sheep thief brave these cursed woods? On the other hand, that would make sense though, wouldn't it? A thief would need a lair that was hidden and difficult to approach so that they wouldn't have to worry about getting caught. These woods would be a perfect hiding place. Still, he can't help but wonder. His dog lifts her head and whines at him, indicating that he should follow. He steals his resolve and continues on. His fingers clutch tightly to his staff, his knuckles going white with fear and tension. He's almost convinced that he might see a monster here in these woods, and he's ready to defend himself from the worst. Eventually, his dog leads him into an unexpected clearing. The shepherd blinks in amazement. Standing at the center of the glen is what appears to be the remains of an ancient temple. He hasn't given much thought to the history of this place, to all the people who lived here in ancient times, and to what monuments they left behind. The crumbling ruins are overgrown with vines, and the columns look like they might disintegrate at a touch. He wonders what ancient civilization might have built this lost citadel, and what strange rites they might have performed here. But he doesn't have time to wonder about that because his dog is barreling ahead right through the ancient temple archway and into the interior of the building. He wants to turn and run. Everything that he's ever heard about these cursed woods makes him think that this is a very bad idea, but he knows he can't return home without those sheep. Just as he's about to enter the temple himself, he suddenly hears loud barking followed by whining and whimpering. He rushes inside and a terrifying sight meets his eyes. Indeed, it seems like his family was right when they said that these woods are full of monsters, because his dog has cornered one right here. The creature looks like an overgrown lizard with scaly skin and a long whip-like tail. Immediately, the shepherd surmises that the scrap of fabric that he found earlier didn't come from a person's clothes after all. It's obviously a piece of shed skin, no doubt from this creature. That long tail definitely looks especially snake-like, so it's no surprise to think that this thing might also shed skin just like a snake would. In the gloom of the temple, he can see his missing sheep standing in the corner, perfectly still and perfectly quiet. He's surprised to see that they're still alive. What kind of predator kidnaps its prey and then keeps it alive instead of devouring it instantly? It's also very odd that the sheep are being so still, but it's probably just that they're petrified with fear. The good news, though, is that if his sheep are alive, that means he can rescue them. 
The creature spreads a large frill around its neck as it hisses, apparently hoping to intimidate the shepherd's dog. The dog is not frightened, though, and only barks louder. She's bravely guarded the shepherd's flock for years, and she's never been one to back down from a fight, even when she's threatened by a bear or wolf. So of course, she's not going to back down from a lizard. The shepherd feels nervous being so close to this creature simply because it's so strange, but the truth is that it doesn't look like it could do that much damage. That hissing feels like bluffing, because, realistically, what's it going to do? Bite? The shepherd is no expert, but he's never heard of a venomous lizard. He steps forward to get a better look, and the creature tenses. It's obviously nervous. It's not even that big. His dog is way bigger than this creature and shouldn't have any trouble taking it in a fight. He's seen his dog fight off rats bigger than this lizard. The creature spreads its frill again and hisses even more sharply, but that only makes the shepherd even more confident in his assessment. It's trying to look bigger than it really is, he realizes. It's trying to intimidate him. Well, that's not going to work. But then, to his astonishment, his dog stops. The dog and the creature stare at one another so intently that the shepherd thinks they are actually gazing into each other's eyes. After holding its gaze for a beat, the dog suddenly collapses. The shepherd yelps in fear and confusion. His first instinct is to run to his dog to see if she's hurt. But suddenly, the creature turns its gaze on him. He stands frozen. The creature's eyes almost seem to cast a spell on him, and he feels mesmerized, unable to move or even to think. All his thoughts drain away, and the whole world starts to fade. Nothing is real except those two malevolent red eyes. The shepherd is absolutely paralyzed. It's not just terror. He finds that he can't move a muscle. He can only watch as the strange reptile approaches his frozen dog and suddenly bites her on her exposed flank. It lashes out like a snake would when it injects venom into a victim. The shepherd was sure that there weren't any venomous lizards in this area, but now he's not so sure when he's watching this scenario play out. He expects his dog might start to convulse or spasm if she's been poisoned, but she remains completely still. Suddenly, he sees something so shocking that he's certain he must be losing his mind. Could it be? The area around the bite is starting to change color, becoming a dull gray. But as he watches, he realizes to his horror that he's not just watching a color change. This is something more. His dog is slowly petrifying, hardening, her fur stiffening into stone. She is literally turning into a statue right before his eyes. He can't move, but his eyes flick to the corner of the room where his sheep are still standing. Now he understands. It was hard to tell before, because of the darkness and also because the very idea was so preposterous that it didn't even occur to him, but the reason that the sheep were so still and quiet was because they weren't sheep anymore. They were mere statues. Somehow, this creature was able to turn things to stone with the force of its venom. He wants to scream, he wants to yell, he wants to break free and run away, but he's powerless to move. Fear wells up inside him as he sees the creature turn its attention from his rapidly petrifying dog and start to move toward him. It hisses again and strikes out, sinking sharp, needle-like teeth into his leg. The shepherd is so frozen that he can't scream, not even at the unbelievable pain as those teeth sink deep into his flesh. But the pain doesn't stop when the creature retracts its teeth. He can feel the pain spreading outward from the sight of the bite, spreading down his shins and up his legs, through his whole body. His body is hardening fast, making it hard to breathe and impossible to move. But even as he turns into a statue, he can still see everything around him, still sense the presence of the creature, still think. His thoughts aren't affected at all, other than being nearly out of his mind with terror. What could be next? The shepherd is frightened, but all he can do is wait. He's not sure how long he waits, because time has no meaning here. In the gloom of this ancient temple, he's not sure if it's day or night. He idly wonders if this temple was built for this monster, by people who worshipped it for its great and terrible power, or by people who feared it, and hoped that maybe this temple would keep it contained. Or is it mere coincidence that it's taken up residence here, just as bats might roost in an abandoned building? He has no way of ever knowing. The only indication of the passage of time is the coming and going of the creature, which, even if he can't turn his head to see its movement, he can hear its shuffling and hissing. Occasionally, he hears a sound that frightens him even more, a sound that can only be described as statuary shattering, and he wonders if that will ultimately be his fate. His question is answered one day when it seems that hunger has driven the creature to dig into its larder of petrified prisoners. The creature approaches him, and he can feel it gnawing at his feet with its big, ugly beak. It's pecking at him, harder and harder, until suddenly the shell breaks and it's chewing on the flesh of his leg. 
Once again, the pain is unbearable. The shepherd can do nothing but wait. At least he thinks it will all be over soon. Better a quick end at the jaws of a monster than a slow death trapped frozen in stone, he thinks. It's the very best that he can hope for. That shepherd had just run afoul of a creature that appears to come straight out of medieval mythology, matching the description of the deadly monster known as a cockatrice or basilisk, but the SCP Foundation knows it as SCP-1013, a nasty little piece of work with, quite literally, a paralyzing stare. SCP-1013 is a small reptile resembling a lizard, but with several key differences that set it apart from any other animal in this order. It was recovered in Egypt. An interesting coincidence, since medieval bestiaries often regard that region as the ancestral home of the basilisk. However, Foundation agents believe that since no other specimens were found in the area, that SCP-1013 is not a naturally occurring animal and might have actually been bioengineered. While SCP-1013 itself is only 60 centimeters long, its abnormally long tail measures nearly 121 centimeters long. It can use its tail to distract prey. It has a wide frill around its neck that it can extend at will, similar to that of the Australian frilled lizard. Its head does not look like any other known lizard, though, with a serrated beak and a distinctive head waddle that many researchers feel gives it the appearance of a rooster. Its beak is filled with long, needle-like teeth. But stranger than its appearance is its hunting methods. When it spies potential prey, SCP-1013 will extend its neck frill with a sudden, snapping sound. The frill appears designed to attract attention and encourage victims to look into the eyes of SCP-1013, because its eyes are, of course, where it holds its real power. The mythical cockatrice was said to be able to turn a person to stone with the power of its gaze, similar to the petrifying powers attributed to the Gorgon Medusa of Greek mythology, and SCP-1013 is very similar to its legendary namesake in this regard. Anyone or anything making direct eye contact with SCP-1013 will experience stabbing pain in most major muscle groups, followed by full paralysis setting in within three seconds and lasting up until eight minutes. It is currently unknown how SCP-1013 achieves this paralysis effect. Once its prey is paralyzed, SCP-1013 will bite its victim with its needle-like teeth, thus initiating a process of calcification. The victim will gradually stiffen and harden, almost as if they are turning into a statue. The process will begin at the site of the bite and gradually work its way through the body so that a full-grown adult will become completely calcified within 15 minutes. As of yet, there is no known way to stop or reverse the process. The calcification process only affects the outer layers of the victim, extending about 3 centimeters into the body, leaving all organs and internal tissues intact. It also does not affect the eyes or mucous membranes. This means that victims of SCP-1013 are still alive but cannot move or react. Perhaps even more horrifying, SCP-1013 then eats its victims alive. SCP-1013 feeds by breaking the hardened outer layer with its beak much like a young chick would break its way out of an egg, and then feeding on the soft tissues preserved within. The victim will experience excruciating pain as the creature eats them alive, but they cannot resist, they cannot even scream to give voice to their pain. SCP-1013 has a voracious appetite and will consume nearly twice its body weight at each feeding. Victims usually die of blood loss before SCP-1013 can complete its meal. SCP-1013 does engage in caching behavior and has been known to store petrified victims for later consumption. It prefers mammals as prey and will attack livestock and game just as readily as it will attack humans. In times when mammal food sources are not available, desperation may drive SCP-1013 to turn its paralyzing powers on fish, birds, or even insects, but it will only do this if it is near to starving. SCP-1013 is hermaphroditic, and unlike other reptiles, does not reproduce sexually, but instead undergoes a process similar to budding or basic cellular division. Before reproducing, SCP-1013 will increase its feeding, gorging on food and growing rapidly in size. Eventually, it will develop cyst-like structures in its abnormally long tail, each of which contains a juvenile SCP-1013. Juvenile SCP-1013 hatch after only 48 hours. Parent SCP-1013 will typically release hatchlings within calcified prey, providing a ready food source for the juveniles until they can hunt on their own. Juvenile SCP-1013 will seek out cool, dark places like caves or abandoned buildings and begin rapid molting, doubling in size every six hours until reaching full adult size. Once they have reached adulthood, SCP-1013 will set out on their own 
and quickly establish their own hunting territories. SCP-1013 is extremely aggressive and will attack and attempt to calcify anyone that enters its enclosure, making it extremely difficult to contain. For this reason, combined with its deadly powers of calcification, SCP-1013 has been designated Object Level Keter. Any staff entering the containment area are to wear the AR-68 Armored Variant Hazmat Suit. Staff exiting the area with damaged suits are to be remanded to quarantine for one hour. Staff becoming paralyzed during cleaning, feeding, or testing cycles are to be immediately removed and remanded to medical custody until five hours after recovery. SCP-1013 is to be fed daily with one small mammal. However, any calcified animal remains are to be removed from the 1013 containment chamber and incinerated for safety reasons. 1013 is a frightening reminder that, while many entities have piercing gazes, comparatively few can end your life. Few, however, does not mean zero. The girl has been sitting in the waiting room for at least 20 minutes now, curled up on a hard plastic chair and staring at an inspirational poster on the wall. Her eyes are bleary and unfocused, with heavy dark circles that indicate she hasn't been sleeping well. She tries to focus her attention on the poster and read the words, but she's having trouble concentrating. She keeps nodding off, only to jerk back to wakefulness when her head starts to sag. This is what life is like for her after weeks of insomnia. She was just about at the end of her rope, certain that this was going to be her life from now on, until she happened to see an ad in the newspaper for a study at a local sleep clinic. She doesn't think much of that sort of thing, but she's desperate for anything that might help her to get a good night's sleep. Eventually, the door opens and a technician calls her into his office. The girl stumbles to her feet and drags herself inside. Thanks for volunteering to be part of our study says the technician. He's got a friendly smile and a soothing manner that instantly puts her at ease. It's obvious from his bedside manner that he's worked with lots of sleep-deprived patients before. He pulls out a clipboard and starts to make notes on a sheet of paper. We've gone over your application and we think that you would be a really good fit for this project. Thank goodness, thinks the girl. She had just about given up hope after that long wait. She half expected that they would simply tell her that she didn't qualify and sent her home to try and figure out how to get over her insomnia by herself. So you've been having trouble sleeping, says the technician. Tell me about that. The girl hunches her shoulders. There's not much to tell. I've had sleep problems for years. I have really bad sleep apnea, so I've always been a rough sleeper. I toss and turn, and I wake up at least several times a night, but it's really gotten bad lately. I can barely even drift off to sleep these last few weeks. The technician nods. That's exactly the kind of problem that we want to look into here, he says. For this study, we're going to monitor you as you sleep and see if we can diagnose this problem. She nods. The technician keeps talking, but she's not listening. She doesn't really care about the details. The important thing is that she's going to finally get a decent night's sleep. The technician leads her to a laboratory, a large room with several simple cots arranged along the walls. Next to each cot, she sees a bank of odd electronic machines. She doesn't immediately know what they're for, but she can guess. She's participated in sleep studies before, in hopes that they might be able to help cure her issues, and they usually connect machines like these to your forehead as you sleep so that they can read your pulse and brain activity. Sorry, it's not the most comfortable arrangement, says the technician, but all you have to do is sleep. There's a bathroom down the hallway if you need to get ready for bed. When you're ready, we'll prepare you for the next step. The girl doesn't care if the cots aren't all that comfortable in the technician's opinion. This might as well be the plushest feather bed to her. After changing into her night clothes and brushing her teeth, the girl returns to the lab. She finds the technician waiting for her, holding what appears to be a perfectly ordinary CPAP machine. The girl, of course, recognizes this device. She's used these things on multiple occasions in her desperation to find a solution to her sleep apnea. They're supposed to help open up the breathing passageways to increase airflow and thus reduce the incidence of sleep apnea, but the girl has never had much luck with them. She frowns. If this study is just testing a new sort of CPAP machine, she doesn't have a lot of faith that it's going to help her much. The technician notices her dismay. I know that you've probably used these before, he says. This is just the first step. We want to see how your sleep cycles react to ordinary treatments before we try anything more radical. Okay, sure. The girl doesn't have the strength to argue. She's bone tired, and she's ready to collapse into bed. Without another word, she takes the CPAP mask from the technician and straps it to her face. She climbs into bed, and the technician attaches the hose to the machine next to the bed. He switches it on, and the machine begins to emit a familiar, comforting hum. The technician attaches several electrodes to the girl's cheeks and forehead. 
He starts to explain that these will allow him to monitor her sleep cycles and check for any anomalous reactions. She's barely listening at this point. I'll just be monitoring you from the next room, says the technician, pointing to a video camera in the corner of the ceiling. So don't worry about anything. If there are any problems, I'll be watching. The girl barely has the strength to nod her head in response. She's so incredibly tired. Already she's drifting into oblivion. The room is swimming before her eyes, her mind distracted by hypnagogic illusions. The technician's voice sounds like it's a million miles away. She's practically already dreaming. Her eyes close before he even leaves the room. The technician takes his station at his desk, sitting before a bank of video monitors. The grainy gray feed from the security camera shows that the girl is fast asleep in her bunk, her chest rising and falling rhythmically with her breathing. Nothing unusual going on so far. The technician takes a sip from a mug of coffee and prepares for another boring night of watching someone else sleep. Of course, he hopes that the information gleaned from his observations might be of use in helping this girl to solve her sleep problems. And he hopes in turn, that might help other people with similar sleep apnea issues as well. But for now, he's just staring at the screen with half-hearted interest. At first, everything is quiet. The CPAP machine seems to be doing the trick, allowing the girl to breathe quietly and sleep peacefully. The technician watches without interest as the girl progresses through the different levels of sleep, the monitors in front of him reflecting the changes in her biorhythms. It isn't until she reaches her second round of REM sleep, the stage in which a sleeper dreams, that something strange happens. Under her eyelids, the girl's pupils quickly flick back and forth, almost as if she's watching a film. This is totally normal behavior, of course, during REM sleep. The technician barely even looks up as the monitors register her transition into this new sleep stage. He's been working at the sleep clinic for long enough that he knows to expect this. He might not have even looked up if his coffee cup hadn't happened to finally run out. When he hefts his empty mug, mumbling to himself in annoyance that now he's going to have to walk all the way across the facility to refill it at the coffee machine in the break room, that's when he finally catches sight of it. Huh? It happens so suddenly that at first, the technician doesn't believe his eyes. He thinks it must be a glitch in the hardware or possibly that his own eyes are playing tricks on him. Huh? He has been drinking a lot of coffee to stay awake after all, but no, it's really there. He can see that there is a second person in the room now, a large, dark silhouette standing over the girl as she sleeps. He blinks in surprise. How did someone get into the building, much less the laboratory, without him knowing? The figure is silent and motionless. It hardly seems threatening, but at the same time, it's hard not to read someone as threatening when they break into your room and stare at you as you sleep. As he watches, the figure starts to change subtly before his eyes. Soon, it's not just a solid blob of shadow. It's coalesced into a human figure, that of a large male humanoid. Its torso bulging with muscles, its arms laced with sinews, but instead of a face, this figure has the gleaming white skull of a horse. It remains standing over the girl. The girl snorts and turns in her sleep, grunting and mumbling. She's acting as if she's caught in an especially troubling nightmare and is struggling to wake up. The creature standing over her does not react to her movements, instead, staring down at her with an eerie, unflappable calm. The grainy camera footage makes it hard to make out the details, but the technician is almost certain he can see the tiniest flicker, like the reflection of light in a dilated pupil, in the empty sockets of the mysterious stranger's skull. The skull doesn't react. How could it react, after all? It's just a skull. But its silence, with that rictus grin and empty sockets, only makes it more frightening than if it had reacted. The technician gulps and rises to his feet, his knees shaking. He can't let this go on. He doesn't know what kind of practical joke is going on, but he did promise the girl that he would be responsible for her safety if anything weird happened. More to the point, the presence of this masked stranger might jeopardize the results of the study. He hurries from the office, making a beeline for the laboratory. He doesn't exactly know what he's going to say or do when he confronts this stranger. He just knows that he has to do it. But then, he starts to feel sleepy himself. The closer he gets to the laboratory, the more his own body starts to defy him. His limbs feel rubbery, his eyes feel heavy, and his thoughts start to swim. Despite all the coffee in his system, he also feels himself succumbing to sleep. He's only 50 yards from the door when he finally collapses into a heap on the floor. His eyes remain wide open, staring sightlessly ahead of him, and his mouth gapes like a fish out of water. Whatever he's experiencing, whether it's something that only he can see or something in his mind, his expression reveals only abject terror. Meanwhile, at the exact moment that the technician collapses, the figure standing over the girl in the lab blinks momentarily out of existence, as if somehow reacting to the commotion outside. 
and when it returns, it isn't alone. A second dark figure has also appeared in the room. It too starts life as an indistinct, only vaguely humanoid shadow, but quickly starts to gain form. This one is different from the first. It's a female body, but the figure's head has a blank face devoid of eyes, mouth, or nose. This second figure ignores the sleeping girl or her strange, stoic, horse-headed observer. Instead, it starts to move, ambling toward the western wall of the room, as if it knows that the comatose technician is directly on the other side. When it reaches the wall, it does not pause. It simply phases through the solid structure, disappearing through the brick and mortar, and reappearing in the hallway beyond. The faceless woman approaches the prone body of the technician. It squats down next to him and puts its hand under his chin, turning his head so that it can stare into his eyes, or stare as effectively as possible when it doesn't have any eyes of its own. After a few moments of silent contemplation, the faceless creature places its hand against the technician's forehead. Slowly, its hand starts to move through his head, reaching deep into his skull as if its hand was as insubstantial as a ghost. Just as this mysterious nightmare creature was able to phase through the wall, it appears to be able to phase through flesh as well. After several moments, the faceless woman withdraws its hand and drops the technician's head. He slumps to the ground in response. The faceless woman stands up, and then… it vanishes instantly. At the exact same time, the girl in the other room snorts and stirs. She blinks her eyes open. For a moment, she doesn't remember where she is. Her eyes scan the unfamiliar room for several seconds before she recalls that she was participating in a sleep study. That's right, she was trying to find out if she could find any help for her sleep apnea. Ironically, she actually slept better than normal. As she removes the CPAP mask, she wonders if maybe she ought to see about buying one of these for herself. This particular model seems to work better than the one she's tried in the past. She stretches and sits up. Just then, the technician bursts into the room. He's panicked and out of breath, and he whips his head back and forth in search of the mysterious horse-headed stranger. But there's no sign of the creature now. Just like the faceless woman, it seems to have vanished without a trace. The girl stares at him in confusion. Why is he so upset? She has no clue about what happened while she was asleep. Did you see it? Says the technician breathlessly. The creature! The shadow creature! The girl raises a skeptical eyebrow. What are you talking about? She says. I just woke up. The technician starts to sputter out an explanation, but the girl just rolls her eyes. She came here to get help with her sleep, but it sounds like the technician is the one who's got a real problem. His breathless descriptions of a horse-headed monster and a faceless woman clearly sound like bad dreams to her. You would think that a guy running a sleep study wouldn't be so easily confused like that. She's pretty sure that he probably just fell asleep at his station, and now he's embarrassed to admit that he just had a bad dream. Little do either of them know that although they won't see the strange entities again, those creatures are always going to be very, very close to them going forward. What a nightmare. But what seems like just a bad dream is, in fact, an anomaly well known to the SCP Foundation. It's formally been designated as SCP-3060, but agents more often refer to it as the Dream Machine. Instances of SCP-3060 are small medical devices that superficially resemble continuous positive airway pressure, or CPAP machines. The individual materials that compose SCP-3060 instances are non-anomalous and operate in the same way as a typical CPAP machine of its size and make. The Foundation currently has five instances of SCP-3060 in its custody. SCP-3060's anomalous effects become apparent when worn by a sleeping human. When an individual wearing an instance of SCP-3060 enters their second REM cycle, a humanoid incorporeal entity, hereafter referred to as SCP-3060-A, will appear within a 5-meter radius of the individual and stand over them until they wake up. At this point, SCP-3060-A will disappear, and the individual wearing SCP-3060 will become infected. From that point on, regardless as to whether the individual wears SCP-3060, the same SCP-3060-A entity will appear when they enter their second REM cycle each night and remain watching over them until awakening. While instances of SCP-3060-A appear as featureless silhouettes upon their first manifestation, they quickly take on a unique shape based on each infected individual. SCP-3060-A entities have no standard appearance, and it is not clear what factors determine the final form of any individual SCP-3060-A. Since the manifestations are connected with REM sleep, agency researchers speculate that an SCP-3060-A's appearance may be influenced by an infected sleeper's dreams. 
So far, observed SCP-3060-As have included a human infant composed entirely of fused teeth, an eyeless elderly woman dressed in dark clothes, a partially disintegrated humanoid composed of ash and dressed in red lingerie, a naked humanoid covered in tire tracks and showing signs of severe crush injuries, a humanoid whose torso consisted of a large mouth, and a clown. Some researchers have noted that the initial shadowy appearances of SCP-3060-A recall descriptions of entities reported during bouts of sleep paralysis, but so far, no conclusive link has been found. While an SCP-3060-A instance is present, any person standing within a 50-meter radius of the infected sleeper will enter a catatonic state. At this point, an additional instance of SCP-3060-A will appear. The additional SCP-3060-A entity will then approach the catatonic subject, phasing through solid matter if the subject is in a separate room. Upon arriving at the subject, the new SCP-3060-A instance will phase its hand through the subject's skull and then vanish, causing the subject to fall asleep immediately. All subjects touched by the SCP-3060-A entity in this manner will become new instances of SCP-3060 infected upon awakening. Awakening an infected sleeper will cause the attending SCP-3060-A to immediately vanish and catatonic subjects to regain movement. All attempts to communicate with SCP-3060-A instances have thus far been unsuccessful. People infected by SCP-3060 will inevitably suffer long-term health effects, most often associated with severe sleep deprivation. After three days, infected individuals begin to display fatigue, mood changes, impaired performance, and memory problems, all of which are so severe that even obtaining a full night's sleep does little to dent their impact. Infected individuals often report frequent nightmares, though no central themes or correlations have been observed in the content of these dreams, nor do they seem to correspond with the appearance of the infected persons attending SCP-3060-A. Within a month, infected individuals will start having visual and auditory hallucinations, as well as delusions that their mind is being controlled by some outside force. Soon after, infected individuals descend into full psychosis as they become unable to distinguish the content of their dreams from reality. In extreme cases, after at least two months of infection, hair loss, canides subita, partial or complete blindness, somatic complaints, cataplexy, and alien limb syndrome have been observed. Attempts by medical staff to alleviate these conditions in the long term have thus far been met with failure, although sleep deprivation has ironically proven effective in temporarily delaying the onset of more severe symptoms. If no human subjects entered the area of an SCP-3060 infected individual's effect during REM sleep for seven consecutive days, or the infected individual dies, an instance of SCP-3060-A will appear. The SCP-3060-A entity will then proceed to search for the nearest sleeping human. Upon locating a sleeper, SCP-3060-A will stand over them until they enter their next REM sleep cycle, at which point the SCP-3060-A entity will reach into their skull and vanish. At this point, the sleeping individual will become infected. If the sleeping individual wakes up before the process is complete, or if SCP-3060-A cannot locate a suitable subject within three hours, it will vanish without spreading the SCP-3060 infection. In one experiment, an infected individual was placed in a standard humanoid containment cell. Four D-Class personnel were placed in adjoining cells. When the infected individual fell asleep and entered their second REM cycle, an SCP-3060-A entity appeared with predictable results. The first SCP-3060-A to appear resembled a headless humanoid with its arms and legs replaced by spinal columns. It stood above the infected sleeper, watching without movement, even as four additional instances of SCP-3060-A manifested inside the cell. All five SCP-3060-A instances stood in silent observation of the infected sleeper for approximately five minutes. By this point, all four D-Class personnel in adjoining cells had gone into catatonic states, seeing as they were within the 50-square-meter blast zone established by the initial SCP-3060-A. Each D-Class personnel who was awake at the time of manifestation was observed to have frozen with expressions of extreme distress on their face. The four additional SCP-3060-A instances then began to disperse, each one moving toward a different D-Class personnel's cell, phasing through solid matter as necessary to reach the intended target. 
Each additional SCP-3060-A instance completed its manifestation by reaching into the skull of its target and then subsequently assuming a definite, final form before vanishing. The four additional SCP-3060-As, respectively, took on the appearance of a male human with mathematical symbols in place of facial features, a humanoid composed of tightly wound thread, a featureless white humanoid dressed in a foundation lab coat, and a featureless black humanoid dressed in a hodgepodge of regalia from different authoritarian regimes. The initial SCP-3060-A continued to stand in silent observation of the original infected sleeper after the other instances vanished, remaining so for the rest of the night until she woke up. Since SCP-3060 has not been found to differ in any way from a normal CPAP machine, SCP agents currently know very little about how SCP-3060 can cause these manifestations, who is manufacturing SCP-3060, or for what purpose. At this time, the only advice that SCP researchers can offer is this. If you're having trouble sleeping and want to make use of a CPAP machine, make sure you're buying a name brand. Otherwise, you might just be opening yourself up to a world of nightmares, insomnia, and silent but all too present nocturnal visitors. A scientist sits in his lab working on an experiment when the door suddenly opens and a tall, hard-nosed man enters. The scientist hastily stands up and salutes the general who oversees the scientist's entire program. The general dispenses with formalities and tells the scientist that he's being assigned to something new. Before the scientist can even ask what it is he'll be working on, the general gives a small wave of his hand and two soldiers appear in the doorway. They are each holding the side of a large metal box, and from the strained expression on their faces, it's clear that the box is very heavy. They set the box down on the scientist's heavy wooden desk with a loud thud before stepping away from it. The scientist looks over the bulky lead case that's been brought to him, no idea of what could be waiting inside. Be very careful with this, the general says, before handing a folder full of papers to the scientist. The scientist, unsure of how to respond, moves his hand to salute the general, but he has already turned on his heel and started to exit the small lab, followed closely behind by the two soldiers. The scientist looks over the folder that was given to him. There's nothing on the cover, so he opens it and starts looking inside, skimming over the long, dry paragraphs that say nothing at all and seem to be included in every government report for some reason. Ah, there it is. Contents. One 6.2 kilogram sphere of plutonium-239. Plutonium-239? He's been doing research in this army-run research lab for some time and knows exactly what this is. A sphere of plutonium-239 can only be one thing. A core for a new atomic bomb. Two were already dropped on the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and their never-before-seen power caused death and destruction on a truly horrendous level. But they had also helped to put an end to the Second World War, potentially saving the lives of thousands or even millions more. And no matter what moral questions he had about it, this was his job. And as an expert in physics and chemistry, his research would potentially help put a stop to fighting in the future. After all, no one would dare go to war when they knew their opponent had weapons that could cause devastation on this scale, right? The scientist pours over the typewritten records, reading each and every handwritten note in the margins. As he reads through them, he sees warnings about the experiments from the report's unnamed author. There are references to how slim the safety margins are when handling the material for testing. Since the core is intended to be used in a new nuclear weapon, it needs to be right on the edge of supercriticality, the point where fissile material undergoes a chain reaction that is key to nuclear detonations. The report then describes an experiment where the core was to be surrounded with bricks made of tungsten carbide that would act as a mirror of sorts, bouncing neutrons back at the core, which would knock loose other neutrons. The experiment was to be stopped before the core went supercritical, but when the scientist turns the page to view the results, he finds… nothing. There's no more pages in the folder. The scientist had heard rumors about these types of experiments, tickling the dragon's tail, they called it. But where were the rest of the reports? Was this really the last experiment that was done? He sees at the top of the page that this last experiment was performed over a year ago. Just then, the scientist notices someone walking by in the hall. It's the general. He runs out into the hallway, waving the report at him. General! General! The general stops and turns around, clearly annoyed at being intercepted while on the way from one important meeting to another. General, what happened in the last experiment? The general somehow looks even more annoyed by the question. Don't worry about it, he barks back at the scientist. His time on the project was finished. It's yours now. And with that, the general leaves the scientist standing in the hall with his incomplete file. Days pass, and the scientist receives additional orders on what types of experiments he should be carrying out. All of them are designed to guarantee that the core of plutonium will be suitable for use in a new weapon. 
For the latest test, he's performing an experiment not dissimilar to the last one described in the report, but instead of using tungsten carbide bricks to reflect neutrons back at the core and achieve criticality, a beryllium dome had been created, which is to be lowered down over the sphere of plutonium. As he lowers the dome, he knows that if it were to close completely, it would cause the core to go supercritical in an instant. In order to prevent this, he uses a screwdriver to prop up one side of the dome, allowing just enough neutrons to escape so that the core can maintain its stability. As he lowers the dome just a small amount more, he starts to hear something. It's a faint noise at first, but gradually grows more and more audible. Radioactivity produces no sound, so the scientist is confused, especially since it sounds like the noise is coming from inside the dome. But surely that's impossible. There were no processes happening within that should be creating any sort of noise. The scientist bends down and lifts up the edge of the dome ever so slightly more, just enough so that he can peek inside. As he does, the sound grows louder. He looks right into the core of plutonium-239 and sees something. There is movement on the sphere. He knows this is impossible, but he can see them with his own eyes, images dancing on the surface of the plutonium sphere. They were faces, unnatural faces, contorted and twisted in pain. He can see now that these are the source of the sound he was hearing because the faces are screaming. The scientist jumps back and the screwdriver slips away from the edge of the beryllium dome, allowing it to fall and completely cover the plutonium. Out in the hallway, a security guard covers his eyes, momentarily blinded by the flash of intense blue light. When his vision returns, he runs into the laboratory it came from. The exposed sphere of plutonium sits on the desk, and the security guard looks up to see that the dome that once covered it has been embedded into the ceiling. He hears a moan come from the other side of the desk and rushes around to help the scientist, but when he looks down at the ground, he doesn't see a man. Lying there on the floor is a charred and bloody body, the small amount of skin and flesh that is left sloughing off his body. The scientist reaches toward him with a skeletal hand, emitting one final groan before collapsing. Nuclear weapons have claimed many lives, not just those who suffered directly from their overwhelming destructive energy or the subsequent residual radiation known as fallout, but many of those who researched and developed the science and technology behind them also became victims of their incredible, almost otherworldly power. Today's anomaly is an example of exactly that, combining the astonishing power of nuclear weapons with the world of the supernatural. This is SCP-095-FR, the Demon Core. SCP-095-FR is a 6.2-kilogram sphere, 89 millimeters in diameter, that is composed entirely of plutonium-239. Despite at one point seeming to be a normal sphere of the plutonium isotope, SCP-095-FR now seems to be in a permanent, self-sustaining state of criticality. This results in a near-constant emission of alpha radiation, which is powerful enough to damage any electrical circuits within a 20-meter radius. The sphere's danger grows the closer you get to it, too. Within a 10-meter radius, any living tissue will become extremely irradiated, leading to radiation sickness, while denser materials like metal or bone will themselves become extremely radioactive. The plutonium sphere is somehow able to maintain a consistent mass, despite its state, which should lead to a decrease in overall mass. It's theorized that it may be undergoing some sort of regenerative process, though it's been impossible to determine just how this might be occurring. SCP-095-FR was recovered from the seafloor near Bikini Atoll, which was the site of a series of nuclear weapon tests by the United States government known as Operation Crossroad. These and later tests, including the Castle Bravo test, resulted in the island chain becoming extremely irradiated, and many of the island's residents soon showed signs of acute radiation syndrome, leading to much of the indigenous population being forced to relocate. Following the Operation Crossroad test, an anomalously high source of radiation was detected in the sea. Though records are incomplete, it appears that the core of plutonium that had been responsible for the deaths of multiple scientists had somehow ended up on the ocean floor. Whether it got there due to being part of a failed bomb detonation, or if it somehow appeared there by other, more anomalous means, is unknown. But regardless of how it got there, the attempted recovery of the object led to the deaths of several American service members from radiation-related illnesses, which the SCP Foundation soon learned of. After assisting in the retrieval of the sphere, the plutonium was relinquished to the Foundation's custody for containment. The SCP-095-FR sphere was placed under the purview of the French branch of the SCP Foundation, owing to their having a readily available site for containment, where the sphere was stored in a lead-lined radiation-blocking safe and classified as Euclid. 
Only D-Class were permitted to transport and handle the plutonium, since its effects amounted to a death sentence for anyone who got too close. They were also responsible for transferring the sphere to a new safe every six months, due to the damage it was causing them from constant bombardment of radiation. All of these containment procedures would have to be changed, though, following the events of January 7, 2015. On that day, 69 years after it first took the lives of two scientists at the Los Alamos laboratory, and despite it being a scientific impossibility, the Demon Core suddenly went supercritical all on its own. The resulting explosion was estimated to be roughly 33 kilotons, or about twice the power of the atomic bombs that had been detonated over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Nearly the entire site housing SCP-095-FR was destroyed, along with 14 other safe and Euclid-class anomalies, and in the end, the death count totaled 285, with casualties coming from either the blast itself, the collapse of structures on the site, or from the resulting radiation poisoning. Incredibly, the sphere itself survived the explosion, showing no signs that it had detonated with the force of a nuclear weapon when it was recovered from the site's wreckage. Foundation researchers studying the Demon Core determined that it was likely to explode again in roughly 50 years, and that the only discernible difference measured in the core before it suddenly went supercritical and destroyed the Foundation site was a sudden spike in radiation. Foundation scientists have no idea how the Demon Core survived, or how it detonated without warning. Some theorize that it may exist in some kind of time loop, which would potentially explain its explosion regeneration cycle, and that it is possible the core has actually detonated several times before entering into Foundation custody. But perhaps the bigger question when it comes to the Demon Core and why it has become such a dangerous object is why. Is there something contained within this seemingly cursed sphere of plutonium? Is it a part of those who have been impacted by the quest to harness the power of atomic energy somehow contained within? Now desperate to get out and unleash their anger on the world? Research continues, but due to the extreme danger that comes from working with the anomaly, it's likely these questions will remain unanswered for some time. Following the destruction of the Foundation site, SCP-095-FR was reclassified to Keter and moved to an underground bunker designed to withstand an explosion equivalent to a standard atomic bomb, which it is hoped will be enough to contain the blast that is almost inevitably going to happen again. It's a sobering thought, even for those of us who work with and around anomalies on a daily basis, to be reminded of the incredible destructive power of nuclear weapons. Some of the most feared and deadly anomalies contained by the SCP Foundation pale in comparison to the carnage that we've inflicted on ourselves, and it's important to remember that sometimes the true demons are found inside of us. It's a quiet day in a small American town. It's warm, with a slight breeze. A calm, simple Sunday, just like so many others. Very few people set their alarms, and most are still asleep at 8 a.m. It's the kind of town where everyone knows and trusts everyone else. After all, what are good neighbors for? While his wife still sleeps back in their modest home, a retired man in his mid-sixties decides to start the day off right. With a rod in one hand and a tackle box in the other, he makes his way down the side of a grassy embankment towards his favorite fishing spot along the local river. He's even got a pair of neatly cut sandwiches in an old-fashioned metal lunch pail, the picture of small-town bliss. But something he sees stops him in his tracks. Something large, floating in the water. He freezes. He wants to write it off as driftwood or some trash that someone has thrown into the river, but in his heart of hearts, he knows better than that. What's floating in the water is a human corpse. Not long after, the local sheriff's department is on the scene, dredging the body out of the water. It's about as small and underfunded as you can expect for a group of police officers from a place where nothing ever seems to happen. There hadn't been a murder in this quaint little burg in years. When they turn over the body, it isn't hard to make a positive ID. The pallid, water-bloated face of a well-known local man stares up at them with blank, dead eyes. Some in attendance gasp at the sight of it. It had been years since the last murder in town, but when that last murder had occurred, the prime suspect had been this very same man. Ten years prior, he had been a successful local mechanic, but that all changed when his wife turned up dead in a field, her face caved in by some kind of heavy bludgeoning instrument. It was a brutal crime, the most horrific the town had ever seen. Reporters traveled in from all over the state to cover it, and that's when the web of secrets tied around this one tragic incident began to truly unravel. It was an open secret in town that the man and his wife weren't exactly on the fondest of terms. He was known for having affairs with women half his age. 
Rumor had it that his wife was tired of being betrayed and humiliated by her good-for-nothing philandering husband and was finally going to break it off. With the knowledge of his infidelity being so public, she'd take him for all he was worth in divorce court. And it wasn't long after these rumors began that she turned up dead. Soon fingers were pointed, most of them, naturally, in the man's direction. He lawyered up and denied every charge, but in the court of public opinion he'd already been convicted. That, however, was the only court he'd ever be convicted in. Despite the wealth of circumstantial evidence, there wasn't enough to convict him of his wife's killing. He was acquitted of all charges and went free, despite his reputation in town taking a severe dive. In the next few years, he'd marry one of his very young mistresses, and the news story would fade away back into the darkness of small-town rumors and hearsay. The murder of his wife would remain forever unsolved. With all the context in mind, the fishermen, a few locals, and the handful of police officers stare down at the dead face of the man, his soaked body sprawled out on the riverbank. A police deputy uses a gloved hand to tilt his head upward slightly, revealing the long, deep wound in his throat, carved so deep it cuts to bone. His throat had been slashed, and whoever had done it had been extremely thorough. The identity of the victim had been confirmed, as had the method of murder. Only one question remained. Who murdered him? Hours later, across town, a man wakes up alone in bed after a long, refreshing sleep. His young wife of five years went downstairs a few hours before to do some chores and cook breakfast, leaving him to his rest. He rubs the sleep from his eyes and yawns. It's a sunny day outside. How wonderful. And he can smell breakfast cooking downstairs. He smiles, gets up, dresses, and makes his way down the stairs at a leisurely pace. He can hear his wife humming in the kitchen. As he passes the threshold, he calls her name, and she freezes up. Her body shakes slightly. Is that fear? He doesn't understand. He steps closer. Suddenly, she turns and screams at him, like he's an intruder wearing a ski mask and holding out a knife. He tells her that it's just him, that everything is fine. He begs her to explain what's going on. Instead, she asks what he's doing in her house and threatens to call the police. He has no idea what's going on. He takes another step forward, and she reacts severely. His young wife grabs the handle of her frying pan and swings it, hitting him as sausages and hot oil fly through the air. He shrieks in a mix of pain, shock, and pure terror before running out of the room. What is happening? Has his wife lost her mind? He needs to get help immediately. He rushes out of his house, but when he reaches the street outside, he finds no safety or comfort, only confused, judgmental stares from his supposed neighbors. They all turn to look at him with the exact same expression as his wife, a look that says, Who are you? As he continues to run, calling for help and fighting back the pain of his oil-scalded skin, he just gets more of those same stares from everyone he encounters. They look at him like he's some kind of raving madman, not someone who'd just been the victim of a random and brutal domestic assault. And yet, back at his home, his wife is already calling the local police to tell them about the stranger who'd just broken into her house and tried to attack her. The sheriff's department deputy on the other end of the line can't believe what he's hearing. A man turns up dead in the local river, and before they can even give his wife the news, she's calling to report that a stranger had tried to attack her in her own home. Could it be any more obvious that this stranger was the one behind her husband's murder? Given that everyone knows everyone in a town like this, it stands to reason that her husband's killer and his wife's home invader must have come from out of town, perhaps a drifter or someone her husband had owed money to. Given the kind of person he was, it was no surprise that he'd burned some kind of bridge badly enough that someone out there would want him dead and act on that desire. Case closed. All that was left to do now was catch this violent madman and bring him to justice before he could hurt anyone else. What kind of justice would they give him, exactly? Well, they could decide on the particulars later. As the man continues his frantic run across town, searching in vain for somebody, anybody to come to his aid, rumors begin to spread through town. After all, in a place where everyone knows everyone, people have a tendency to talk. It doesn't take long for half of the town to hear about the local man who'd been found dead in the river with his throat slashed open, that the same maniac that killed him had made an attempt on his young wife's life, and she just barely managed to fight him off, that the murderer had come in from out of town, and that now he was running through the streets, babbling like a psychopath. It doesn't take long for a consensus to form. It's clear that, if left to his own devices, this outsider will only hurt more people. Who will it be next? It could be any of them. The townsfolk feel afraid, upset, unsafe. But most of all, they feel paranoid. The shadow of the maniac seems to be lurking around every corner. 
If they want to keep themselves safe and avenge the death of the poor man in the river, they'll need to take justice into their own hands. Or this intruder could completely upend their town's quiet life. It's the only way. They unlock their gun safes and arm themselves with shotguns, handguns, and rifles. Those without guns grab bats, hammers, and knives. Some grab shovels and pitchforks from their tool sheds. This loose maniac may be dangerous, but they have numbers on their side. Together, they'll find him and give him what he deserves. The man is still running through the streets, in pain, wondering where everyone has gone. His life is falling apart around him, and he doesn't even know why. Is this all a nightmare? Is he going insane? Before long, he can hear footsteps. People are approaching in groups, yelling, chanting. He sees a crowd turn a nearby corner and stare. Guns, knives, literal pitchforks and torches, wide, bulging eyes and born teeth. Someone points at him and barks, there he is, get him! That's when he realizes that, for some reason, these maniacs have it in for him too. He turns tail and begins to run. He hasn't gone insane, everyone else has. He can hear the thundering of their many footsteps chasing him. He ducks and screams as gunshots ring out, whizzing past him. Some even throw rocks. All these people. This isn't fear, this is pure, undiluted rage. They want to kill him in the street in broad daylight. He hears some of them screaming, Murderer! Murderer will get you! In his terrified mind, he wonders, Is this what this is all about? His first wife? He'd been acquitted, it was so many years ago. Why would they all turn on him? Why now? It's... Relief swells and washes over him when he sees a police cruiser making its way towards him from the other end of the street. They'd save him from these bloodthirsty maniacs. The car comes to a stop, and a pair of familiar police officers step out. They seem oddly calm given the situation. The man approaches, trying to plead with him through a throat racked by pain, exhaustion, and terror. The mob is hot on his heels now. He needs help. He desperately needs help. But as he tries to form the words, he gets a hard lesson in the fact that these police officers are the wrong people to come to for that. The one closest to him slides the baton out of his belt and strikes the man across the face. His face feels a sudden explosion of pain as his cheekbone shatters. Before he can even register what's going on, the other officer strikes the back of his leg with his baton, and he crumbles to the ground. The two of them begin beating him relentlessly while he begs for mercy through broken teeth, and it's not long until the rest of the mob catches up and surrounds him. With a final strike to the face, everything goes black. When he opens his eyes, it's nighttime, and he can feel something constricting his wrists and neck. Heavy ropes cut into his skin. His hands are bound, and there's a noose around his neck, the other end tied to a branch of a tree above him. His feet teeter precariously on a stool below. The rope has no slack. He's surrounded by the townspeople, all armed and staring hatefully at him. The only light comes from their burning torches. The sheriff stands at the front of the crowd, his weeping wife standing next to him. With a stony face, he dictates that, for the crime of murder, he has been found guilty and is sentenced to hang by the neck until he is dead. His eyes widen one last time in pure panic as the sheriff holds up a photo of the dead man pulled from the river. What? No, there must be some kind of terrible mistake. I didn't kill that man. I am that man. I am. I swear. Please. But before he can even form the words, his own wife steps forward and kicks out the stool from under his feet. While this story of fear, paranoia, mob mentality, and unspeakable violence may seem as sadly natural and human as breathing air, the spark that ignited this tinderbox was decidedly inhuman. This is SCP-3852, also known as Small Town Justice. First, meet SCP-3852-1. No matter what your gut feeling may be, I assure you that you do not recognize him. He's an unidentified male corpse, and also an intrinsic factor in the SCP-3852 phenomenon. There are many SCP-3852-1 instances, and all of them are physically and biologically identical. And if ever you encounter one of them, unless the SCP Foundation can intervene in time, something terrible will happen. To put it simply, one of these unidentified corpses will manifest within the bounds of a small town or village typical with a population of over 2,000 people on the East Coast or in the Midwest of the United States. Upon someone seeing the SCP-3852-1 corpse, the SCP-3852 phenomenon will begin. Despite having no internal or external injuries in an objective sense, the victims of its anomalous effects will believe that it is a person from their town who has been recently murdered, despite the fact that this victim is very much alive in town. 
While initially it was believed that the selection of the victim, dubbed SCP-3852-2, was entirely random, as more and more SCP-3852 incidents popped up since the first was recorded in 1978, a pattern began to emerge. It was discovered that the victims were all people who were believed to have committed some serious or repeated crimes in the past, but who were acquitted or otherwise cleared of charges. But when the phenomenon begins, a frightening switch occurs. While the body will take on the identity of the victim for a number of the township citizens, the actual victim will become a depersonalized stranger, an outsider, someone to be looked upon with active suspicion that soon grows into paranoia and, eventually, uncontrollable rage and bloodlust. But the fury of the mob being directed at one person is one thing, a town being dragged into what seems like an outright civil war is quite another. The mob will arm themselves and go on the hunt for the accused. During the process, if anyone in town attempts to stop them, such as when individuals try to stand up on behalf of the accused encouraging the mob to exercise caution and approach the situation rationally, as happens in many SCP-3852 events, they too will become perceived differently. It is estimated that between 11 and 27 percent of the affected community will not be swayed to join the vigilante group, and when they refute the accusations, they will be accused of trying to impede the course of justice. When the violence eventually breaks out though, as it always does, they will not be spared. When the victim that started it all is finally found, they will be violently executed, at which point the townsfolk will all begin behaving normally and life will resume once more as if nothing ever happened. In the aftermath, people will give inconsistent accounts of what occurred, but none will experience any long-term traumatic effects from taking part in or witnessing the violence. Since the phenomenon was first noted back in 1978, the SCP Foundation has recorded 16 different SCP-3852 incidents, some of which have been appended to the official files for expository purposes. One such event, labeled EV-3852-07F3T, is the very first that the Foundation encountered. During this 3852 event, which occurred in a small town in Indiana, 368 people were brought under the thrall of the anomaly's effects when the SCP-3852-1 body was encountered in the town square just after sunrise and was identified as belonging to a 28-year-old local unemployed man named Glenn. It didn't take long for the citizens to turn on the still-living Glenn, causing the poor young man to try and flee from the hundreds of people baying for his blood. He was eventually overtaken by the townsfolk while trying to cross a river and escape from the town. He was pulled from the river and beaten viciously. He was then dragged back into the town square and hanged for his perceived crime of murdering himself. The SCP Foundation managed to recover the anomalous SCP-3852-1 corpse before questioning the remaining townsfolk and administering amnestics. An even worse event occurred 18 years later in Ohio, recorded as EV-3852-15C1K. This time, 572 people were affected by SCP-3852 when the body of a controversial local man named Hector was discovered in a nearby schoolyard. Hector was a former factory worker until he was involved in a drunk driving incident which resulted in another driver dying and left Hector paralyzed from the waist down. When the body was found, suspicion of course immediately fell upon the real Hector for the crime. When roughly 23% of the community objected to these accusations, they also became targets of the violent mob intent on taking Hector's life out of their twisted sense of justice. When later interviewing one of the mob's ringleaders, a 52-year-old named Matthew Escott, the Foundation discovered that neither him nor any of the other mob members noticed the strange coincidence that Hector's killer was also a paraplegic man of about the same size and build as Hector. As predicted, nobody involved seemed to carry any guilt or even full awareness of what they'd carried out in pursuit of justice. Hector and those who were attempting to defend him were chased into an abandoned barn on the edge of town for a final standoff. The mob dragged out Hector and his defenders and brutally murdered them all. MTF Epsilon 6, also known as the Village Idiots, a group specializing in small town anomalies, was called in to retrieve the SCP-3852-1 body and clean up the mess in the aftermath. Incidentally, a video of the carnage was somehow leaked onto the video sharing website YouTube some years later, causing a containment fiasco for the Foundation. The investigation into the cameraman who filmed and presumably uploaded the video is ongoing and any information you may have into their identity should be reported to the nearest Foundation agent so that they can be properly terminated debriefed. SCP-3852 is an incredibly insidious anomaly, because even in the most desirable scenario possible, at least one person is doomed to die. 
In order for the town to be pacified and released from the anomalous effects of SCP-3852, the victim designated SCP-3852-2 must be neutralized. There simply appears to be no other way. When the village idiots are dispatched to a town in the thrall of SCP-3852, they are under strict instructions to execute the SCP-3852-2 individual as quickly as possible and distribute amnestics in order to avoid any additional or unnecessary bloodshed before collecting the SCP-3852-1 body and bringing it back for containment with the others at a secure Foundation site. Naturally, the SCP Foundation remains on the lookout for strange, hostile activity arising in small towns for fear that it could be another SCP-3852 incident unfolding. There is no way of predicting where the anomaly will strike next, given that anywhere with a population over 2,000 on the East Coast or in the Midwest is vulnerable to its influence. As such, it has been given the Keter class to reflect the challenges it poses to reliable containment. The fact that SCP-3852 seems to attack people with some prior history of accused crime does nothing to narrow down this roster either. After all, every small town, no matter how idyllic, holds dark secrets. SCP-3852 just provides a way to bring those secrets into the light. You've seen his face before, probably during a particularly distressing bout of sleep paralysis. His appearance can vary a bit from manifestation to manifestation, but a few traits are always present. He resembles an elderly man, his touch corrodes everything in his path, his presence creates a disgusting, black, mucus-like substance thought to be a method of pre-digestion of his prey, and he is rotting. No matter his appearance, he is always in some stage of decomposition, gray skin sloughing away from yellowed bone, eyes milky and flat but brimming with malice, wide, toothless mouth stretched into a wicked grin. The entity is incredibly difficult to contain. Its corrosive properties and ability to vanish into solid matter and disappear into its pocket dimension layer make it a threat as unpredictable as it is dangerous. The smell of decay and the presence of visible corrosion on any surfaces nearby may be the only warning a person gets before the old man grabs them in his decomposing arms, dragging them off to a painful, terrifying demise. We know where the being disappears to and have learned a great deal about how he operates, but where did he come from? It is the year 2000. Dr. Robert Scranton and his wife, Dr. Anna Lang, are the head researchers at SCP Foundation Site 120. Over the course of their happy relationship, the two have been working on an experimental research project, an early prototype reality anchor device called the Lang Scranton Stabilizer. After a lot of late nights at the office, working and reworking the theory, it is, at long last, ready for testing. Dr. Scranton is standing in Reality Lab A as Dr. Lang observes from a nearby room. He follows the same routine he has followed each time they tested the LSS, walking down a line of buttons and levers, pressing and flipping each into place. The little red blinking light signifies that the microphone is recording his every comment and observation. Suddenly, the routine is broken by a low rumbling sound from deep, deep within the earth. The ground beneath him begins to shake, and Dr. Scranton stumbles, losing his balance as the once solid floor begins to roil and quake as the seismic shift rolls through the site. He hears the unmistakable grind and splintering of metal and plastic as the LSS-2 begins to shake, components sliding out of place and breaking off. Nearby, Dr. Lang's monitor goes dark as the security feed is cut short by the earthquake's damage. Robert! She screams, making a break for the door and rushing to Reality Lab A, terrified that she will find her husband's body lying on the floor. When she and the guards reach the room, however, they find… nothing. Well, not nothing entirely. The room is a wreck, bits of machinery strewn across the floor, the smell of burning plastic in the air. But the Lang Scranton Scrambler's control panel and Dr. Robert Scranton are nowhere to be found. Dr. Lang falls to her knees in the suddenly empty room, pounding at the floor in despair. Where did he go? She demands, but of course, no one knows the answer. No one wants to say what they're thinking. Wherever he is, Dr. Scranton is probably dead, probably long, long gone and he is never coming back. But no one says it, not out loud. They just think it, and keep thinking it, for the next five years, 11 months, and 21 days. The time passes, and most everyone forgets about Dr. Robert Scranton. Everyone except for Dr. Anna Lang. She never gives up hope, never lets go of the possibility that somewhere, in another world, another time, on another planet, her love is still alive. One day she wakes up and it's December 23rd, 2005, a day like any other 
save for its uncomfortable proximity to the holidays she struggles to celebrate nowadays. But then, in the middle of the day, something impossible happens. The LSS control panel reappears in Reality Lab A. It isn't how anyone last saw it, though. It's coated in some sort of unidentified organic matter, and it reeks of blood, vomit, and decay. As her colleagues try to shield her from the sight, try to warn her away, Dr. Anna Lang wades into the area, desperate for a glimpse at any sign of her husband's fate. As she makes her way into the containment field, she is unable to contain her horror. Oh God, what the hell, what, what, what is all this? This, this is, this is the, oh God, Robert, Robert, is this you? Oh God, please, please, no, don't let it be you, don't let it be you. Robert, I thought, I thought, how can this thing be? Her colleagues try to stop her, but she touches the Lang Scranton stabilizer interface and it fires to life. It still works. Somehow it still works. She racks her brain for what to do next before saying, access audio log, playback starting from January 2nd, 2000. The machine prompts her to verbally state her password and her voice shakes as she replies, password is Anna Bobana. Request acknowledged, processing, the machine replies. I'm sorry. There are no audio logs for January 2nd, 2000. Dr. Scranton accessed log on January 13th, 2000 via voice recognition at time. Anna slams her hands down on the machine with a cry. Play back now, damn it, play it back. The researcher warns her not to touch any of the material with her bare hands, but she doesn't hear him. She is too busy calling out to Robert, hoping that somehow, somewhere, he can hear her. There's so much blood here, there's so much. Honey, are you okay? Where did you go? Oh God, oh God, oh God. Something small and metallic clatters to the floor, lost in the sludge. She retrieves it, wipes it off on her lab coat, and holds it to the light. She would recognize it anywhere. She slipped it onto her true love's finger on the happiest day of her life. It's Robert's wedding ring. Her knees buckle at the realization. She collapses to the ground, and her head cracks against the floor. One of her colleagues snaps into action. Report, this is Dr. Matthew Skinner reporting from Site 120 Reality Lab A. I need medical attention here immediately. Once Dr. Lang recovers from her fall, she demands access to the rematerialized control panel. She's going to go through the audio logs one by one and find out exactly what happened to her husband, even if the truth is as ugly as she fears. The machine whirs to life, and her lost love's voice emanates from the speakers. Name, Robert Scranton, age 39. Birthday, September 19th, 1961. Favorite color, blue. Favorite song, living on a prayer. Wife, Anna. She has green eyes. I love her very much. He repeated these simple truths to himself for days before he even realized that the control panel was picking up his voice. My name is Robert Scranton. Yeah, yeah, my name is Robert Scranton. Former researcher at Foundation Site 120. It has been... I don't know, actually. I I can't remember. I, I estimate it's been ten days, but I, I, I don't... I, I can't... Oh, God. Can anyone hear me? I, I, I don't know what's happened. I, I don't know where I am. And, and please... Please, is anyone there? Hello? Anyone? Anyone! He began keeping track of how much time passed as best he could. Two weeks, three days, seven hours, and 58 minutes. Oh, Jesus. Back at the Foundation, with at least a tenuous knowledge of where Dr. Scranton could be, personnel try their best to stage some kind of rescue effort. A mobile task force team is ordered to attempt to replicate the experiment with a hastily assembled Lang Scranton stabilizer copy. The result is an explosion that kills three of them. Senior researchers also approach SCP-343, a powerful reality warper known to some as God, hoping to get some insight from him about where Dr. Scranton could be found. His response is, He's beyond any of us now. I'm truly, dreadfully sorry. Anna starts having nightmares. She twists and turns in bed, haunted by visions of her beloved Robert consumed by darkness. A strange specter starts to appear in her dreams, a man with a horrible, rotted face. She turns to her bedside table in the night, numbers blurry on the screen of her alarm clock. The photograph of herself and Robert that she keeps there. Something is wrong with him, wrong with his face, 
Is it that same awful rotted man? She screams and closes her eyes. When she opens them, the photo is normal again. She weeps into her pillow. It can't keep going on like this. This place, it's... It's some sort of... Reality gap, I think. If I don't concentrate on it, it's fine, but I feel this... Tingling all over my face, I'm not sure why. Two months, 15 days, four hours. Anna begins to accept the horrible truth. She may not see Robert ever again, and holding on to the foolish fantasy that she will is starting to kill her. She repeats it to herself like a mantra at work. Robert Scranton is dead. Robert Scranton is dead. Robert Scranton is dead. One day, a co-worker notices her muttering and strikes up a conversation. It's been years since Robert disappeared. What's the harm in talking to someone again? She even finds herself smiling and laughing at his jokes. But when he asks if she'd like to go for coffee, she gets a flash of Robert screaming in the darkness. Of that terrible, rotted face, grinning. She runs to the bathroom to throw up and weep. The tingling in my face has worsened. I wish I could sleep here. But all this damn gunfire overhead. I can't take it anymore. I can't take it. Trench foot. Shell shot. Hell would be a reprieve in a place like this. And all the men. All the poor souls who look up to me. Call me Corporal. What a jerk. To think I have any more idea of what's going on here. Anna can hear it in his voice. He's getting worn down. As Anna feels her emotions start to dull and fade, she begins accepting more dangerous assignments from her superiors, perhaps hoping just to feel something again. She works on the SCP-682 case, trying to devise more futile termination methods. She spends time with SCP-939, the abominations known as With Many Voices, until they start to imitate Robert's voice, and she knows that she can't do this anymore. She works with SCP-280, Eyes in the Dark, feeling no fear whatsoever as it floats towards her. The worst thing that could possibly happen to her has happened already. Now, she's just waiting, killing time. She has no idea of the further horrors to come. Lately, I've been hearing whispers in the dark. I think the rats are talking to me. <laughs> Funny. My troops must think me mad. What does it matter? This is a mad place, a mad time. A mad man is perhaps best suited to a time like this. So many went over the top yesterday, only to be cut down by machine gun fire. Isn't it odd that I laughed? It was so funny. I think perhaps this mental malady is connected to a physical one. Nosebleeds and vomiting spells. A strange black liquid. Faintly acidic to the touch, but so uh, delicious, so fun. My troops tell me I look unwell, like anything about this is well. Maybe I'll sneak into one of their bedsits tonight and teach them to lighten up a bit. None of them smile anymore. Me, I'm always smiling. I'll teach those little cowards to smile too. But as she listens to more of the logs, she's forced to reckon with the fact it really isn't him anymore. Not as she'd ever known him. He'd become something else. All the others are dead. <laughs> All my good, hard work making them dead. I followed them down the length of the trench. Their silly little bullets didn't hurt me. Oh no. Oh, no, no, no. The look on their faces. All the screaming as they saw me. How thrilling to savor their fear as I approached. All those screams. What are you, you horrible old man? I showed them what I am. I can walk through walls now, you know. Have all the fun I want. Yes, yes, yes. Nothing can hurt me anymore. And I can hurt everyone. And when the war is over, I'll go home. Go home to my sweetheart. I know she's waiting for me. I can't wait to see her. 
to touch her beautiful face. My lovely, lovely Anna. Hearing him like this, so broken, so utterly transformed, it's too much for her to bear. But the work always needs her, and she returns to it day after day. One night, she sits up late, making her way through a stack of paperwork. When she hears it, a curious sound, drip, 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 something thick dripping steadily onto the floor behind her. The smell of rot fills her nostrils, making her gag. She turns and comes face to face with SCP-106, dripping its slimy black mucus onto the floor, bringing decay to everything it touches. It reaches out toward her, grasping at her arm. She breaks free, but not before its touch melts away the fibers of her lab coat, threatening to seep through the fabric to her skin. All the while, it's staring straight at her, like it knows her. Anna runs out of the lab as fast as she can, shouting for help. A guard tries to come to her assistance, firing his weapon at the old man. But the bullets don't leave a dent, don't even slow him down. The old man grabs the weapon from the guard's hands, letting the metal rust, warp, and melt in his grasp. Then, he turns his corrosive touch on the guard's face. Anna screams in horror at the sight, but she can do nothing to help him. All that she can do is keep running and hope that the monster doesn't catch her. She runs as fast as her legs can carry her, but she isn't as young as she once was, and years of sitting at a desk have made her muscles stiff and weak. Her foot hits the ground at just the wrong angle, and she stumbles, falling to the ground. She scrambles back to her feet, but when she looks up, something is horribly wrong. Her surroundings have changed. It looks like the Foundation site, but it's not quite the same. It's as if someone tried to recreate the facility from memory and couldn't retain all of the details. Then she hears it again, the drip, drip, drip. He's here. She spins around, and there it is, that awful face so close to her own. She takes a trembling step back when suddenly the monster speaks. <laughs> It's him. She knows it, as surely as she knows that she is about to die. The monster that once was Robert Scranton reaches out and caresses Anna's cheek with his wrinkled hand. She screams as the skin begins to droop, and he seals her lips with a kiss that makes her insides drip like melting wax. The two become one once again. What is it that you want? Not just what you want in this moment. That's fleeting. You get it and move on, or you don't, and you forget. No. What do you want? What do you yearn for? That humming dissatisfaction that underscores every moment of your life. The constant rumbling, always beneath the surface, that you can never put your finger on. Behind your computer monitor, at the bottom of your $4 coffee, that quiet moment when you go to the toilet at a friend's wedding and look at yourself in the mirror, asking, why am I not happy yet? This moment, this object, this feeling that I was looking forward to, why does it feel empty? A night in with your best friends, a promotion at work, a new car, a new house, all empty. So when I ask you again, I want you to be serious. None of that fake surface level fleeting drivel. What is it that you want? What will genuinely make you happy? The words buzz around the student's head. He hasn't listened to a word of this lecture, not for a moment. Last night's therapy session had clearly struck a bit too close to home. He'd never expected this new therapist to be so direct. What was it that he really wanted? The student looks down at his laptop. He'd really wanted that. He'd spent months researching it, holding off on buying other models, waiting and saving up for the perfect computer. And here it is, with the same old boring lecture notes on the screen as his old one. Within a week, he'd been back online looking up new phones. Here he is, 21 years old already, and studying for a degree he doesn't really care about. Surrounded by happy, smiling students who are all clearly going to be far more successful and happy than he'll ever be. Beautiful people everywhere he looks. People who know how to dress well, know how to have a conversation, how to smile and laugh with friends, 
how to have friends in the first place. His therapist is right. What's he got to be happy about? That dissatisfied humming running through his life is steadily turning into a roar. What would actually make him happy? The more he thinks about it, the more the sense of dread creeps in. What has he actually got to look forward to in life? What can fill that void? The lecture is over. He hadn't even realized. Everyone around him is already on their feet, putting notepads and laptops into bags, chatting away with their friends. The student doesn't have anyone else in his row. He's somehow picked the only row in the lecture hall with just one person in it. No, that's not the case. This is the only row in the lecture with just one person in it, because he picked it. His only company on this row? A fly. A fly that had been following him around all week. What's the point? He looks at his laptop screen. Empty. His phone buzzes. It's his mom. He declines the call. Swinging his bag onto his shoulder, the student makes his way to the door. A group of guys up ahead are chatting loudly as they open it. One of them half glances back over his shoulder. He stops in the doorway, holding the door open. The student looks around. No one else was with him. Who's this guy holding the door open for? You okay? The guy asks, looking straight at the student. His eyes are very blue. The student rushes through the doorway, muttering a thank you on his way through. His phone starts to ring again in his pocket. He sits up alone that night. He does the same most nights. Even if he wanted to, he wouldn't be able to fall asleep. Sharing a house with seven other people, there's a party happening in one part of the house pretty much every night. The thumping bass is the only sound to reach the student as he sits quietly at his window, looking out at the bags of trash lining the street and the couple across from him arguing on their porch. The little fly in his room is the only one keeping him company, not buzzing around or trying to escape through the glass, just sitting there next to him, watching the world go by. What is it that you really want? The words ring around in his head again. Tell me what will make you truly happy. What is it? I think… I think I just want someone to love me, the student says quietly. He sits quietly by the window for a few more minutes, not noticing as the little fly next to him catches fire and rolls onto its back, legs curled in the air. The student just goes to bed. Nothing's ever going to change, is it? A week later, the student is back in that same lecture again. He arrived early this week, sitting down and unpacking his stuff a good fifteen minutes before they were due to start. Surreptitiously as he can, the student glances over at the door every time he hears it swing open. It's the usual procession of beautiful, happy people, each one dressed exactly how they want, personalities, goals, and aspirations filling each of them. He looks down at his outfit. Gray. The lecture starts, but the student still can't quite focus. He keeps his head half-turned towards the door the whole time, waiting. Ten minutes go by. Nothing. He slumps down in his chair and starts taking notes, just as the door softly creeps open behind him, making a gentle hushing noise on the carpet. The student turns. There he is, the guy from before with the blue eyes. The student tries his best to swallow his grin. He's the only one in his row. If he can just get the guy's attention, maybe he'll come and sit with him. But no, that's a stupid plan. Why would anyone want to come and… The bag lands in the seat next to him. The student turns to see those same piercing blue eyes. Anyone sitting here? The guy whispers. The student opens his mouth to reply, but the words get stuck. After a second, he manages to shake his head. The guy with the blue eyes grins and sinks into the seat. After a moment, he asks if he can borrow a pen. That's funny. The student can see a pen right there in the side pocket of the guy's bag. Why would this guy choose to sit with him? There are plenty of free seats in this lecture hall. They're everywhere. One thing's for sure. The student definitely can't talk to this guy afterwards. No way. He's too weird. It'll be obvious. No one ever wants to have a conversation with him. Everyone he talks to is always sidling their way out of the room after just a couple of minutes. Besides, what if this guy finds out what he's really like? That he's been seeing a therapist? Not just a therapist. That would be pretty normal. Normal people do that. No, what if this guy found out that his therapist was a fly? A fly that had been following him around, that he'd been talking to every night before bed. A fly that had been asking him what his deepest desires were. A fly that he'd woken up to find dead and burnt on his windowsill this morning. Nope, no way is he going to have a conversation with this guy. It would just be a disaster. There's no other option. He has to call his mom. As soon as the lecture is over, he'll call her and deal with whatever it is she has to say. He takes the phone out of his pocket and stealthily gets his mom's contact details up, ready to hit the call button as soon as the lecture finishes. There, the final slide. 
The student hits dial and immediately turns away from the blue-eyed guy next to him, getting up and putting it to his ear. He shoulders his bag and marches out of the lecture hall, not looking back until he reaches the little square of grass outside where he sits. His heart doesn't stop hammering until he's sitting there. His mom takes a long time to pick up. When she does, it's clear that she's been crying. Not this again. The student swallows and prepares for her to start ranting. Only she doesn't. Instead, she just asks where he is and if she can drive over and get a coffee with him. He says yes, hangs up, and looks down at the phone, brow furrowed. What she got to say to him this time? A shadow falls over him. Turning, the student just sees two blue eyes. The guy is holding out the borrowed pen, a gentle smile on his face. His mom doesn't come for coffee in the end. Instead, she invites herself over to his house. It's the first time she's visited. As they make their way up all the flights of stairs to his floor, the student holds his breath, waiting for her to start complaining about the cigarette butts, ashtrays, and pizza boxes lining the hallways. But she doesn't. She doesn't say a word. He closes the door to his room behind her, and she lets out a sympathetic little sigh looking around. He probably should have tidied first. Here it comes. He can feel it. She's about to start lecturing him on his dirty clothes, leftover dishes, his unmade bed. But no. She just quietly picks up a sweater and starts folding it. Then another. As she tidies his room, she shoots him a sad little smile. This house really won't do. He explains to her that it's all he can afford at the moment. Well, then let me help you so you can find somewhere better. What's going on here? He doesn't know how to react. This is surely one of her games. Any second she's going to lash out at him. But no. She just gently brushes the dead fly off the windowsill into the trash and turns to him. They stand across the room from each other, the same way they always have, eight feet between them. Plenty of space, not too close. She closes the distance and pulls him in for a tight hug. As his mom buries her head in his chest, he notices for the first time how short she really is. Has she always been that height? Didn't she used to tower over him? Her muffled voice speaks into his chest, right into where his heart is beating. I'm so sorry for how I responded before. I didn't know what to say. You're my son, and I'm proud of you. I always have been. You love who you love. Don't let anyone take that away from you, even your silly old mother. For a long time, the two of them stand there, crying together. It is a busy week moving everything into his new apartment. It's still a pretty basic place, but at least it's his own. The neighbors are quiet, the street is clean, and there are no flies. By the time the student sits down for his lecture, he's completely exhausted. He barely registers the bag landing on the floor next to him and the guy sitting in the seat. He's so tired, in fact, that the conversation catches him off guard. He hadn't prepared anything to say. But suddenly, they're talking. About the weather at first. It's sunnier now. Then about the class. Then why they chose to study here. Then their teenage years. Then their homes and families. The lecture starts, but the two of them keep muttering away to each other in hushed tones. The student cracks a joke, and the guy with blue eyes laughs. Properly laughs. He isn't just being polite. He actually found it funny. So funny that the lecturer tells the pair of them off which just makes them laugh more. Is this what it's like? To be one of the beautiful, happy people? Days go by, and the student wakes up every morning expecting it to be over. He's going to wake up any minute now, and he'll be back in his old house with a talking fly waiting for him by the window. But he doesn't. It's sunny, day after day, week after week, no flies in sight. He calls his mom. He doesn't just pick up the phone to her. He actually starts to call her. He goes to parties, discovers he likes white wine, and finds out what it's like to have a bit too much of it. He has his first kiss and opens his eyes to see a pair of perfect blue ones staring back at him. He makes friends, more friends than he can count. Friends who text him asking to hang out, who help him move house, then move house again, and who fill up rows and rows of seats the day he gets married to the man he loves. The man who loves him back. Is this what it feels like? Is this happiness? Maybe, just maybe, this is it. Until one day, the man wakes up. Everything's perfect. The sun is still shining. He can hear his daughter's squeals from downstairs. His world is still happy. Except for one thing. His ear hurts. Not that much, but there's a little something. A kind of dull itch deep in his ear canal. The other ear starts to hurt as he makes his morning coffee. He should probably go to the doctor about it. He'll book that this week. But by that night, he knows he probably shouldn't wait any longer. He lies awake deep into the night feeling his lungs tightening. You're not supposed to feel your lungs, are you? But it's not just his lungs. It's his throat, too, and his bowels. All of a sudden, his stomach starts convulsing. 
He throws off the sheets and rushes into the bathroom, not quite making it to the toilet. His vomit splatters across the tiles. He must be getting delirious. That can't be right. It looks like his vomit is moving, wriggling, and crawling. His husband appears behind him, switching on the light. The two of them stare in horror at the writhing maggots covering the bathroom floor. The x-rays and MRIs paint a grueling picture. Each progressive scan over the next couple of days looks worse than the last. What had once been healthy flesh and organ tissue steadily has deeper rivets chaotically eaten into it. The maggots work their way through the man's throat, lungs, stomach, sinuses, ears, bowels, and urethra. In some places, they run out of flesh and end up burrowing their way out of the surface of his skin. By the time the maggots mature into flies, the man is on his deathbed. Excessive blood loss, organ failure, and multiple infections have worn his body down to a husk. There's nothing left to be done for him. All that the man's husband, children, mother, and countless friends can do is stand by and watch, as one by one, thousands of flies emerge from the body of the man they'd once loved so dearly. Heartbreaking as it may be, this is the sad reality of what you sign up for when you make a deal with SCP-3063, known informally as The Fly. This SCP on the surface seems like one of the most harmless that the Foundation has encountered, taking the appearance of a common house fly. It has no extraordinary physical properties, nothing apparent to distinguish it from any other fly, and yet, it is one of the most powerful entities with an apparent ability to somehow alter reality itself. It is believed that SCP-3063 only exists in one instance at a time, though this is very difficult to prove given the sheer number of flies that exist around the world. As soon as one instance of SCP-3063 dies, a new one seems to manifest in a random location. Naturally, this makes studying the fly very difficult indeed. As far as the Foundation is aware, the fly communicates with its human target telepathically. It interrogates them, trying to discover what they want most in the world. It will then offer the individual that exact thing. If they refuse, it will make increasingly grand offers, tempting them with greater and greater promises until they accept. When I said this was one of the most powerful known SCPs, I was not exaggerating, because this fly does not make empty promises. Do you want to become a millionaire? You might wake up tomorrow to a number of anonymous bank transfers or a handful of lottery tickets pushed through your letterbox. Do you want to become an opera singer? The next time you sing in the shower, you'll find a whole new voice coming from your chest. Who knows, you may have left the window open and a superstar agent could be strolling by your house at that exact moment. Whatever it is that you tell the fly that you want, it will be granted. The little insect will catch fire and die straight away, appearing somewhere else in the world, ready to start talking to someone else. Your answered wish may not always take the form you expect, but it will be given to you. Just like our student finding love everywhere he went for the next six years. Or, to be more precise, 2,376 days. You see, as soon as you make a deal with this fly, the clock is ticking. For 2,376 days, you will be free to enjoy your dream coming true, no strings attached. Until one day, you wake up with a little bit of discomfort, like something growing inside of you. Eggs, anything from 5,000 to 20,000 in number, will suddenly appear throughout your body. In your digestive system, respiratory system, and even your muscle fibers, small maggots will be born comprising all known to Terra species. They will steadily eat away at your body, feeding their way out of you and growing into regular adult flies as they emerge. Most individuals die from multiple organ failures during this stage. It can often be difficult to identify the exact cause of death as the attack on the body's central systems is so absolute, devastating, and swift. If the individual dies before the 2376th day, then the process is halted and the flies die along with them. Attempts to contain SCP-3063 have all proven unsuccessful. To date, six members of SCP Foundation personnel have been targeted by the fly. Each of them have tried to make a different wish to contain the fly, but each has had a loophole exposed. Senior researcher Elizabeth Gao requested the death of SCP-3063, which the fly interpreted as the death of that manifestation, combusted and returned in another instance. Senior researcher David Roberts asked for the permanent containment of SCP-3063. The fly then stood totally still, allowing itself to be taken into secure containment below Site-63. But sure enough, after 2,376 days, the researcher died and the fly was discovered to still be manifesting around the world it again had interpreted its containment to refer to just that current instance of its body. 
a later researcher requests knowledge of how SCP-3063 functions, at which point the fly combusted and a document containing all known information about SCP-3063, everything I am telling you now, appeared before the researcher, who later died. The penultimate test conducted by SCP personnel proved to be the most chilling. Dr. Patrick McGann asked the fly if it could provide clear, understandable knowledge of SCP-3063 other than knowledge currently possessed by the SCP Foundation. The results of that exact experiment and the next one were provided for him, including details of his own death, which he immediately fulfilled. Either the fly has some precognizant abilities or is able to directly control events in the world, or both. The final experiment was conducted even though the fly had already provided the results in detail ahead of time. Dr. Jonathan Madbury simply asked, is there even a choice, before suffering a severe pulmonary embolism and dying on the way to the hospital. Research indicates that SCP-3063 has been operating for over 4,000 years, with evidence of instances being discovered as far back as early Canaanite settlements. However, many theorize that the fly has been with us a lot longer than that. Unless future containment efforts are more successful, SCP-3063 will likely remain one of the most powerful and prolific entities outside of containment. So next time you see a fly buzzing around your room, it might be in your best interest to leave it alone. These winters are getting worse every year, that's for sure. The old cattle rancher doesn't know if it's the climate changing, God's judgment arriving, or if he's just getting older and struggling to keep up. Probably a strong mix of all of it. Whatever the cause, it doesn't change the facts. It's deathly cold out there. His ailing, elderly Ma's health continues to deteriorate. He hasn't heard from his delivery driver Orhe in days, and on top of it all, his loyal dog Marybelle is out there barking into the darkness of the barn. The rancher heads out to fetch her. He doesn't know what he'd do if she froze. He whistles, but she doesn't look back at him. She just carries on barking up that road into the snowy night. The rancher wades through the snow and peers in the direction she's looking. There's nothing there, girl. Get inside. But Mary Bell keeps barking. She's insisting. He looks again. Is that? The rancher takes off running up the road. All thoughts of cold immediately gone from his mind, he races towards the figure as fast as he can. His frozen fingers fumble at the zipper on his parka. Icy wind stabs the insides of his lungs. Mary Bell shoots off ahead of him. There, he pulls the zipper down and wrestles the thick coat off of his shoulders just as he reaches the tiny figure. He drops to his knees and throws the coat over the shoulders of the little girl standing alone in the snow. Quick as he can, he wraps it tightly around her, pulling the hood up and over her head. He takes her tiny shoulders in his hands and gives her a shake. You okay? Hello? Can you hear me? The girl sways for a moment, then collapses. He catches her, and in one deft motion, scoops her into his arms and takes off back down the road in the direction of his farm. Where the hell had she come from? There are no buildings around here for miles. No one uses that road except Orhe. And in this weather, she couldn't have walked all the way over those mountains. She'd have frozen solid. He bites the finger of a glove and pulls it off. With his bare hand, he clasps one of hers. By the feel of her skin, she pretty much is frozen solid already. He needs to get her warmed up, now. He kicks open the front door and bundles inside with a flurry of snowflakes and an anxious dog at his heels. The fire's not quite dead yet, so he rushes over to the hearth and lays the little girl down next to it. He can barely see her at all wrapped up in his enormous coat. She doesn't seem to be moving. Ma, I'm home. I, I found someone. The rancher grabs two dry logs from the side and throws them onto the fire. He piles kindling high on top of them and blows steadily into the embers at the bottom. They glow and swell in size no taking yet. He blows again for longer, and again, he feels his head starting to swim. A crackle, a lick of flame, it's taken. Panting, he turns back to the bundled up coat on the floor with the child inside. Still no movement. A sickening knot tightens his stomach. What if she's… No, don't let yourself think that. Not yet. He reaches down and gently undoes the zipper on the parka. His trembling fingers push back the hood. She's pale, deathly pale. Her dark brown hair is wet and clings to her scalp. The tips are frozen. At a guess, she must only be nine years old. Eyes closed, lips a sickening blue. But that's not the color that scares him the most. On her neck, there's red. Delicately as he can, the rancher takes the coat off her shoulders and hangs it up by the fire. She's dressed only in a plaid shirt, way too big for her. 
It looks like an adult's shirt, similar to an old one he used to have years ago. But on her neck, her hands, her feet, is that same deep red, layers of blood frozen to her skin. He sits back, his mind blank. He's seen that much blood before. Sure he has. When you work with cattle, it's an unfortunate part of the job. He's seen cows bleed out during childbirth. The girl in front of him? She's the same color as those orphaned calves that lie crying on the floor. A groaning sound fills the room. The rancher looks across at the armchair where his ma sits. She doesn't look at him, doesn't look at the girl on the floor. She just stares into the fire, same way she always does. Ma groans again, trying to express something she doesn't understand, being in a world without living in it. Ma, it's okay. Sorry if I startled you. We have a, um... We have a guest with us. But she just keeps on groaning and staring into the fire. The rancher buries his head in his hands and lets out a deep breath. Only the sound of his breath is joined by another, a tiny breath rattling and rasping through a damaged child's throat, trying its best to keep its host alive. The rancher opens his eyes and stares at the child. She isn't conscious, not by a long shot, but she's breathing, a little at a time. The icicles in her hair have turned into rounded droplets of water that glow by the heat of the fire. He snaps back to his senses. He's not doing her much if she's just lying there soaking wet. He runs off upstairs and grabs some towels and a fresh flannel shirt to wear. After several minutes of drying her off, he's confident enough that he's got most of the water off. There's still a lot of blood caked to her skin, but as far as he can tell, there's no wound anywhere that it could have come from. Brow furrowed, he leaves her under a bundle of blankets and fills up the kettle with water. Hanging it carefully over the fire, he walks over to the cabinet and fishes out a tin of cocoa from the top shelf. Hasn't been used in years, but should still be fine. He would make it with milk, but she's probably dehydrated. Lifting the kettle's lid with the poker, the rancher pours the brown powder inside and waits for it to boil. The little girl's eyes are open now. She's staring into the flames. Her lips are looking a little more pink, her skin a little more blotchy. You're safe here. Just stay by the fire and warm up a bit. You like cocoa? The little girl drags her eyes away from the flames. Her expression is mostly blank. She looks too tired to be confused. I don't know. I think you will. Ma always gave me cocoa. Okay. And with that, the farmhouse falls silent. The little girl stares into the fire. The rancher watches her, finally feeling the wave of exhaustion crashing over him. His ma has fallen asleep in her armchair. Only Marybelle stays awake through the whole night, staying close to the little girl by the fire, occasionally licking her toes to try and warm them up. By the morning, the snow stopped, but the huge drifts remain. As the rancher walks across to the barn, he finds it hard to believe that just a few hours ago, the winds were whipping at his face as hard as they were. The world this morning is totally still. What the rancher finds even harder to believe is that there's a little girl in his house right now, fast asleep by the fire. He checked her forehead when he woke up this morning, and she miraculously hadn't caught a fever. She couldn't have been out in that weather for too long, but it only made the question more mysterious. Where did she come from? Mary Bell didn't get up this morning. From all of the excitement last night, she must have been too tired for today. Walking through the crisp morning air, he can't really blame her. He shoulders the barn door open. A column of steam curls out of the opening. All of that warmth, humidity, and cattle smell is strangely comforting this morning. But as the rancher goes around checking on all the cows inside, he very quickly discovers a problem. They're thin. Way too thin. Some of them look to be on the verge of starvation. He'd missed it last night as he drove them down in the dark, but in the warm glow of the barn's lights, it's unmistakable. These cows haven't been eating properly. He pours out several sacks of grain for them into the troughs, and they all gather around hungrily, filling both their stomachs as fast as they can. The rancher leans on the railing for a moment, confused. Even in this cold, there was still plenty of green grass for them up on the ridge. That's why he'd taken them up there. They should have had no trouble eating until the snow came in last night. He doesn't like this one bit. Last time Orhe had driven down and collected some of the meat, he'd had a few questions about the quantity being smaller than usual. Were the cows sick at all? Not that the rancher could tell. But now, looking at them, it's clear as day. Something's up. You hungry? The little girl nods. They sit across the table from one another, eating homemade bread and soup. Ma stays over by the fire. Mary Bell slowly wanders over to the kitchenette and flops down on the floor, exhausted. Where are you from? The girl shrugs her shoulders. You know how you got out here? Remember anything from last night? The little girl just eats her soup and shakes her head. She doesn't look particularly scared or worried. 
just a little confused. Where are your parents? Do you have parents? Again, the little girl shrugs. The rancher sits back and folds his arms. He's tried to call into town, but his phone line's gone out in the blizzard. Not much to be done until the snow clears. He's got a good relationship with the police around here. If he explains the situation, then it'll all be okay. What do you know? Can you remember anything from last night? It was dark. The girl slurps her soup. I was hungry. So hungry. Then I saw the light and I went towards that. My car? No. Well, yes, later on it was your car, but before it wasn't. What was the light then? Where were you? I don't know. It was just... the light. Now he's even more confused, but try as he might, the rancher can't figure any of it out, and try as she might, the little girl can't remember anything more precise than that. The pair of them hop into the car and drive back out up the road that afternoon. The snow is piled so high that the rancher is having to get out twice as often as he did the previous night to clear a track for them. He isn't actually sure what he's brought her out here looking for. Clues, maybe? He almost laughs at himself at the thought, but that's probably the best word for it. If he can figure out how she got here, then he can work on understanding who she is and how to get her home. There's the damage to the phone line. One of the masts has collapsed, sagging heavily on the lines. That's not something he can fix on his own. No, sir. Looks like he'll have to wait for the snow to melt before making any phone calls again. That could be in one week. That could be in three months. He glances at the child sitting in the passenger seat. She's just staring out of the window in amazement, wrapped up in as many layers as he could put on her. They may be stuck together for a while. A lurch. The pickup plunges dangerously to the left. The rancher slams on the brakes and it comes to a stop just in time. A large chunk of snow in front of them comes loose and slips off the side of the road. It tumbles down into a gully that he hadn't even spotted. With all this snow on the ground, he has no frame of reference. Everything is just white. Stay here. The rancher opens the door and climbs out. He wishes Marybelle was with him, but she'd wanted to stay home again. Poor dog. She must really be going through it if she wasn't even up for a ride in the pickup. Carefully as he can, testing every step before making it, the rancher creeps over to the edge of the gully. It's bigger than he thought, much bigger. It continues down, more and more sharply for a few hundred feet, all the way down into a... Oh no. There's a semi down there, a big rig, warped and bent, lying on the rocks. Just a glance is enough to tell the rancher it's Orges, but he just keeps staring at it in disbelief. Can't be. It... But it is. Stay in the car. The rancher reaches past the little girl and into the back seat. Grabbing a pair of crampons and some rope, he straightens up and looks at the girl. She knows it's serious. He can see the concern on her face. Stay in the car, he repeats. By the time the rancher makes it down to the truck, his legs and back are killing him. All this work over the last 24 hours is going to start taking its toll sooner or later, but some things have to be done. He pauses by the semi. It's on its side. He'll have to climb up onto it and try to open the door. Some things have to be done. He hoists himself up and manages to clamber onto the metal door. It's badly crumpled, and the window is smashed in. He doesn't fancy his chances of being able to get it open. One look through the window shows him that he won't want to do that anyway. Blood coats every inch of the inside of Orge's truck. The cabin that the rancher is so used to seeing and sitting in is almost unrecognizable. Smashed glass is sprinkled across every surface with a dark brownish red layer of gore frozen into everything else. There, in the midst of it all, still wearing a seatbelt, is Orge's body. It dangles like a limp carcass at a butcher shop, like the cows he hangs in the slaughterhouse. And like those cows, a large chunk of Orge is missing. His fat stomach is gone, not just cut open, but gone. The tops of his thighs, too, and much of his chest. So much of him is just missing. Open arteries and lifeless nerves dangle in place. That must have been a hell of a crash. The rancher reaches over and pulls Orge's cap down over his eyes. Not much else to be done right now. No way he can clean this mess up by himself. But as the rancher climbs up the valley, his mind starts to connect some dots. Dots that leave a sick feeling in his stomach. He's seen that much blood somewhere else, or rather, on someone else, just last night. He slams the door to the pickup shut and starts to drive back down the track. Since the snow stopped, all of the drifts that he'd cleared earlier remain clear. It's only a few minutes' drive back down to the farm. He doesn't say a word the whole way, and neither does the little girl. She clearly senses something's up. The sick feeling in his stomach remains. He pulls up the handbrake, and the two of them sit in silence outside the farmhouse. 
There's a truck in that valley. Did you know that? Yes. Is that where you came from last night? I don't remember. Was he... The rancher stops. Jorge didn't have any kids. What were you doing in this truck? I don't know. Did he... Was he... The rancher can't bring himself to accuse his best friend of the words that almost left his mouth. Do you think you might not remember because something bad happened to you? I don't know. The rancher closes his eyes for a long moment. Silence fills the pickup. Come on, let's get inside. But inside wasn't the safe haven he'd been hoping for. Ma's been throwing up, not just once but a few times. She's distressed, groaning aimlessly for someone to come and save her. Marybelle is pacing around the room, yelping and whining. The rancher immediately goes upstairs to get some rags to clean up with. Perfect timing, as usual. But he stops in his tracks when he comes back down. His ma has stopped moaning. The little girl is kneeling by the armchair, holding the old lady's hand. The room is calm. The little girl gently places the frail hand back on the armrest and comes over to take the rags from the rancher. Returning to the old lady, the girl goes about mopping her up as best she can. Marybell slumps back down on the floor. And that is how the four of them exist for the next few days. Ma gets sicker steadily, but the little girl stays by her side all day long, caring for her in every way. The rancher's glad of that. It gives him the time he needs to help his cows outside. None of them are in a good shape. Whatever it is, they're still getting thinner. He feeds them all the grain they'd normally need, and then some, and they always finish it off. Yet none of them are getting any fatter. The rancher leans on the railing, trusty dog by his side. His energy is starting to really lag behind what he needs. The last couple of days, even though he hasn't done all that much, have totally taken it out of him. How do you think it is, Mary Bell? He looks down at his little friend. She's looking thinner too, actually. But she's been eating just fine. It hits him. Tapeworms. As soon as the word comes into his head, it makes total sense. His cows, his entire herd by the looks of things, have been riddled with tapeworms. Ah, oh, hell. He hasn't got anywhere near the amount of medicine needed to give some to all of them. Even if he did, a lot of them are looking pretty far gone. The chance of reinfection would be high. He needs supplies. He needs Orhe. Marybell whines softly next to him. He knows what they have to do. Laying Marybell down carefully by the fire, the rancher administers the tapeworm medicine. For a few hours, they lie there together. He strokes her side, waiting for her to pass it. The little girl watches over his shoulder. His ma sits back in her chair, mumbling to herself. He hasn't talked to the little girl anymore about Orhe yet. He isn't sure what there is to say. Maybe he should ask if Orhe was sick. After all, the cows clearly have had these tapeworms since before the other night. Orhe may have picked up contaminated meat from him last time he came. Maybe... Marybelle passes the worm on the rug. Ugh, the smell. The rancher uses the tongs next to the fire to pick the worm up. It's long and pale. And dead. He tosses it into the fire and puts the tongs in the flames for a bit to sterilize them. The worm sizzles and pops in the flames. The sound makes his stomach crawl. The rancher glances around and sees the little girl staring at the tapeworm. He looks past the girl to his ma sitting in the chair. Her turn next. But as that night and the following morning reveal, it's too late. His ma's groans turn into cries of pain. She openly sobs by the fire, clutching at her stomach. Every time the rancher tries to give her the medicine, she just vomits it back up. Each time she vomits, there's more and more blood mixed in. The little girl gets more and more upset. It's not fair on her to have to witness something this traumatic and disgusting. But there's nowhere else for her to go. She shouldn't even be here at all. The fact that she is means she has to help. That's all there is to it. By sunrise, his ma has passed away. There is nasty red bruising all across her abdomen, which tells him she must have bled out internally from this worm. He'd been too late to realize what was wrong. Too late with the cows, and too late with his ma. He covers his ma with a blanket, and tells the little girl not to go and wash her hands. He needs to check on the cattle. Sure enough, during the night, a handful of them died too. The calves. They were the ones to go first whenever something like this happened. Mother cows stood over their calves, licking their heads, willing them to wake up. The rancher drags each body out to the back and burns them. He can't risk any more contamination. As the carcasses burn, he allows himself to cry. But when the rancher comes back into the house, it's full of noise, a noise that takes his brain a long time to comprehend. Crying, but not his own, not the little girl either. No, it was a new sound. It was a baby, a newborn child screaming at the top of its lungs. 
The rancher can't believe what he's looking at. The little girl is sitting at the hearth with Marybelle at her feet. In her arms, drenched in blood, is a baby. The girl looks up at him and smiles sweetly. It's a boy. Then, she turns around to his ma's body under the blanket. A sickening red patch soaks through the fabric, right over where her stomach would be. What the hell happened here? I've got a little brother. Securing and containing SCP-1003 has proven… challenging. This is largely because the tapeworm that causes all of this damage is virtually indistinguishable from Echinococcus granulosus, the common variety of tapeworm that causes hydatid disease. The tapeworm, designated SCP-1003-1, follows the same life cycle as other regular worms. Its eggs come into contact with an animal through contaminated meat, saliva, or unclean surfaces and are ingested. Once inside the gut, they grow and latch onto the inside of the digestive tract, where they feed on the nutrients of the food traveling past them, steadily growing bigger and stronger. Once mature, they lay eggs, which pass out in the animal's excrement to continue the process. Infections spread quickly, particularly in unsanitary conditions amongst livestock, and can often be difficult to contain, as by the time the symptoms – nausea, weight loss, fever – start to manifest in the infected, the worms have likely already reproduced and have a new generation growing in the guts of other animals. As far as the Foundation is aware, SCP-1003 follows this normal pattern in all observed animals except humans. When a human ingests an egg from this tapeworm, a very different creature starts to grow in their gut. Human embryos, with the same genetic code as the tapeworm, begin to form. The rate of their growth is greatly accelerated, however. By just eight weeks, they are as mature as the typical three-week-old neonate or newborn child, although similar in size to an eight-week-old embryo at 13 to 16 centimeters. Many eggs usually enter this fertilization period, but almost all of them die before having a chance to develop much beyond the early stages. They stand the best chance of survival when buried in the hepatic tissue, where they can absorb plenty of nutrients from their host. The host at this point usually starts to experience mild symptoms, lethargy, the occasional stomach cramp, nothing particularly severe, yet. The embryos that survive soon develop rows of temporary, razor-sharp teeth. At this point, passively absorbing nutrients is no longer enough for them. They bury their teeth into the soft tissue surrounding them and begin to eat. Once they enter this stage, their rate of growth increases exponentially the more flesh they consume. Eventually burrowing out into the world, the tapeworm child is born drenched in blood. The size and apparent age of the child that emerges from the corpse are determined by the size of the person they consume. For example, the child eating its way out of the rancher's maw appeared to be only a ten-month-old child, as there was very little of the frail old woman for it to eat. By contrast, the little girl who emerged from Orhe's gut had plenty of fat to feast on and so was able to grow to the size of a nine-year-old. Once the child emerges, the teeth that they'd used to eat their way out quickly become loose and are replaced by regular human teeth. The children themselves have no memory at all of where they've come from or what they are. They have the same motor and linguistic skills that a regular child would possess at their age. Nothing, aside from their DNA, marks them out as being any different from the children around them, blissfully ignorant, just like the children around them. It is theorized that many of these children end up in orphanages. With no birth certificates or identifiable parents, they fall through the gaps in the system, quickly lost to the world. The only way to really track them at all is to follow the infections they cause. You see, these tapeworm children have one final curse they must live with. Their bodily fluids, their saliva, and sweat contain the same tapeworm protoscolex that will develop into SCP-1003-1 as soon as it is ingested by another creature, making the cycle start all over again. If you want to track down a tapeworm child, and I highly advise that you don't, all you have to do is follow the trail of nasty stomach infections, internal bleeding, and freak pregnancies amongst the outcasts of society. It, unfortunately, will not take long. There are currently ten instances of SCP-1003-2 in containment. The children live in Bioresearch Area 13 under strict supervision. Researchers are only permitted to enter their cells whilst wearing full-body biohazard suits, but first must have level 4 security clearance and must have written permission and can only enter with specific research goals agreed upon. All staff are regularly tested for the presence of any kind of tapeworms in their system. No other animals are permitted in this facility. A wasp stings a cockroach in the brain, rendering it a mindless zombie that she can lead to her home and fill with eggs that will hatch and devour the insect from the inside. A snail accidentally eats the eggs of a flatworm, 
and the eggs hatch, filling the snail's eye stalks with sacs of wriggling larvae. They mimic the movements of caterpillars, attracting hapless birds and enticing them to swoop down, attack, eat, and continue the life cycle of the worms. The spores of the cordyceps fungus make their way inside of a doomed ant, taking over its nervous system, puppeteering its body, and forcing it to march to the nearest highest point, only to die and split open, fungus blooming from its corpse and spreading spores to the next victim. Underwater, the sea louse settles into its new home inside of the fish's mouth, feeding on blood from the tongue until it withers away. There, the louse attaches itself in the tongue's place, serving as a mimic of the original organ, while the fish is none the wiser. Back on land, humans are not exempt. Nematode worm larvae infect the bloodstream through fly bites, hiding undetected until their host feels them wriggling beneath the cornea. Guinea worms enter the system when a person drinks infested water, growing longer and longer, then forcing their way out through the foot. Nature is full of terrifying parasitic creatures, but far scarier than the parasites we know about are the parasites that we haven't discovered yet. The creatures sneaking in and burrowing under the skin of their hosts without anyone even knowing they exist. After all, if you don't know something is there, how can you possibly hope to protect yourself from it? As a man hikes through the woods of the Pacific Northwest, he's thinking about repelling mosquitoes and pulling up his socks to stop ticks from latching onto his flesh, but he has no idea what else is lurking out here in the wild with him. He knows to look out for mountain lions and bears, to watch for signs of rabid animals, and avoid being bitten or scratched. But he doesn't notice the tiny, almost invisible flecks drifting through the air around him. He doesn't notice when one happens to get caught on the breeze of his inhale, pulled into his nostril. He rubs at his nose idly, sniffing to clear his airways, then turns his attention to a bird nesting in a nearby tree. All the while, something is taking root right under his nose. Well, actually, inside of it. But he doesn't feel a thing other than the occasional urge to sneeze. He does, sneezing loud enough to startle the bird he was observing moments ago, but it doesn't do any good. Sneezes are for clearing out dust and debris, foreign objects that wind up in the nose by happenstance. This new intruder is there by design, and it is holding on tight. The hiker continues the rest of his walk without a care in the world, taking deep breaths of fresh forest air and relishing the feeling of the breeze on his face. By the time he gets back home, he's made it out of the woods without a single mosquito bite, with nary a tick to be found in his meticulous pre-shower check. That night, he sleeps soundly, and the next morning as he goes back to work at his office job, all thoughts of the wilderness slowly drift from his mind. He goes about his ordinary routine for months, all the while carrying a hidden passenger with him from place to place, a tiny little thing steadily growing larger and larger, spreading spindly appendages out and up, through the nasal passages, up toward the skull. One night, about six months after that fateful hike, the man is sleeping peacefully in his bed, dreaming of a sunlit forest clearing and the pleasant chirping of birds, when all of a sudden, he's jerked awake by a splitting pain in his head. His vision swims from the throbbing pain, and he clutches his face, pressing against his forehead. It must be a migraine, he thinks. He hasn't had one in quite some time, but this is clearly no ordinary headache. Eventually, the pain subsides, and he's able to drift back to sleep. But the next day, at the office, it returns. That same sharp pain radiating through his skull, like the worst sinus headache he has ever had. The persistent feeling of pain and pressure in his head becomes too much to bear, and he decides to take the rest of the day off of work and go to the doctor. Much to the man's relief, his doctor is not concerned. With no other troubling symptoms presenting themselves, the situation seems relatively straightforward. She writes a prescription for some migraine medication, then sends the man on his way. That night, when the headache returns, the man takes some of the medicine, and the cloud of pain clears. Sweet relief. Once again, things are good. For a couple months, at least. But then, one day, on his morning walk to the office, just as he's lifting his travel mug of coffee to his lips, his vision cuts out. It's as if something is blocking his eyes, as if someone were covering them and preventing him from seeing directly ahead. But when he lifts his hand to feel his face, there's nothing there. Panicking at the sudden loss of sight, he drops his cup, spilling coffee all over the sidewalk. He doesn't even notice the spill, too busy grasping at his face and feeling his eyes with his fingers. He fumbles in his pocket for his phone, hoping he can remember where the numbers on the screen are well enough to call 911. 
but his hands are shaking so hard that he drops the phone, hearing it clatter on the pavement. He exclaims in frustration and fear and turns around following the sound of the phone. And as he turns, his vision suddenly clears, the blinders lifted, and he's able to see just as well as he did before. Experimentally, he turns back to face his original direction, and again, he loses his sight, something blocking his view. He turns around, and he can see again. He tries this a few more times, spinning back and forth, back and forth, watching his vision flicker in and out. He only stops when a passing jogger shouts at him, asking what the hell he's doing. The interruption startles him, bringing him back to Earth. What is happening? Surely this can't be normal. What is it about facing one direction that causes him to lose his sight, while another direction returns him to normal? A sinking feeling in his stomach tells him that, whatever was causing his headaches before, it was not something he should ignore any longer. He grabs his phone off the ground, calls out of work, and schedules an urgent appointment with his doctor. At first, he considers running home and getting his car or his bicycle, but his unreliable vision would make taking either mode of transportation a potentially deadly mistake. So instead, he walks. The walk to the doctor's office is the most difficult walk of the man's life. Every time he turns a corner, he wonders if his vision will flicker out again, if the mysterious obstacle will block his sight and force him to reroute himself or start from scratch. While trying to maintain a consistent line of sight, he loses his balance several times and nearly collides with the lamppost. Eventually, he reaches the doctor's office. One look at the man's terrified face is enough for the doctor to insist on some immediate x-rays of his head. The man sits on the examination table, nervously bouncing his knee, waiting for the doctor to return with the results. What could it be? Some undiagnosed degenerative illness? A tumor? Irreparable damage caused by looking at a solar eclipse as a child? The man can hear the doctor speaking to a nurse in hushed, frightened tones just outside of the exam room door. He can't quite tell what she is saying, but he makes out one word that makes his blood run cold. Infestation. When the door opens and the doctor enters holding the man's chart, her expression is neutral and professional, but her face is pale, her forehead dotted with sweat. She can't hide the fact that whatever she saw on that x-ray, it horrified her. What is it? He asks, though he isn't sure he wants to hear the answer. The doctor is silent for a moment, turning over the right words to say in her mind. After a seemingly endless pause, she pulls an x-ray from the stack of papers on her clipboard and pins it up for them both to see. There the man can see his skull, a white outline against the dark background, his skeleton on display. But inside of the skull, there's a mass that definitely shouldn't be there. It starts in his nose, a rounded shape, but it stretches out in long limbs that travel up into his brain. After a long pause, the doctor speaks. I've never seen anything quite like this before. At first, I thought it might be some sort of growth, but as I reviewed the scans, I realized that it showed signs of movement. Whatever is in there, I'm afraid that it's alive. The man's stomach turns, and he worries for a moment that he might be sick all over the clean white floor. Instead, he just asks the doctor what can be done to help him. She explains that she plans to give him a local anesthetic, then attempt to get a closer look at the situation. Once she has eyes on the parasite, she will see if she can surgically remove it without causing any additional damage to his brain tissue. All the man can think about is that thing inside of his skull and how badly he wants it gone by any means necessary. He immediately agrees, and after a few quick injections, he's lying on his back, staring up at the ceiling as the doctor performs a nasal endoscopy. She slides the tube up his nostril a little bit at a time, monitoring the image on a nearby screen. Suddenly, she freezes, a small gasp escaping her lips. He demands to know what she's seeing, and she stammers, saying only that it's a creature she's never seen before, but it looks quite a bit like a sea spider. The man's eyes widen, and he's about to say something else, when suddenly his vision goes dark again. Now he knows what that means, and the doctor's startled cry confirms it. The creature is moving. The man begins shaking, begging the doctor to get it out of him, to just grab the invader with some tweezers or whatever it is doctors do in this situation and get it out of his head. She grabs a pair of nasal forceps and slowly eases them into his nose, but the creature feels her coming and lurches upward away from her grasp. The man feels a sudden burst of pain, and then everything goes dark as he loses consciousness, his eyes fluttering shut. The doctor checks his pulse, checks his breathing, and attempts to rouse her patient, but he's out cold. 
As she examines him, she notices a fluttering motion beneath his right eyelid. At first, she thinks she imagines it and takes a closer look. The flutter turns into a distinct, undeniable bulge beneath the eyelid, and then a slender limb pokes out from beneath the thin veil of flesh. It curves under the eyelid, tugging it open to reveal the unfocused eyeball beneath and something else. Something moving, pushing the eyeball aside just slightly without knocking it from the socket. The doctor watches in open-mouthed horror as more long, thin appendages join the first, poking out from behind the eye toward the air. The many-legged creature pulls itself from the ocular cavity and begins scuttling down her patient's face over his neck and off the edge of the exam table and onto the floor. As it nears the door, the doctor regains her ability to move and rushes to try and catch the thing. She grabs a jar and the forceps, hoping to capture it without touching it. Even with gloves on, she shudders at the thought of touching the thing. It evades her grasp, darting away from her forceps. It scrabbles back toward the table, and in a moment of primal instinct and revulsion, the doctor brings her foot up and stomps on the little parasite with all of her strength. When she lifts her shoe, all that's left on the ground is a few spindly legs and a small brown stain. She curses herself for acting impulsively and not finding a way to trap the thing and keep it for observation, but that ship has sailed. The only thing she can do now is tend to her patient and monitor his well-being. As she approaches the man on the table, his eyes open, and he gasps, sitting up suddenly and gripping his head. The man awakes with a headache and a foggy feeling in his head, but also with a sense of relief, a feeling that the unwelcome presence that took up residence in his skull for so many months is thankfully gone. He asks the doctor, haltingly struggling to find his words, if she was able to remove the creature. She tells him, simply, that it is gone now. The man slowly climbs off of the table, and ignoring the protests from the doctor as she begs him to sit back down and let her examine him, he walks out of the office and heads back home. Over the next several weeks, the man returns to normal life. He feels a little bit different, a little hazier, a little slower to respond. He tires more easily, going to bed earlier and sleeping in later, but overall, he feels nothing but relief. Still, that night, when he tries to fall asleep, he thinks of those x-rays. He imagines what that creature might have looked like when the doctor got it out, how it might have moved. He wonders where it came from, or if it will come back. He never goes hiking in those particular woods again. Meanwhile, the doctor receives an influx of patients complaining of persistent headaches. Sometimes it's a sinus infection, sometimes it's a hormone imbalance, sometimes it's stress. But a few times, well, she knows what to look for now. She tells her patients to watch out for changes in vision, for a feeling of pressure in their skull. She learns how to keep a straight face when looking at their x-rays and seeing that familiar long-limbed shape burrow deep in their nasal cavities. She puts her patients under now when she tries to remove the creatures. It doesn't make much of a difference, but it saves them the terror of the truth, saves them the feeling of the creature thrashing inside their head until it knocks them out. She manages to collect a few specimens for study and contacts her friend at the Centers for Disease Control. He's never seen or heard of anything like these parasites either, but he does know someone who might be able to offer their expertise. When the doctor comes into work the next day, there are two strangers waiting in her office. They introduce themselves as employees of a specialized research foundation and ask to see her samples. The next thing she knows, the doctor is waking up in bed the following morning, and she has no memory of ever seeing a patient with a strange spidery parasite in their skull. If she remembered enough to look for the records, she would find that they had disappeared from her office, along with the living specimens she had collected. But she doesn't remember, and her discovery is now in the hands of the SCP Foundation, who have given it an official designation, SCP-1104. SCP-1104, commonly nicknamed nose crabs, is a species of organism tentatively identified as a member of the order Chelicerata, which includes sea spiders and horseshoe crabs. The life cycle of the organism consists of at least two phases. The first of these is a larval stage, at which point the creature is approximately 0.4 millimeters in diameter. At irregular intervals, SCP-1104 larvae are expelled from tubes at a concentration of up to 200 per cubic meter. These larvae drift through the air for as long as 14 hours at a time and have been spotted traveling for several kilometers under the right weather conditions. Whenever an SCP-1104 larva is inhaled, it will attach to the nasal mucosa of its host and begin to excrete H1 receptor antagonists that suppress inflammation as well as the implantation of any further larvae. 
Over the next six to eight months, SCP-1104 will grow larger, extending appendages through the ethmoidal canals of the host. Aside from occasional persistent headaches, the host will likely not notice the presence of SCP-1104 during this period. Once the organism has matured, however, it will begin to apply pressure to its host's optic nerves, causing its central visual field to be obstructed. SCP-1104 will apply this pressure selectively whenever the host is not oriented toward the gradient of atmospheric hydrogen sulfide. SCP-1104 can detect this hydrogen sulfide through its host's nasal respiration. At first, this effect is distressing to the host, but after a little while, they will begin to adjust their behavior accordingly, showing a preference for facing and moving in directions that do not cause those visual disturbances. Without realizing it, the host is moving closer and closer to higher concentrations of hydrogen sulfide. Once the host reaches an area with sufficient hydrogen sulfide concentration, SCP-1104 will extend its appendages into the host's prefrontal cortex, causing the host to lose consciousness. While the host is passed out, SCP-1104 will exit through their ocular cavity. Once SCP-1104 has left its host, it will attempt to find and enter the source of the hydrogen sulfide. This can include, but is not limited to, a lava tube or a sewer pipe. Whatever it does next is currently unknown, as its subterranean behavior and development has not been documented. Humans show the same instinctive aversion to SCP-1104's visual disturbances as other animal hosts, but they are also able to defy this influence. They are especially able to avoid following SCP-1104's prompting if they are informed of the nature of the infestation. Any attempt to surgically remove or poison a fully developed SCP-1104 will trigger its exit response, and it will flee through the host's ocular cavity and scuttle away. Following SCP-1104's exit, the former host displays a lack of spontaneous response to external stimulus, with delayed reactions as well as changes to personality linked to orbital frontal lesions. While individual instances of SCP-1104 are relatively easy to destroy, the species as a whole is considered endemic to certain subsurface geological formations. As it currently stands, the general population of SCP-1104 cannot be reached by convenient means of extermination. An area 10 meters in diameter, thought to contain the majority of SCP-1104, has been blocked off from the public under the guise of conservation and designated Site-104. Any non-Foundation personnel mammalian organisms larger than 10 kilograms found in the area should be considered contaminated and promptly incinerated on site. Once the SCP Foundation has discovered a way to effectively exterminate SCP-1104, doing so has been strongly endorsed by the O5 Council. However, such a method has not yet been discovered. So for now, SCP-1104 continues thriving underground, spouting larvae into the air to crawl up the noses of unsuspecting deer, possums, squirrels, and humans. So if you go out walking and feel a little tickle in your nose, it might just be a bit of extra pollen in the air. Or it might be a tiny nose crab, burrowing itself into your mucosal tissue, growing just a little bigger every day until it reaches your brain. But like I said, maybe it's nothing. No need to get crabby about it. The flashlight beam casts demonic shadows that twist and shift with the trembling of his hands. It makes the feeling worse, seeing those shadows twitch against the walls like they're somehow alive. But shadows can't be alive, can they? Another noise, a creak that sounds distinctly like the weight of someone's soul against the floorboard. Now the man knows he hasn't been imagining it. The beam of light sweeps over the room towards the source of the noise. To reveal the source of his torment is… nothing. There's nothing there. And yet every feeling, every instinct tells him that his eyes are wrong. Listen closer. Someone's here. And yet, there's no one. Not a soul. The man sighs. He swears he thought someone had gotten inside. He decides to double check, creating more dancing, unsettling shadows with his flashlight as he scans the rest of the living room. Nothing again. Then the kitchen. Still nothing. Back upstairs to the landing. Nobody but him. And in the bedroom? He's alone again, but he doesn't feel alone. In fact, he feels the opposite, the undeniable presence of someone else there, or something else. He switches the flashlight back off and stays still. There's no point in trying to sleep now. The uncertainty of it all is bound to keep him awake. So he stands there, surrounded by the dark and the silence, just waiting for the next sign. 
another creak, breathing, a footstep, anything. Even in the dark, it's like he can feel the eyes on him. The back of his neck bristles, hair standing to attention like a breath passing over his skin. What if it is? What if it's right there, right behind him? The flashlight is back on in a second as he turns around. The light illuminates the space behind him, and there's still nothing there. But despite finding no sign of anyone else in the apartment, despite knowing for certain he's alone, the man doesn't feel alone. It feels like there's someone watching. In fact, it's always felt like there's someone watching. Has this ever happened to you? Of course it has. Most of us, if not all of us, have at one point or another experienced that same sinister sensation. You hear something move, only to see nothing out of place. What sounds like a footstep turns out to be just the foundations of your house settling. And all the while, you can't escape that uncanny and unnerving feeling that somebody's watching you. Could they be across the street, peering in through your window? Or maybe, just maybe, they're inside, right behind you, hiding in the only place you would never look. You might write this off as just paranoia, a primal, self-preserving instinct passed down from our earliest ancestors, going haywire as it keeps a lookout for imminent threats when there are none. But it's not that, not at all. It's both out there and in your head all around, nearly wherever you go. And it's always watching. They call it causal absent paranoia. At least, that's the official term. If you ever find yourself looking up the definition, then you'll most likely wind up reading words to this effect. The healthy brain overreacting to natural stimulus due to overindulgence, excessive stress, lack of sleep, and other such strains to the mind and body. But that's just the definition that the SCP Foundation wants you to know and it's not hard to see why. After all, it removes that unsettling sense of mystery, the unknown factor of it all. Chalking it up to stress or overactive imagination, it reminds you not to worry and that it's all just your mind playing tricks on you. But it isn't. Your brain is working fine and is, in fact, warning you of danger. And that danger is SCP-3010. The Foundation's research has uncovered that the feeling of being watched stems from something very, very real, an undetectable entity that they have designated SCP-3010-1. You might be better acquainted with it as that brief dash of movement out of the corner of your eye or the noises you can't explain. In other words, the things that go bump in the night. But if you ever get that feeling, like someone else is staring at you, observing you against your will, then that's your best indicator. You're not alone. It's in the room with you. And it's watching. Always watching. It doesn't happen every time. None of us are going around constantly feeling like some unseen entity is watching us. At least, the lucky ones aren't. While manifestations of the entity are somewhat random and inconsistent, the SCP Foundation has determined that certain requirements can first be met in order to deliberately cause SCP-3010-1 to successfully manifest. These specifics relate to the space that a person is currently inhabiting. For starters, anything too small won't work. So that's any tight or cramped spaces, single rooms, or sterile environments that are shut off from the outside world, like hospitals or prisons. Foundation containment cells also fall into this latter category. But anything bigger, particularly in houses or living spaces comprised of at least 500 square meters in terms of floor space, are prime real estate for the entity, SCP-3010-1, especially if the lights are turned down low, if not switched off completely, and if there's only one living person present inside. Now, if you were expecting that the moment you're next home alone, that you could just turn out the lights and summon SCP-3010-1, then you'd be wrong. At any rate, we wouldn't recommend trying it. Little is known about the entity itself. It has hardly anything in the way of physical traits that the Foundation knows about. In terms of where it first came from, why it depends on stalking and observing humans, or even what it wants, there are no answers. The Foundation has, however, learned the following things about SCP-3010-1. For one, it is totally imperceptible. It can't be observed at all not in any perceivable wavelength of light. So put down the thermals and night vision goggles or the UV light, the only surefire way to tell, or rather, guess, where it is at any given time, 
is after any kind of reactive incident with the entity. Secondly, the Foundation has noticed that SCP-3010-1 interacts differently with human beings who display the symptoms of avoidant disorders. This can include those suffering from social anxiety or inhibition or who are typically withdrawn. Around a full half of people with these avoidant disorders will not react to scenarios wherein the entity manifests. In short, the reactive events caused by SCP-3010-1 often don't affect those with avoidant disorders, or at least 50% of those people. However, the half that the entity can interact with often feels the effects of SCP-3010 with a lot more intensity. The unnerving feeling of being watched becomes full-blown inescapable paranoia. As for what exactly SCP-3010-1 looks like, the Foundation is at a loss. Given the entity can't be perceived, it makes getting a witness sketch or a mugshot somewhat tricky. However, there is one thing that the SCP Foundation knows for sure. It does have the limitations of a physical form. This isn't an incorporeal, ethereal ghost that can phase through walls and other solid objects. SCP-3010-1 has a physical presence, and it seems to have an awareness of this. It's for that reason it won't manifest in smaller spaces like single-occupant rooms or particular places with no windows or doors like Foundation containment cells. By avoiding these places, it can't be trapped. SCP-3010-1 remains passively hostile toward human beings, and it will only directly engage a subject when a certain number of set triggers are met. Those that inadvertently cause this to happen find themselves receiving a particularly grim fate. Those who actively seek out or attempt to hunt the entity, especially with the intent to destroy it, are more likely to cause SCP-3010-1 to manifest. Sometimes it's worth trying to ignore the ominous sound of creaking coming from deep within your house rather than going looking for what made it. Anyone spending a prolonged period of time around mirrors is also likely to trigger a manifestation. The same can be said for those in unlit or dimly lit rooms, along with those who endure a long period of isolated, continuous silence or make any attempt to call anyone else for help. With enough of these factors met, enough space, a lack of lighting, and no more or less than one person in a room or house, SCP-3010-1 will manifest and trigger what is known as a reactive event. This can be achieved by doing anything that increases the adrenaline levels of an isolated person, from creepy noises to the instinctive sensation that comes from being directly watched. Those few who have managed to survive their encounters with the entity have described the symptoms of SCP-3010 coming from behind. They will experience the observation or presence of another being coming from directly behind them. Should they find themselves backed against a wall, they will feel compelled to avoid the nearest window or dark corner. Mirrors are also a cause of major aversion for these victims, often causing those experiencing causal absent paranoia to flee to other rooms without any reflective surfaces present. Anyone currently undergoing the effects of SCP-3010 additionally will not be able to just sleep it off either. The symptoms caused by the impending presence of the entity directly inhibit a person's ability to fall asleep. Not just out of fear, but due to a fundamental function of SCP-3010-1. The entity can manipulate the areas of the human brain that are responsible for the production of melatonin, the induction of sleep states, and the regulation of dreams. The SCP Foundation has discovered this disruption to sleep is caused by a gaseous substance that is dispersed into the local atmosphere. In order to avoid detection by the public, this phenomenon has also been given a medical classification, causal absent paranoia-induced insomnia. Being unable to sleep or escape the feelings of being watched the observed victim will inevitably panic. This is what prompts the reactive event. Usually SCP-3010-1 will manifest through mirrors or windows. Upon manifestation, the entity then proceeds to kill its target. It extracts some vital material from their body, then sucks what is left of them into the breach that it emerged from. When a reactive event has been triggered, SCP-3010-1 deploys a cognitohazardous effect as well. This total memory erasure acts in the way you might expect. Any memories of the targeted person involved in an SCP-3010-1 manifestation will be quickly destroyed. Anyone who might remember them, might think to check on them if they've been missing for a time, will cease to have any recollection of said person. 
Once the entity has them, it's as if they no longer exist. Of course, this total memory erasure can be circumvented with enough written evidence of a person's existence kept at all times, or with a number of Scranton reality anchors active in the nearby area. Once it has successfully manifested, retrieved a target, and dispatched them, some Foundation researchers believe that SCP-3010-1 enters into a state of stasis. This is known to attract reflective surfaces in the surrounding area, making mirrors or windows appear opaque. Symptoms associated with SCP-3010 are also experienced by any and all human beings within a certain radius of the reactive event. So even if you start to feel like there's someone watching you and look over your shoulder to find no one's there, then you could still be in the clear. Although, that might mean someone nearby wasn't as lucky as you were. Following the manifestation, the immediate vicinity of the completed reactive event will undergo a rapid deconstruction. A spatial anomaly takes place, causing the room or location where the target has recently been taken from to expand into a number of tight, dark corridors and various small rooms that will each be filled with mirrors and other reflective surfaces. To date, the Foundation has only recorded a handful of these reactive events, and thankfully, the spatial anomaly that triggers in their wake will normally dissipate after several hours. However, the paranoid symptoms of SCP-3010 will persist in the local area, which has led some researchers to question the validity of the entity going into stasis. There are those who believe it doesn't take breaks. While avoidant personality disorders can either have an extreme repelling or extreme attracting effect on an SCP-3010-1 entity, those with an excessive compulsion for human interaction, in particular, sociopaths, produce a far different and far stranger effect on the entity. Sociopathy is a mental health condition wherein somebody will consistently show that they have a lack of regard for the moral notions of right and wrong. While not all are violent, many sociopaths will often ignore the feelings of others unless they are attempting to manipulate those feelings, for example, appeasing somebody else to make themselves seem more likable and thus garner validation. Interactions between sociopaths and instances of SCP-3010-1 will often lead to the causation of several severe anomalies. One such sociopath has been incarcerated under the SCP Foundation, serving as a member of D-Class, the disposable subgroup of personnel comprised of violent criminals who often find themselves acting as human test subjects for anomalous experiments. This D-Class, D-17729, also known as Mike, is selected for testing involving SCP-3010. The SCP Foundation constructs a specialized dummy house designed to keep the entity trapped. Inside these dummy households, a D-Class is placed, typically one that exhibits extremely reclusive tendencies. They are not told of the existence of SCP-3010-1, nor are they told what the entities are capable of. The D-Class in these houses must each believe that they are well and truly isolated, abandoned alone with the entity. Mike, being one of the D-Class assigned to an SCP-3010-1 containment house, has a video and audio recording device surgically implanted within his body before he awakens inside the dummy house. Confused, he examines his surroundings, searching the area for signs of anyone else living in what he momentarily believes is a real household. He traverses from the bedroom down the hallways towards the staircase, leading from the upper floor down to a foyer. All the while, early symptoms of SCP-3010 begin to surface. Mike checks behind himself as though he's starting to feel like someone is watching him. He tries to convince himself that he's alone, there's nobody behind him. Making a move for the front door, Mike finds he can't open it. He's sealed inside the house. Over the course of the next three hours, he navigates his way across the entire containment cell, occasionally musing to himself. More rapidly, he begins to experience the unnerving symptoms of causal absent paranoia, developing an aversion to the darker areas of the house. A few days later, Mike finds himself keeping all the lights on and deliberately avoiding mirrors. He has to practically argue with himself that he's not afraid of the dark, just in order to go downstairs to the storage room for food. On his eventual way down there, he thinks he spots something in the house with him. Fleeing for his life, he locks himself in the storage room for an entire day, preferring to stay where there is food and light. Within a day, his SCP-3010 has become so bad that he's convinced there's something in the containment house with him. He fashions the shelving units from the storeroom into a makeshift barricade. Following his first whole week in containment with an SCP-3010-1 entity, Mike has stayed put in the storage room. 
He uses additional light fixtures to keep the room bright and begins tearing wiring out of the walls with the use of a makeshift crowbar. Thanks to his previous experience as an electrical engineer, after nine days, he then creates a makeshift suit covered in light fixtures powered by a portable hand crank generator. Donning his light suit, Mike sets out to find and destroy SCP-3010-1, something we know only attracts it more. But after searching the containment cell for four hours, Mike falls asleep. This is incredibly rare in the presence of SCP-3010-1 instances, if not impossible. When he reawakens, he not only finds the storage room resupplied by Foundation personnel, but also that the lights have all been put out. Frantically, almost completely unhinged at this point, Mike looks for a weapon to fight any SCP-3010-1 he can find. The next day sees Mike rapidly searching through the containment house for SCP-3010-1 entities. Thinking he's found one, he rushes towards it while exclaiming he has light and for the entity to come out. When he approaches, an SCP-3010-1 reactive event starts, but unlike the other recorded instances, seems to fail. Three mirrors nearby start to produce a low level of light, causing Mike to investigate. The moment he makes contact with one of the mirrors, he screams. The connection to his recording device is lost, and the containment site undergoes a spatial anomaly. In the interest of recovering any evidence of this different reactive event and finding whatever remains of Mike, the SCP Foundation dispatches a team to investigate the ruined containment site. This unit is comprised primarily of the eight members belonging to Mobile Task Force 066, also codenamed Eight Blind Men. Led by their captain, the unit is also overseen by a Foundation researcher named Dr. Obrent. As the team enters the ruins of the containment house, they maintain a clear line of communication with Dr. Obrent via radio. With no idea what will happen once the team is inside, everyone is on high alert, told to look out for cognito hazards or any interruptions of their mental faculties. Upon entry, everything goes quiet. For ten long minutes, there isn't a word from the team. Then comes the eventual report from the captain. The spatial anomaly is in full effect. Dr. Obrent remarks on the long delay of ten minutes, but the captain insists that, from his and the team's point of view, it was only thirty seconds. They quickly reach the conclusion that the spatial anomaly triggered by an SCP-3010-1 reactive event has, this time, resulted in time dilation. The team navigates their way through a repeating series of hallways, finding themselves in a copy of the foyer of the ruined containment site. It's only then that the captain realizes something is wrong. The team is down a man, MTF-066-8, but his men are confused. They tell him that there are only seven members of MTF-066. Dr. Obrent concurs. The captain then points out that MTF-066-6 and MTF-066-7 are also both missing. Once again, the rest of the team insists they've never even heard of those people. Their team has always had five members. It's as if they can't remember, or their comrades have been erased from existence. Eight blind men were rapidly whittled down from five to three to just one. The captain was lost and alone, frantic and paranoid. His remains are never recovered. And before long, the Foundation is forced to accept that their mobile task force, the three blind men, have all been killed in action, with no sign of the missing D-Class, D-17729. But a series of unauthorized addendums have been left on the SCP-3010 file in the Foundation's archive. They seem to have been left by Mike, who recalls his old D-Class designation number. He describes being lost in a series of endless dark halls with only a few small rooms. He says that they probably hate it here because it's a waste of all their eyes. The entity has eyes. They've got eyes in the back of their head. They've got eyes in the back of their mouth. They don't like us, Foundation. But they watch us. They watch us for so long. Why do they hate us, Foundation? Why do they hate me? Why is it so dark? The addendum from Mike ends with him describing his entity coming out of the mirror. He says there's one for every room. Right behind him. Right behind you. Right behind all of us. It's day nine of Joseph Mann's expedition into the extreme wilderness of Antarctica. He's been following the tracks of a mysterious creature, a massive, anomalous beast that has been spotted in the snowy wastes. As he follows the tracks, he sees something. It's his own tent. 
that he had been walking for days after leaving this camp. How was he back here after only a few hours? Time and distance were starting to feel off, like they were stretched out and folded over into knots. Maybe he was confused about the tracks. Maybe he hadn't been chasing after something, but following the tracks of something that had been chasing him. Maybe he was wrong about everything. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-2764, also known as the Eldritch Antarctic. SCP-2764 is a massive biological entity, standing over 380 meters tall and estimated to weigh over 150,000 metric tons. It possesses around 80 tentacle-like arms that it uses for movement and simple actions like grasping objects. It also has what looks to be a head with four eyes. SCP-2764 possesses a number of anomalous properties, including the ability to communicate telepathically with humans, though the language used changes based on the person who is receiving its messages. Strangely, this communication appears to go one way only, as it has never demonstrated that it understands any attempts to communicate back to it. Its physical state has also been observed to be quite anomalous. Its size does not follow normal Euclidean geometry, with the creature appearing many times larger or smaller than it should, based on the viewer's distance from SCP-2764. There appears to be a critical zone lying roughly 50 kilometers away from the creature that stretches around it in a circle. As you move away from the creature and approach this line, SCP-2764 actually appears to grow larger until the critical zone is passed, at which point it begins to shrink as you move farther and farther away. Its body has a number of other strange properties too. Its tentacle-like arms rapidly translocate around its body at random intervals, jumping around all over its body creating a twitchy, writhing mass that makes it impossible to count how many tentacles it actually possesses. But perhaps strangest of all is that not only do the creature's arms seem to break the laws of physics by jumping around its body, but so too does the entirety of SCP-2764. It's been observed to spontaneously relocate itself to different places, as if it is flickering in and out of existence. It appears that the creature flickers into a new place like this at random intervals, but it may be following some yet unknown rules, as it has never been seen appearing more than 25 kilometers away from where it was last seen, and always flickers back to its original location within 48 hours. SCP-2764 was first discovered by a civilian team that was conducting detailed surveys of the Antarctic landscape. The team observed the creature, and were immediately alarmed by its strange properties, especially its bizarre geometric qualities. They returned to their home base and described what they had seen to a colleague, who was actually an SCP Foundation researcher in charge of investigating anomalous activity in Antarctica. This researcher sent word back to his superiors, who activated Mobile Task Force Eta-5, also known as the Jaeger Bombers. Eta-5 administered amnestics to the survey team and any other exposed civilians before setting up a perimeter around SCP-2764. What they would eventually learn was that the perimeter they established was far too close. In his investigation logs, MTF-805 Commander Joseph Mann noted that he immediately experienced strange anomalous effects, such as how the creature seemed to shrink the closer he got to it, and the strange voices in his head. His curiosity soon got the better of him, and he decided to do some of his own research into the entity before the rest of the SCP Foundation scientists and guards arrived to take over the investigation. Man gathered a couple volunteers who were also curious about the nature of the anomaly and set out on an expedition to gather more information. Just as they had experienced before, the more they walked towards the creature, the more it appeared to shrink in size. They also made note of strange prints in the snow. At first, they looked to be human prints, but then seemed to change into something that looked as if a squid had pulled itself onto the land and was dragging itself through the snow. After several days, the whole team was hearing voices. They also realized they had left their tissue analyzer back at a previous camp and would have to backtrack to retrieve it. As they moved away from the creature, they expected it to now increase in size, but it didn't. It stayed the same. Either something had changed about the anomaly, or SCP-2764 was moving towards them. After recovering the tissue analyzer, they continued on towards the creature again. Commander Mann began to understand the voices he was hearing and could even make out certain words like snow and back. Their perception of time was affected too. Hours seemed to stretch out or pass by in the blink of an eye, 
The voice he was hearing started to become more direct, and the message was clear. Turn back. Man was compelled to press on, though, even with the extremes of the Antarctic cold beginning to weigh on him. But then, SCP-2764 suddenly vanished, flickering out of existence, and the team was left with no choice but to follow the strange tentacle-like tracks in the snow, hoping they would lead to the creature. The tracks led them back to their old tent, the same one they had left the tissue analyzer at before, which should have been impossible based on the time and distance they had walked. Just then, Commander Mann realized that he had been wrong. They were the ones who had been pursued. They hadn't been following the tracks forward, but backwards to where they had been. Even worse, he realized that his team had disappeared. He was completely alone. Commander Mann continued to trudge through the snow, walking without direction, when he spotted SCP-2764 again. It was circling him, trying to maintain its distance, but he raced towards the creature and sliced off a piece of its flesh for analysis. Something strange happened when he placed it in the analyzer, though. The machine displayed a zero, which was the reading for human tissue. This strange result required further analysis from the Foundation researchers who should now have arrived to take over the investigation, so man began to make his way back in the direction of home. He spotted what looked to be members of his team off in the distance, and assumed that they must be on a mission to rescue him. Try as he might, though, the spatial anomalies prevented him from ever getting closer. It felt like it would take him an entire day just to walk a few feet. He assumed it must be the same for his rescuers, as he watched them off in the distance, seeming to never get closer. At one point, he could even see as they stopped and turned back, appearing to return to an old campsite. He couldn't understand what they were doing, but then they disappeared entirely, only to reappear much closer to him. Commander Mann, now sure that there was something terribly wrong happening, tried to approach the now single rescuer he could see to tell him to turn back, but before he could. The man rushed at him with a knife and cut a piece of his flesh from his back. It's at that point that Commander Man finally started to understand. He hadn't been watching a rescue team come for him. He'd been watching himself. He had been walking towards the creature, and yet, at the same time, he had also always been the creature. Commander Man was trapped in a time loop where he was doomed to transform into the monstrous SCP-2764 and then watch himself meet the same fate over and over again forever. The voices he had been hearing telling him to turn back were his own, words of warning that he was doomed to always ignore. SCP-2764 has been classified as Keter and is currently located in a classified area of Antarctica. A 150-kilometer radius has been established around the object, which is to be monitored at all times by Mobile Task Force Eta-5. Any civilians that come within the 150-kilometer radius either by accident or due to SCP-2764 flickering to a populated area are to be administered Class A amnestics, and any civilians that may have knowledge of the event are to be administered Class B amnestics. Should any civilian or Foundation employees come within 30 kilometers of SCP-2764, they are to be detained and immediately questioned. Following their psychological examination and depending on the results of the evaluation, they will either be administered Class A amnestics or terminated. A man wakes up with a start. Did something just bite him? He looks down at his hand. Something definitely bit him. He can see the red welt already forming. He looks around for the culprit, but can't find it anywhere. He really hopes he doesn't have bed bugs. That's the last thing he needs right now. He'll have to keep his eyes open for potential pests. He doesn't want this to happen again, since the spot is already starting to itch and feel uncomfortable. A couple days pass, though, with no signs of other bugs. It must have just been a random insect that came inside his house to escape the winter cold. The spot on his hand felt a little rough for a day or two, but now he's pretty much forgotten all about it. Now what he really needs is some coffee before sitting down to another coding session. The man is in his kitchen trying to make a fresh pot of coffee, but finds he's having a hard time. He's not so much making coffee as he is making a mess. He knocks his favorite mug onto the ground, breaking it, and decides that maybe he doesn't need coffee after all. A couple of nights later, as the man is watching TV, he starts to cough. Just a little at first, but then more and more. The coughing fits get longer and deeper too, like they are coming from the very bottom of his lungs. He hopes he isn't coming down with something. He hasn't left the house in days, so how could he have? Can bugs transfer colds? 
He'll have to look it up later. For now, he needs to do something about this cough. He won't be able to sleep if it keeps up. He needs to go get some medicine. The man gets bundled up and heads out. It's lightly snowing as he walks to the pharmacy and he can't help but admire the way the moon hangs in the sky, a beautiful beacon of light on this dark winter evening. Inside the pharmacy, he finds the cold medicine section and picks out a cough suppressant. He takes it to the counter and decides to get a few candy bars too. He's developed a real sweet tooth these last few days. The man starts to cough again. It's a good thing he's getting this medicine. Several more days pass and the man isn't feeling any better. This cough just won't go away. He decides it's finally time to go see a doctor. As he sits in the doctor's office waiting room, he does his best to hold in his coughs, but he has a very hard time. The woman on the other side of the room is coughing too. Strangely, it actually makes him feel a little better. There must just be something going around. A nurse comes into the waiting room and calls his name. The doctor is ready for him. The man is sitting on the bed in the examination room when the doctor enters. He's looking over his medical records and doesn't even look up from his clipboard. He tells the man to take off his shirt so that he can be examined, and the man obliges. Okay, let's see what the trouble is, the doctor says. He finally looks up at the man and screams. It didn't take long for the SCP Foundation to hear the reports of people's limbs metamorphosing into insectoid appendages, and they knew immediately what they were dealing with. This was another outbreak of the parasitic, limb-transforming insect known as SCP-150. SCP-150 is an obligate parasite, meaning that it requires a host for the completion of its reproductive life cycle. It bears a visual appearance similar to that of Cymothoa exigua, another parasite that eats the tongue of a particular type of fish before replacing the tongue with its own body. SCP-150 engages in similar behavior though it appears to exclusively affect humans. When a human comes in contact with a small, bug-like organism, it will embed itself under its new host's skin. Next, over the course of roughly seven days, SCP-150 will burrow deep into the host's flesh and begin to cause numerous physiological changes to them. First, and most prominently, SCP-150 will begin a gradual process of altering the limb that is nearest to the original infection site. As SCP-150 burrows deeper and consumes the flesh, it excretes a substance that has the effect of replacing the missing sections of the limb with a hard, chitinous material that resembles one of its own appendages. Beneath the chitin, the excreted substance forms a rudimentary nervous system that gives the host the ability to control the new limb as if it were their own. As it feeds, SCP-150 also secretes several chemicals that contain anesthetic, immunosuppressant, and transplant-rejecting properties that keep the host's body from responding to the changes, or even reacting at all. In fact, the host will often report that their new limb is completely normal and feels stronger and more resilient after the transformation. SCP-150 will continue to feed for approximately one to two weeks, and as it feeds on the nutrients within its host's body, it will begin to reproduce, creating eggs that it deposits directly into the bloodstream. While the majority of these eggs will die off, enough usually survive to begin colonizing other parts of the host's body, where they will hatch and repeat the process of feeding, reproducing, and spreading more eggs. It is theorized that it is capable of reproducing on its own, meaning that a single instance of SCP-150 is all it takes to create a new colony. Humans infected with SCP-150 will sometimes report slight discomfort and issues with their fine motor skills during this period, but will usually not express any knowledge of what might be causing this. Eventually, SCP-150 eggs will reach the host's lungs, where the process of assimilating continues, this time replacing the lungs themselves. During this process, more eggs will be produced, laid, and then spread out of the body by the host's coughing. As many as 10,000 eggs will be produced during this period, approximately 1% of which will survive being expelled, find another host, and implant themselves. The assimilation process then spreads to the central nervous system, including the spinal cord and brain, but strangely, the host will show no signs that their consciousness or behavior have been affected in any way. In interviews with hosts of SCP-150, those who are unaware that they are infected have not expressed any knowledge of changes happening in or out of their body. When subjects are made aware that they have been infected, they will be able to point out the site of the original infection and agree that a change has taken place, 
but they seem to have no ill will towards their new chitinous appendages, and will often express positive feelings about it. In order to better study the effects of SCP-150 under SCP Foundation control, two D-Class personnel, D-13732 and D-016002, were both infected with the parasites, and the assimilation process was allowed to fully progress through all the stages. Following signs that D-016002 was experiencing swelling of the brain, a decompressive craniotomy was performed, a procedure in which a portion of the skull is removed in order to relieve pressure on the brain. This surgery had the added benefit of giving Foundation researchers the chance to look at SCP-150's progress firsthand. But after a flap of her skull was removed, the attending scientists did not find that her brain was swelling. They didn't find her brain at all, but instead observed numerous instances of SCP-150 in the cavity where her brain should be. The D-Class had been partially anesthetized to numb her skull but remained conscious during the procedure, and the scientists asked her several simple questions to which she was perfectly able to answer. They began removing some of the parasites, and as they did so, her answers became slower and less clear. It appeared that the SCP-150 instances had not just eaten and replaced her brain, they had become her brain. For the next experiment, they would use the instances of SCP-150 that had been removed from D-13732's nervous system after he had been euthanized following the discovery that his entire nervous system had also been replaced entirely by SCP-150. The parasites taken from his brain cavity were placed into D-016002s, and the results were nothing short of incredible. After observing a period of time where the organisms appeared to move and rearrange themselves within her skull, she regained consciousness. Once awake, not only did her cognitive functions immediately improve, when she was asked to state her name, she told them it was Michael, D-13732's name. It is unknown why SCP-150 engages in this peculiar life cycle, but the danger it poses to humans and the difficulty in keeping it contained has led the SCP Foundation to classify it as Keter. Some of the more erudite researchers have taken to calling the parasite the Ship of Theseus, a play on the philosophical notion that questions whether something that has had all of its parts replaced is still fundamentally the same, or if it has become something new. Perhaps the observation of those infected with SCP-150 can shed some light on this millennia-old question. Infected patients who are being studied are to be kept in level 3 biohazard containment cells, with never more than one infected host per cell. Cultures of SCP-150 adults and eggs are kept in vacuum-sealed glass flasks in the Site-42 Infectious Materials Lab, and the Foundation's standard pathogen handling procedures are required to be followed at all times. Should any instance of SCP-150 be found outside of containment, it is to be immediately incinerated. It's 1916, right in the middle of World War I, and a British soldier is huddled in a trench, occasionally peeking over the top. He's supposed to be on watch, but there's little to see in the darkness that hangs over no man's land. But then, he spots something. Something big. It's a shadowy figure, only about 20 feet away, and it looks like it's digging in the mud. It's too dark to make out what he's looking at, so the soldier shoots a flare into the sky, lighting up the battlefield with a dull red light. Now he can see it clearly, and it's like nothing he's ever seen before. A huge, terrifying monster, picking up bodies out of the mud. The soldier can only stare, petrified by what he's seeing in front of him, when the creature suddenly turns to stare back at him and smiles. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-3456, also known as the Orcadian Horseman. SCP-3456 is the designation given to a group of quadrupeds, of which the exact number that exists is unknown. These entities resemble horses, though with some marked differences. SCP-3456s lack any hair, and their thick skin is translucent, revealing the fat and muscle underneath. They have three-toed hooves, and strangest of all, they have one or more human-shaped torsos fused to their backs. Each torso has a pair of arms and a head, but no legs, the torso seeming to meld directly into the back of the creature's horse-like body. The arms are much longer than those of a human, 
with a total wingspan that is double the anomaly's height. The arms are so long, they typically drag along the ground when the creature moves. At the end of each arm are five sharpened bones that protrude from where fingers would normally be. Instead of a nose, most instances of SCP-3456 have a hole in the middle of the face, which is capable of producing a high-pitched scream that is as loud as a jet engine. SCP-3456 instances vary in size, with the largest recorded manifestation standing 30 meters tall and 15 meters long. Their bodies have also shown to be quite resilient and are completely impervious to conventional weaponry. The anomalous creatures have displayed a high level of adaptive intelligence, using complex tactics like setting up ambushes through the use of property destruction and psychological manipulation to lure targets into traps. This high level of intelligence has led many at the Foundation to believe that SCP-3456 is sapient. Any direct observation of an SCP-3456 instance will cause the entity to become aware of its observer, at which point it will display this awareness by turning in the exact direction of the observer. Once an instance of SCP-3456 has spotted its observer, it will engage in predatory behavior, stalking its witness and pursuing them far beyond the initial site of manifestation, all the while concealing itself and using camouflage as it chases them. SCP-3456 will repeat this behavior over and over, intentionally letting itself be seen by observers over and over as it hunts down and takes each one, until it has captured a large number of individuals and suddenly dematerializes. It's currently unknown where SCP-3456 takes its victims, or what happens to them once it dematerializes, nor is it known how many victims 3456 needs to capture before it is satisfied and dematerializes for good, as the number taken has varied between instances. It's not currently understood why, but SCP-3456 is either unwilling or unable to cross bodies of fresh water, and making it to the other side of a freshwater source like a river, lake, or even a stream is the only currently known way to escape the anomaly once it begins its pursuit. Instances of SCP-3456 typically appear near sites of mass human suffering, such as battlefields and natural or man-made disasters, and there have been numerous reports and sightings of 3456s at historical events throughout the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries, with multiple manifestations often appearing at the same event. One Foundation report contains an account of an SCP-3456 instance appearing during the First World War at the Battle of the Somme. Rumors spread through the British troops in their trenches of the appearance of a mythical creature many believed to be the Nukalavi, a horse-like demon with origins in Orcadian mythology. Like many SCPs, this ancient folktale turned out to have very real origins. British infantryman Dave Harkin kept a journal which described giant hoof prints appearing in the battlefield mud, and soldiers disappearing under mysterious circumstances appearing to be killed by forces even more terrifying than what the war could produce. Harkin describes one soldier who was firing on advancing Germans when the mud beneath his feet started boiling. Before anyone could react, mud went flying everywhere, and everyone was knocked off their feet. The soldier was gone, not even a body part remained, and Harkin was sure he saw bony protrusions reaching up out of the mud underneath the soldier just before he disappeared. Not long after, Harkand spotted the Orcadian horsemen on the battlefield, and the horsemen spotted Harkand. He watched as the instance of SCP-3456 picked bodies out of the mud and carried them off into the darkness. He took several shots at the entity with his rifle, but the bullets had no effect. As days passed, the half-man, half-horse continued to appear night after night, always doing the same thing picking up injured soldiers off the battlefield and taking them into the darkness. It would always look back at Harkand, seemingly taunting him or inviting him to try following it. Soon more instances of SCP-3456 appeared, many with more than one torso on their back. And then they began laying traps, burying themselves in the mud and waiting for the soldiers to rush over them. Dave Harkand was declared missing in action at the Battle of the Somme, and it's presumed he was taken by the same instance of SCP-3456 that he first observed. 
Another first-hand account of an encounter with SCP-3456 occurred following the 2011 earthquake and subsequent nuclear disaster in Fukushima, Japan. With over 2,500 missing persons, several manifestations of SCP-3456 were reported in the areas affected by the quake, and SCP Foundation reconnaissance teams were sent to investigate, two of which were quickly wiped out during the encounters with 3456s. One squad, after exploring the evacuated city and not finding anything, spotted an instance of SCP-3456 standing motionless in the middle of an intersection. As they laid eyes on the Orcadian horseman, the human torso that was hanging limp off the motionless horse's body stood upright and began swinging its arms, damaging and destroying the buildings and structures around it. It then turned towards the team and emitted an ear-shatteringly loud shriek from the hole where its nose should be before beginning its pursuit. The team immediately began evacuation procedures, even ordering a drone strike in an attempt to slow down the chasing anomaly. The team took shelter in an abandoned high-rise building, but knew their only chance of escape was if they could make it over the nearest body of fresh water, which would mean crossing a bridge over the Arakawa River, which was a kilometer away. The team was 50 yards away from the bridge with no further signs of SCP-3456 when one emerged from a side street right next to them. Small arms fire was used against the creature and two rocket-propelled grenades were fired at it, but all had no effect. A flashbang detonated in the anomaly's face bought enough time for some of the squad to make it across the bridge and escape. But two members of the team were carried away by SCP-3456, with the last image captured by one of the squad's helmet-mounted cams being a shot of the Orcadian horseman smiling just before it demanifested. SCP-3456 is currently uncontained, and due to its extremely dangerous nature and the lack of any containment procedures, it has been designated Keter Class. Any personnel who observe the entity are to be treated with Class G amnestics, and their assigned treatment facility must be located within one kilometer of a body of fresh water. The Foundation has an ongoing project to attribute any historical references to SCP-3456 to myth, shell shock, hysteria, or PTSD, and any reports of loss of life or property damage involving the anomaly are to be replaced with explanations that attribute the cause to other natural or man-made events. Regions where SCP-3456 is more likely to appear are to be closely monitored with personnel ready to assist in evacuation efforts, but above all else, direct observation of SCP-3456 must be avoided, since once that has happened, there's very little even the SCP Foundation can do to protect you. The old house has been abandoned for going on two decades, and as with any place that's been left uninhabited for this long, rumors tend to spiral. Of course, there are the more mundane explanations for why the two-story, four-bedroom home on the end of a nice street lays in semi-ruin black mold, asbestos, rising house prices. But those weren't the stories that most people told. Everyone in the neighborhood knew what really happened. All those years ago, the family that lived there had been murdered, and their killer was never caught. The three young paranormal investigators, with EMF readers in their hands and GoPro cameras mounted on their hard hats, know all about this. They approach the house in the dead of night, mumbling commentary for the recordings, if the old house really is as haunted as everyone says it is, then they could be in for something really good here. Their subscribers always loved brand new paranormal content. They use a crowbar to breach the front door and head inside. It's everything you can expect from a house that had been abandoned for 17 years. Dust, cobwebs, and graffiti abound, broken bottles scattered across the floor. Someone has scrawled, Welcome to Hell, above the door in faded sharpie. It all plays perfectly for the cameras. Paranormal content gold. All of them turn on their flashlights, generously provided to them by one of their sponsors, of course. But in this particular situation, they have no idea just how valuable their product really is. After all, there are some frightening things that hide in the dark. The leader of the trio begins ascending the stairs, narrating into his helmet cam, giving the more popular version of the house's legend. The perfect suburban family, torn apart, literally, by a killer hiding in their home. The family had all been brutally murdered by someone in their home, but the police never found any sign of unlawful entrance or exit. 
There were no clues to the killer's presence whatsoever, in fact. It was as if they were a ghost, a vapor. It was almost as though whoever killed the family had always been in that house, and even after the murders were committed, they never left the place either. As he tells the story, the lead investigator starts to feel a little nervous. Even though he himself doesn't really believe in the supernatural, he just plays up reactions for the views, he still can't help but wonder, should I really be here? Am I making a terrible mistake? Is there a chance that whatever did this all those years ago could still be in the house, waiting for me? But he pushes those thoughts from his mind. This gig is too valuable for him to wimp out now. And really, what are the chances that something actually dangerous would be lurking in the house? The other two investigators are still looking around downstairs, sticking together, their flashlight beams slicing through the darkness. Their boss always insists on going upstairs first. He demands the glory shot, after all. That leaves the rest of them searching the downstairs living room, dining room, and kitchen, where the best they can hope for is maybe a particularly haunted-looking dishwasher. It's why the younger of the two is so surprised huh? when they suddenly feel something happening to their body that they've never experienced before. In an instant, their whole body convulses with an involuntary shudder. They feel the temperature drop, and the world gets just that little bit darker. The best way they can describe the feeling is impending doom. Like any moment now, something terrible is going to happen. But almost as soon as the feeling begins, it's gone. Intensity dropping, the dread starting to dissipate, as though whoever or whatever caused this feeling literally passed right through them. Their fellow investigator asks them if they're okay. Of course. They nod and force a smile. They're fine. It's just a spooky place is all. Atmosphere like this would get to anyone. Meanwhile, the lead investigator is exactly where he wants to be, ascending a rickety stepladder up into the attic. The very same attic where, all those years ago, the police had found what was left of the family. And from everything he'd read on the subject, their remains weren't a pretty sight, even by true crime enthusiast standards. He enters the attic and shines his flashlight around, capturing all the dusty old boxes left to rot in the cold. He's engrossed in the macabre spectacle of what had once been the worst and final moments of a group of strangers' very real lives. The attic is full of spider webs and shadows. They're so ubiquitous that as the lead investigator pauses to tell his camera the next chapter of the grisly tale, he doesn't even notice one of the shadows peeling off of the wall behind him. It wafts silently towards him, like a gust of midnight air. Little by little, the blob of shadow starts to take on a vaguely human shape. It leans forward in the investigator's direction, arms extended like a classic movie monster. Long, dark claws slide out of its shadowy hands. Downstairs, the other two investigators hear the most terrible scream. For a moment, the more fantastical thought crosses their minds. Could this be one of the tormented souls of the departed family, longing to be heard after years of silence? Then it occurs to them that they recognize the scream. It belongs to their boss. The two of them charge up the stairs, flashlights in hand, as the screaming starts to become more desperate than pained, like that of a wounded animal with its leg caught in a trap. Those terrible wails are echoing down from the open hatch leading into the attic. It's so dark up there, something must have broken his flashlight. That's when they notice something else. Red, dripping from the open hatch. For a moment, they hesitate, wondering what could be going on up there. Could they really help, or would they just be running into the danger themselves? But soon, their desire to save their boss's life overpowers their fear. They grab the ladder and start climbing, feeling the dripping blood on the worn wooden rungs. When they finally get up into the attic, it feels like the scream is coming from everywhere, bouncing off the walls in a terrible, echoing cacophony of pain. They turn in all directions, hovering their flashlight beams around the room in wide, sweeping arcs, until both fall on the source of all this terror. And when they see it, they can't help but scream too. The lead investigator's body is floating about a foot off the ground, his screams now fading into pained gurgles. Something huge and dark is lifting him up with one hand and sinking the long, dark claws of its other into his neck. The second the twin flashlight beams concentrate on the creature, it drops the lead investigator's bleeding body down onto the ground. His skin slate gray, his feeble twitching slowing to a halt as the last of his life drains from him. Two glowing red pinpricks open up in the face of the dark figure, eyes like terrible, burning coals etching themselves into their memory. Like smoke, it continues to glide backwards further, seeking refuge in the dark, a safe haven amongst the other shadows. By this point, the two surviving investigators know there's nothing they can do for their boss anymore. All that's left is to get out and survive. They have to save themselves. 
They turn, wasting no time running towards the exit. They don't notice it, but the second they turn the beams of their flashlights away, the shadow's terrible eyes disappear and it starts advancing towards them again, its claws outstretched and grasping for them with awful fury. The shadow creature grabs at their heads as they make their final leap for the exit. However, all the monster can pull away are their helmets and helmet cams as they scramble down the ladder and then down the stairs, running at speeds they didn't even think possible as the shadow slithers down behind them. It doesn't give up. It wants their lives. It wants their warm human blood on its claws. They clear the threshold of the accursed house and keep running to their car. One looks over their shoulder and sees the shadow leave the house, gaining on them both claws outstretched and ready to rend their flesh. The two climb into their car. They see the shadow coming towards their window. It's moving so quickly, only a few feet away now. It's getting closer and closer and closer. Ignition. The car starts up and the driver smashes the pedal down. They take off, quickly accelerating up to illegal speeds as the shadow continues to chase, slowly getting smaller and smaller in the rearview mirror. A distant nightmare. A terrible, dark ghost. As it finally disappears, they feel a moment of safety, but really, only a moment, because it occurs to them then that they cannot say, with any confidence, that this monster won't just be waiting for them when they get home. SCP-280, also known as Eyes in the Dark, is one of the more frightening and dangerous anomalies contained by the SCP Foundation. Of course, it likely won't be causing an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario anytime soon, but if you happen to run into this nocturnal monster, it's likely to cause an end-of-you scenario and remove you from the world with extreme prejudice. There's no way of telling just how many lives it claimed before the SCP Foundation finally got it into containment, and perhaps it's best to just not think about that. SCP-280 is a black, wraith-like apparition that floats at roughly average human height, with no visible legs or feet, as the lower portion of its body simply fades away before it reaches the ground. In its dormant state, the entity may appear to be little more than a shadow, easily dismissed, especially in dark environments. This comes as a natural result of the being's frightening ability to become intangible at will, and only become physical when it enters a state of active aggression toward a human target. In this intangible state, victims have even been known to walk through the shadowy mass by accident. While this doesn't lead to any detrimental physical effects, Victims report that being inside the creature can lead to heightened states of anxiety, fear, and dread. Despite its body being wholly composed of an unidentifiable black matter, when exposed to light, the creature does begin to express a pair of glowing dots on its head similar to eyes, hence its frightening nickname. However, all tests indicate that these eyes aren't actually functional. Instead, they appear to be a kind of defensive measure, like false eyes on the carapace of an insect. These eyes are never shown when SCP-280 is advancing towards a victim, only when it is in retreat, though this is only one of the entity's several defensive responses. If an area where the creature is residing becomes fully illuminated, or a sudden flash of extremely bright light is directed against it, then it will immediately dematerialize and appear in a different area. The one positive thing that can be said about the hunting patterns of SCP-280 is that they're relatively predictable. The entity, it seems, only has an interest in human beings. When it selects a target, it will pursue them relentlessly, approaching in its intangible form with its arms extended in what many describe as a sleepwalker pose. In this state, you may finally notice 280's claws, long, thin, and razor sharp. It may silently approach while the victim is turned the other way, or while they sleep soundly in bed, or even when they're paralyzed in fear at the very sight of it. When SCP-280 closes the distance, it will begin to rip and tear at its victims with its claws, causing massive physical trauma and, in some cases, death. Attacks range from one to five minutes of being relentlessly clawed at by the beast. When the attack is over, it will simply expose its eyes, become intangible once more, and escape. You will not be able to overpower the creature. Foundation tests have shown that it has extreme physical strength, and it's capable of tearing apart solid steel with little effort. If it can't find any humans to victimize, then it will simply remain dormant, pressing itself up against a wall, in a dark corner, or within some other structure. Which is why, if ever you feel nervous about a certain dark corner in a room near you, it is best to remove yourself from the situation as quickly as possible and remain in a brightly lit area. It would perhaps be comforting to believe that SCP-280 is acting on some twisted form of animal instinct. After all, while the results may seem horrific to us, every organism has to eat, right? Well, sadly, that isn't the case here. SCP-280 does not appear to eat, 
sleep, or breathe to survive, and it never consumes any of the matter torn from its victims. The best working theory is that the entity simply enjoys the harm it causes, taking a degree of perverse pleasure in hunting down and murdering its targets. There is no better nature to appeal to here. The SCP Foundation's ability to study the creature's biology has also been stunted, in part due to the creature's highly aggressive nature, and also the fact that its selective intangibility makes gaining physical samples almost impossible. Even capturing and containing the creature in the first place came partially out of blind luck. It first came to Foundation attention after a series of mysterious locked door murders in a small Mississippi township. In the most recent case, an entire family had been brutally murdered in their home, leaving only one survivor. A traumatized nine-year-old boy named David, who'd locked himself in the basement when he started to hear the screaming. He was so terrified by the things he saw that night that he remained in a catatonic state for weeks afterwards, completely unresponsive to outside stimulus. But one little detail saved his life. A flashlight was clasped in his white knuckle grip, shining a bright beam of cold, white light onwards. When David was removed and placed into medical care, officers began searching the building for any kind of clues as to how the other four family members were murdered. However, during this investigation, the police were just as vulnerable as the victims who'd been so recently slain. While one officer was wandering around the attic, looking for any evidence they may have missed, SCP-280 emerged from the darkness and attacked, tearing into his body with its long, deadly claws. Luckily for the officer in question, he survived the incident, though he was badly wounded. His report on the matter, including the ardent claim that he was attacked by a being, quote, made from black smoke, caught the attention of SCP Foundation operatives embedded in the precinct. They soon took over the investigation and descended on the house, hoping to tag and bag whatever had been behind all these deaths. This would be easier said than done. While Foundation field agents canvassed the home, they simply walked past the creature multiple times, discounting it as a mere shadow. After all, it only had these easily identifiable glowing eyes when it was in a retreating position. Even when it entered its physical state, operatives brushing up against it generally dismissed the sensation as hair, clothing, or some other object touching them in the dark. This already bungled investigation got even worse when the Foundation decided to introduce high-intensity lights into the equation, hopefully flushing the creature out. This, of course, only caused it to dematerialize and appear elsewhere. The chase ended in an almost farcical fashion a cavalcade of Foundation agents chasing a cloud of sneering black smoke across a Mississippi field at 2.30 a.m. Thankfully for the human race, the entity was, at the very least, eventually secured and contained. However, this wouldn't be the last time it was out of containment. During a series of tests with different types of illumination, intending to test SCP-280's reflexes, it disappeared from its chamber. It seemed almost to sink through the different levels of the illuminated site, before coming to rest at the containment chamber holding SCP-1591. This made for a fascinating accidental cross-test. You see, SCP-1591, to put it simply, is a unique sculpture of a star that emits an incredibly bright light, and this light will slowly make any being subject to its glow intangible, before disappearing completely. When SCP-280 came before SCP-1591, it displayed its eyes, but did not retreat. In fact, it assumed a kneeling position, and simply remained before the anomalous sculpture until it faded from existence. It then remanifested in its own containment chamber several hours later without incident. All things considered, it went pretty well, as far as containment breaches involving deadly, human-hating monsters go. Because of its ability to demanifest and phase through solid objects, SCP-280 is incredibly difficult to contain, earning it the dreaded Keter object class. In order to avoid the risk of demanifestation, SCP-280 is contained in a 5 by 5 meter cell that is perpetually left in a state of total darkness. No equipment is to be left in the cell unsupervised at any time, and any items brought into the cell for testing must be removed when the testing is complete. Any staff members entering the chamber for tests must be equipped with infrared goggles, an infrared ID strobe, and also a strong flashlight to ward the creature off in the case that it becomes aggressive. If SCP-280 does attempt to attack anyone in the chamber, all attending staff are instructed to turn on their flashlights and turn the beams against the creature. No aggressive action is permitted, and staff members must remain at least one meter away from SCP-280 at all times for their own safety. And if you suddenly feel yourself getting a little nervous in an eerily dark room, I'd like you to remember this. The one thing more frightening than seeing eyes in the dark is not seeing them. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-015-IT, The Boogeyman, 
for another terrifying anomaly that you may encounter lurking in the dark. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.